Sir, you're charged with especially aggravated kidnapping. You're also charged with aggravated assault. And you're charged with theft of a firearm worth less than $2,500. You're talking about stuff that is not relevant. Hello and welcome to the Court of Public Opinion. I am the recovery addict and boy do I have a case for you today. Why is a dog Whoa. chewing on this guy? I think they have got the wrong guy they there. Got the wrong guy and the dog was, was biting him. He roughing him up quite a bit. There's a lawsuit. Nine out of ten judges prefer watching the recovery addict live stream in their court. The fireworks are not done. Now we're getting commentary on the case. Not him, he, he, I'm going to go on for you. Terrible stuff, you know. I didn't ask you to interrupt me. Is that correct? Absolutely not. Good morning, good morning. <laughs> There's a lawsuit. I don't feel like I know what I'm doing. When are we going to break for lunch, Judge? Uh, probably soon. L- lunch is soon. I'm not a chat. Let's see. I'm, I'm missing something. I've been sent someone something. with more experience. Cash cow is gone. That's it. My kids have taken cash cow. The zombie move, apocalypse move may be upon us. Uh, welcome to the Court of Public Opinion. I am the recovery addict. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Uh, happy Monday slash Tuesday. Are we going to address subject matter jurisdiction? Uh, yes. Is Somebody just sent me a video of roaches fighting. Okay. I okay. don't know who won. How does he do that? And now what Murdoch stole it. My, my setup is looking good, but frustratingly not, not working the way I want. Okay. Okay. Um, because he's the guy. Bring the jury. There's all the sound. Effects. I was kick back, taking it easy. Okay. All right. Let me uh, let me let me first of all say I am so sorry, uh, especially to to people like I don't know Kitty Kitty Bang Bang whose birthday was yesterday. I'm so sorry that I was not able to live stream yesterday. Uh, let's start at the very beginning, and and before we do that, obviously we have to uh, properly uh, recognize Ashley, who has won the internet today. Ashley, your first your first task is winner of the internet because you've won before. I'm not gonna we're, we'll skip all the pleasantries, we'll skip the ceremony. You won again. Congratulations. Uh, Weather watch. His, his internet's down. If you could just run down there and do, do some quick checks, get that fiber up and running for him, that would be great because we need him here today more than ever. Uh, so uh, so just jump on that if you could. Thank you. Uh, please and thank you. Yes, very much. Congratulations, by the way, Ashley. Congratulations. It's always wonderful when you win the internet. Uh, Hannah says, I'm yellow. Six months. Yay. That is awesome. Hannah, welcome. Welcome. Uh, let's see. Greeners. Greeners pops in with 10 gifted memberships just to kick things off, you know, get things going. Thank you, Greeners. Uh, so kind, so generous. Uh, appreciate you very much. As do the the 10 people who now are are saved from, from slow chat Hades. Somebody just sent me a video of roaches fighting. I don't know who won. I don't know who won. Now, let me, let me back up a little bit and explain why we weren't live yesterday. But to do that, I have to explain what happened over the weekend. So uh, buckle up. It's story time. It's story time. Uh, I guess we have to sing happy birthday, too. So I'll, I'll listen for the have buffer sound. I'll li- li- I listen for the buffer sound. Uh, get your birthdays in now or forever. Hold your peace. I realized, kitty, kitty, bang, bang, we're going to sing to you today. Um, <laughs> good, good guess. Good guess. I'm guessing bathroom because you wanted to torture us. Close, close, but wrong. Um, <laughs> get, your, get your story time blanket leg on my briefs. Oh my goodness. Let's see. Um Karen, Karen, welcome. You didn't get picked. Uh oh, you're you're close. You're close. Let me let me explain. Uh and we'll we'll sing birthdays here in a little bit because I know we have birthdays to sing to. And and I owe you. I owe you that at least. But let me Do you want to do birthdays first and then we can just focus? Because once once the crowd comes in and all the people everyone's gonna say it's their birthday. Oh, let's see. Um, okay, so we have, oh, we've got a few here. Linda and Kitty Kitty Bang Bang were yesterday. Oh, wait. Melanie Lewis, Nicole, 77. Kitty Kitty Bang Bang had birthdays yesterday. Oh, man. I feel so bad. I am so sorry, you guys. Okay, so Karina. Tony. Tony Green. Happy birthday. Judy M. Karina, to- Tony, Judy, and then we're also going to sing to Melanie, Nicole, Kitty Kitty Bang Bang, and Linda. 
Melanie. Nicole. I don't know how to abbreviate your, your name, Kitty Kitty Bang Bang. Everyone else gets their first name only, but Kitty Kitty, ba Kitty, Kitty Bang Bang is going to have to somehow fit in the song. Okay, Kitty Kitty Bang Bang and Linda. All right, I think I think that's it. The zombie apocalypse may be upon us. Oh, Brenda turns 28. Well, no, let's add Brenda. Add Brenda. She's going to be there. This is going to be a, a two-verser for sure already. All right, all right. We'll explain here. Birthday song first. KKB, KKBB. It, it's not much easier to say in the song. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do uh, happy birthday first. Karina, Tony, Brenda, Judy, Melanie, Nicole, Linda, and Kitty Kitty Bang Bang. So we're going to do Karina, Tony, Brenda, Judy, and Melanie. And then we're going to do Nicole, Linda, and Kitty Kitty Bang Bang in the second verse. Oh, wait. Math is. Uh, Maggie has to fit in there as well. Okay. You guys, just uh, follow my lead. Sing the words that I say. I'm not sure how they're going to go. I, I don't know. That. It's been a long weekend. Buckle up, guys. Let's do a little bit of warm-ups together just to make sure we get the, the best possible uh, rendition we can. La, 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 la. Then that's good enough. That's good enough. You sound great. You sound great. Everyone remember, shoulders back, deep breaths. Uh, stand with your with with your group. If you practice with the altos, please stand with the altos. Blend your voices together. We're going to sing together, all of us, happy birthday to Karina, Tony, Brenda, Judy, Maggie, Melanie, Nicole, Kitty Kitty Bang Bang, and Linda. In that order. Two verses. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Karina, Tony, Brenda, Judy, and Maggie. Happy birthday to you. We got five in on that one. I ran out of time. Uh, now we have four more names. Melanie, Nicole, Kitty Kitty Bang Bang, and Linda. I can tell someone's not singing. I think it's Lissy. Lissy, a little louder. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Melanie, Nicole, Kitty Kitty Bang Bang, and Linda. Happy birthday to you. I, I heard uh, Lizzie, Lizzie, Lizzie. I could not, could not quite hear you. Somebody said, uh, I'm not singing. I'm not singing. <laughs> Who said I'm not singing? <laughs> I have to out you. I'm just listening. That's it. <laughs> Lizzie, I'm just listening. I could tell. I could, we missed the, the, the beautiful tones of your voice. But uh, I... I could tell you weren't singing first, and then I saw the text. I promise that's how it happened. Uh, to everyone who's celebrating birthday, or who celebrated over the weekend, or yesterday, or today, happy birthday. Today is a wonderful day to celebrate. Yesterday was probably great if your birthday was yesterday, but I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, I appreciate you all uh, being here and, and forgiving me. I will tell the story of why I didn't go live yesterday, but... Uh, <laughs> Thank you, thank you. All right, happy birthday. Get your free pancakes at Denny's. Uh, thank you so much. Hope we can make, it, make your day a little more special, uh, even though there are a million places you could celebrate. And a million people who will probably celebrate with you. You're here with us, and that's special. Thank you so much. All right, all right, all right. Time change has me in a funk. Oh, my goodness, Paula Mack. When I agreed to do this gig over the weekend, I did not realize that when I said I'd be there to set up at 6 o'clock in the morning, that it would feel like 5 o'clock in the morning for me, which means I'd have to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to load everything to my vehicle. So get up at four, load everything by by five, um, and and get get ready and get there by six. Uh, four straight hours of assembling everything on this gig. Four straight hours, and I was done with six minutes to spare. Four hours was not enough, and we had Mike issues we had i had to change things out it was it was a nightmare now the customer the client of the end they thought it was perfect which is which is the goal so technically it was perfect but on my end it was uh, it was driving me nuts we had the sound system in there the front front of house and back of house the speakers which i could not control because it's all just one i just have to feed one thing they were different levels 
And so people at the front were getting it too loud. People at the back were getting too quiet. Um, different people who talked, some people would, were very loud and some people were so quiet that I just, I couldn't turn the gain up anymore. And so people at the back were, you could, you could tell they were almost straining to hear, but, uh, the, the people at the front were, you know, the people who hired me, <laughs> it was beautiful. It sounded great for them. <laughs> so anyway, we got all the video working, even though we had to, um, throw in extra receivers for some of the wireless transmitters for the video, uh, have to use an iPad to power, um, we had like a mother's room, like if you have like a crying baby or something, you can go out in a little privacy um, and uh, and still watch and hear everything that's going on. So we had an uh, iPad that had to power that and and the iPad signal wouldn't go far enough. So we had to run certain cables and it, it was a nightmare, but we got everything done six minutes to spare and it was flawless. It was flawless. Of course, they want me back again to do it again. So we'll, we get to do this again every six months. All right. So um, that being said, Packing up, it, uh, I was able to pack up with a little bit of help in about an hour and a half, which is really good when it takes four hours to set up and pack up in an hour and a half. Then uh, coming home, I have to then rebuild this, this studio. And as you see here, it, it's nice and clean. It's nice and clean. I've dusted everything. All my cables, I have, I have two, just two colors of cables for everything. I've, I've used all these, all these nifty, these, these gray sort of blend in 8K high quality cables. Uh, so I've, I've got them and on the back side, they're all coiled nicely and tucked and they're all in layers. So I've got the base power and everything in the, and then uh, HDMI cables overlay everything because those are the ones I change most often. Uh, audio, it's all, it's all working beautifully, just absolutely beautifully. Except for one thing, this ridiculous little box right here, which is our replay machine. I tried to get it working on the network and I did, I got it working. Well, I got it working because I had to go get a new network switch because for some reason when I unplugged the old one, it decided to stop working. So new A port switch to connect all the devices we have with one, two, three, four computers um, and three black magic design things. So we had four, five, six, seven, eight because the eighth port was the internet coming in. So we had to use all the ports and uh, the Wayback Machine, yes, uh, it stops working. It, it gets an IP address for 15 seconds, then it just drops off the network. And it's driving me nuts. It's driving me nuts. So I'm, I'm about ready to throw it away and buy a new one, uh, but not that one. I would get a different one. So, because tech support is doing jack for me there. Anyway, so it's trying to, we get it all set up. I'm very happy with the cables. I mean, it's, it's almost something that I'm proud of on the back end. It lo still looks a mess. It's a lot of cables, but it's, it's really cool. Um, it's at least organized and neatly coiled and nothing like just drooped down onto the floor and stuff. So I get it all working th in the afternoon and I'm about ready. I'm thinking I can go live in the afternoon. I could do this. And my wife comes in and she says, um, what's Call that from smell? Nosy Rosie. Hang on one second. <laughs> Nosy Rosie. I just got to the smell part of the story. Uh, is, are you sure you want to come in right here and, and share what you have to share? <laughs> <laughs> Smell part, no. <laughs> Look, I have to just give you the business. Okay. I, I think I lost 10 pounds yesterday. I think I, was I found it. I was pacing back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> I was pacing back and forth. I had the chills. I think I ended up in the corner sucking my thumb. You cannot <laughs> ever get another gig. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. We don't know how to handle it. <laughs> I think for the next gig, I will have dedicated equipment just for that, and it won't be any of my studio gear. So that's that's what I'm working for. Nosy Rosie. No, we, we are just happy. That I, I guess this should tell you just how much we love you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. It's we good like to be back. We were like lost children. We were, no, and when I say that we were like lost children, we were bouncing around from channel to channel. We'd end up in the Facebook group. Where is he? Where is he? He's not here. He'll be here. No, oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to finish this story. We're right, we're right at the, the smell part, so I'll, I'll pick up there. Thank you, Dozer Rosie. I'll try to never be gone again. I'm making no promises, thank though. But thank you so much. We'll see you. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's what happened. I, everything's plugged in and my wife comes in. She's like, what's that smell? And I'm thinking, could the burner phone have finally like lived up to its name? Uh, and it wasn't, my phone was, was still just fine. Um, I'm, I'm looking around my room and it's the, the studio. It's like nothing's, I mean, this, this little, re, this thing, it gets smoking hot, but it's, it's, it's not, uh, not cooking. 
and uh, and then I step out in the the hallway and it's a little bit louder and I'm like yeah that's definitely smells like something is on fire and I live in a house that was built out of wood in 1915 so when when you think of fire in the house we're basically like one large fireplace just waiting to ignite and uh, turns out that in our laundry room uh, the smell was the strongest and the washer had just finished its cycle the dryer had not been running uh, yes the smoke was coming from the washer so my clothes inside the washer were clean technically um, because the, the cycle had finished, but they were not uh, smelling the best because they now smelled like burned rubber because the washer on the inside just burned up, like the pump lit on fire, which is apparently something that's not supposed to do. It's supposed to pump water and instead it caught on fire. Uh, this washer was an old washer that we bought with the house, literally. We, when I walked through the house and said we want to buy it, the one thing we asked from the seller is we want, you to, we want to keep the washer and dryer. Not because they were really good, but because we did not want to buy them or have to buy them as soon as we moved across the country. And we also did not want to bring our washer and dryer with us because they're just a pain. So uh, the washer was already on its last legs. When it, when it goes on spin cycle, this whole side of the house just like starts shaking, right? Things like fall off desks and things you have to tie everything down. Uh, it sounds like a jet engine. Um, and, and this was the last straw, right? It was the last straw. And so Mrs. RA, as amazing as she is, she knew that she was going to need a new washer. And so she has been budgeting for a new washer. Um, and she budgeted and, and said, I don't want to spend more than $750 because that's what I budgeted for a washer. And so she'd set aside this money for over months. She like, she'd foreseen that this little fire would happen. So we were able to go to Lowe's and, uh, and look at washers and they did not have the one that we wanted. They did not have one that would work with us for, you know, size wise, price wise, you know, we're not going to spend what they want for washers. So we then went to Best Buy because, Hey, I like Best Buy. That's where I bought my new network switch. And, uh, and then, uh, we looked at the washers there and they had the exact washer we wanted on a scratch and dent sale. Uh, that was, they were giving us $50 off. I'm like $50 off the full price for scratch and dent. That's no good. So we went to a third store, which was another Lowe's, the second Lowe's, and they had the exact washer we wanted, but it was attached to one of those pedestals, and they wanted us to buy the pedestal too. And I said, how much do you want this machine to stay in your showroom right here? Because it's already been here, because I can see from the dates, about two months, and nobody's bought it. I'm willing to take it off your hands, but not with that bottom piece on it, because I'm not paying for something I don't want. We don't want the pedestal. And uh, they ended up charging us $574 for the washing machine, which had a little dent on the top. It was perfect <laughs> and we installed it and it works. And oh my goodness, I didn't know washing machines could be so quiet when they ran. I mean, it's cleaning clothes right now. Spin cycle is going, but nothing is shaking in the house. I almost had to go back in and, and see what was happening. So I, on my own, I, I muscled the old washing machine out and, and it's now in, in the yard um, <laughs> where we're going to set it out because people come by and they take stuff. And I guess that's a normal thing around here. You set it out in, the, in like, here's my spot for things that if you want them, you just take them. And so there are people that come by and they recycle the metal, they recycle the motors, and they just come and grab them. So we're going to donate that washing machine to them because I think every piece in there probably is broken and it's only good for scrap. And anyway, we got we got a new washing machine. It's it's black instead of white, but I don't care. It's we're, Our washing machine is never designed to be like, oh, look how, how neat these two appliances look in the room. But uh, anyway, we're super excited. That's why I could not go live because we had a small fire to put out, literally, in, in our house. Now, now here we are. Here we are. I don't, I don't know what happened. It's like, I, it's like I've checked out of true crime for four days and I don't know where we are. I know we've got uh, Cedric Simpson is live. I'd like to jump in with him a little bit, but I sort of have to get my feet back under me and see what's going on. The, what, I've, what I've heard is that uh, Tucker... Um, down in uh, Key West. He's got a new date. Uh, thank you, by the way, for this. A new court date for April 4th. So that's going to happen. Everyone's talking about Scott Peterson. What is going on with Scott Peterson? Does he get a new trial? Does, does Scott Peter and We're talking about Scott Peterson, who uh, Lace, Scott and Lacey Peterson. Is that a thing? Is that going to happen? Because if so, we would. I'd love to follow that one. That's one of the few uh, court cases I remember from before I really followed court cases. Let's see, the Allen court date is finally set. Did he go for a top loader? No, we went for a front loader. Uh, we got a Samsung front loader. It, it talks to my phone. 
<laughs> I didn't know that it does this, but like I can like I can like program it to wash more, and I'm, I don't know. There's probably a camera in here where I can check the clothes and see if they're clean, but it's it does all that. Yes. Yeah, so Scott Peterson, what is up with Scott Peterson? LA Project actually believes in him. Is he getting a new trial? Delphi got a date. Uh, what's the date for Delphi? We're probably not going to cover that one, but I do want it on the calendar because we're going to watch, at least watch what happens. Let's see, Delphi. I'm not sure if I even have it on my calendar. Let's see, Samsung is nice. It, I like it so far. There are three Scott Petersons, right? Yes, there's a Scott Peterson in um, who was the reschool resource officer. There's the Scott Peterson and the Lacey Peterson. I, I believe he dumped her body in the in the bay, like went boating and with her and came back without her type thing. Um, May for Delphi. Okay, May fourth, May thirteenth. Uh, we'll just put May. Insert a row right here. Okay. May for Delphi. Let's see. May 13th for Delphi buffer. Sarah Boone, same day. Yeah, we will be following Sarah Boone. I'm sorry. Um, Sarah Boone is that same day, so... All right, um, Scott Peterson, the cop, I think. Scott has a hearing today. Okay, so so tell me, is are we talking about the Scott Peterson with Lacey Peterson that killed his wife, was convicted of killing his wife? Peterson is in Parkland and Peterson is L.A. with Lacey. Which one has the hearing? See, Boone's going to be wild. Delphi and Boone are the same day. Yes, Delphi's going to go a lot longer. Boone is going to be short. I, I tell you, I, I tell you, the the Boone trial. I'd be surprised if that takes more than a week. The wife and unborn child. I think it's the Lacey Peterson one. So what? Does somebody does somebody have the scoop on this? Does somebody want to give us a call really quickly and and tell us how this came to be? Because th this seemed like a slam dunk uh, when it went down. What what brought us to the point where we're looking at a new trial or the possibility of a new trial? This many years later. Parkland Peterson was acquitted. Yes, yeah, so he cannot be tried again. But I think there's like there's another Peterson. I, Scott Peterson is like the most common name in, in true crime, I think. It's so Lacey and Scott Peterson case. The LA Innocence Project want to open his case back up. But but what's the... Why? Brandy's been doing some research. I'll have to read and, and follow some of that. I haven't been able to do much of anything this, since this weekend. It's been busy. Okay. Uh, let's see. One of my mods just sent me... Samantha, thank you very much. Let's do a quick check, an article here that might give us a scoop on Scott Peterson. Scott Peterson case. Oh, we've got a call too. Call from Mattis. Mattis, this is Scott. How are you doing? Hello. I'm doing okay. Is it is it a bad sign when I have to have Germany fill me in on the America's uh, true crime status? <laughs> No, that's okay. Is that um, I, so apparently, this this news uh, broke in around January, and the basic idea is, um, so they, they believe they might find evidence that could uh, exonerate him. Um, so, so the idea is that during the discovery process, there was. So I might get this wrong. Chat will correct me. I heard there's this. Uh, law that when you say something wrong on the internet, people will immediately tell you the, the true thing. Yes. Um, my understanding is there there was a van and it had a mattress. 
something along those lines. And the idea is, well, the, the police didn't really look into that too much. Um, and eventually they decided it must have been the husband who did it. And the idea is, well, if there was DNA of the wife on the, in that van with that mattress, um, then that would exonerate him. But it was never tested. And so the idea is um, he should get a new trial based on newly discovered evidence. And if, if they have this link to where, uh, where his wife might have been abducted with something that had no connection to him, um, then he should be found in. So they say they found the mattress after all these years? Or they found the van? Well, it's not clear to me. I think they had it all this time. It just wasn't properly disclosed. So the idea for the new trial is, well, we, the defense, had never had the um, a real opportunity to test that. So it's like a, was that a Brady violation? If they didn't disclose it? Well, I think they did disclose it, um, at least the, the van. But it, so it, it's going to be um, some fine point about, um, so, so the, the idea is, whether there was DNA found. I think maybe the, maybe the new way this evidence comes in is that they are now doing DNA tests or they, they have found that there is DNA. Um, it would, ha it would have to be a solid could... match. I mean, th this would have to be some pretty solid evidence to overturn this. Yeah. Man. Yeah, well, well when you, and you can link the victim's DNA to some random car that is not linked to the perpetrator, then that would be pretty solid evidence it would. that they didn't get the whole story. It would. So, um, the, so this, this is the again, my memory is a bit hazy. It's been two weeks since I, I read the, the basic idea. Basically, they think they can, they might be able to find with DNA evidence um, the wife's DNA somewhere that would uh, go against his the, the theory of guilt. Okay, so. This is this is quite interesting. Um, hmm. L.A. Innocence Project. This is different from the like the Innocence Project, right? They're, yeah, they're like their own one. organization. Why, yeah, they have. That's why it's L.A. It's not an L.A. branch of the Innocence Project. It's its own thing. Um, Yeah, yeah. In interesting. Okay, so we'll we'll keep an eye on that because if that's going to happen again, I would I definitely want to follow that trial, especially you yeah. know. Um, if there is a a status hearing today, I don't think so. I, I heard there's going to be um, a broadcast of this stuff today, mm -hmm. um, but the question is: Is this a status hearing or is anything like substantial being done? Are there oral arguments or is this like a five minute? Hey, let's have our new meeting in the week. And I've heard I've heard it's a hearing to see if they get a new trial, but I don't know if the decisions can be made or if it, like motions are made and the judge just takes another advisement. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure which way it's going to go, but uh, definitely interesting for sure. Because this one this one seemed like a slam dunk back in the day, at least for the way I remember it. So yeah, it certainly does look it did look pretty bad for him. Um, yeah, let's see. Nosy Rosie says, I worked in La Jolla, which is two miles from Torrey Pines, where he was found. His family lives an hour north of there. Mexico, one and a half hours south. He had his passport. Why did he change his hair color and flee? His sister lies and has been helping him too. Really? Mm -hmm. I tend to be of the opinion that, so I've recently heard an um, interview with a, a lawyer I was actually in the, in the prosecution, mm -hmm. but the expression, it's kind of a romantic white hat um, perspective of how you want trials to go um, and everyone being fair. And so I, I tend to prefer trials where it's a murder trial, but the, the state has just like so much evidence that's just more and more and more like that. Um, that cop shooting trial we watched with, that was also Judge Wolf, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was pretty decent. That was a pretty comfortable amount of evidence. And I thought that in the, in the Scott Peterson case, it, it really was like, I'm, I'm trying to recall all the podcasts that I, that I listened to, but I, I, I'm really struggling with 
how that would work out. I mean, it's definitely worth a try to look at, at the evidence. I think it's fair to um, give it a shot if there is something there that's at least to be tested. Yeah, uh, so that, that'll be interesting. I, I don't think it'll actually be a new trial. I, I just It sounds like they're looking for the possibility of reasonable doubt. Mm-hmm. Um, not that they have produced something that is like the smoking gun that shows that it wasn't Scott. So I, I doubt I doubt this will go very far. This is a really high burden, a high hurdle to, mm-hmm. to follow. To I can't get my analogies right. <laughs> it's a rough yeah, day. I'm not it's sure Monday. how it works in in California, but at least the lawyers from the LA Innocent Project say they have gotten people out with this kind of newly discovered DNA evidence before so that that could help pretty well so i'm sure they have they, they will know what laws to cite which um precedent that's binding so i'm not sure how it works but it's it's always you, you we've seen um how different it is from state to state when we had the the reckless uh, homicide cases in first in michigan and then in new mexico and then in tennessee where it's like four degrees of involuntary um homicide in like one charge yeah. with, with uh... did I lose you no okay. I, I was just thinking about something else oh yeah this is okay I'm I'm deep in thought here as well so uh interesting thank you first of all Matt thank you for uh for uh filling me in on all this I, I feel like I'm at least up to speed a little bit on what's going to happen today so that'll be uh It'll be crazy. I, you don't see that happen a lot. You don't see this happen a lot. But I also don't want yeah, the wrong guy to be in prison. Hope. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I think we actually, you actually, you don't see it happen, but it happens a lot more often than we expect because these these innocent projects they exist because somewhere uh, lawyers realize that mistakes with evidence um, actually happen a lot of the time, and especially when you go back to old cases. And then you that didn't have DNA analysis at the time. Right. Once you do perform DNA analysis, you can get someone out that has been in prison for like forty plus years. Yeah. Crazy. Okay. Good. 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 Yeah. We'll uh, we'll follow that for sure and see what happens. We're going to. Uh, I think we're going to jump into a, a um, Cedric Simpson's court first, though, this morning, and follow what All happens right. here. Warmed this- up. Yeah, we we got warmed up. My brain's starting to think. I'm going to get my water, and we'll be good to go. Right. Mathis, it's always good. It's always good to talk to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the call. Have a great day. You Bye. Too. Bye. All right, we're going to jump in with uh, a little bit of. I, you know what else I did? I changed my screen. See my screen up here. It used to have like a big picture right there. Now I have a full 16 boxes, so everything's small, and it, and it feels weird. And now instead of, like, up here in the corner, that's like me. Uh, the, the picture that was here is now way over here. And this one used to be over there. And, yeah, so I just need to get used to the new layout. But with all the, all the things working now, I have to, well, almost all the things working now. I have to uh, have I, – I need one more TV, actually. I've got – I need a place over there to put one TV that's just going to be programmed out. Hmm. I have the TV already. I just need to figure out how to put it up there. All right, so let's uh, let's jump into Judge Simpson's court and <laughs> well, see what he's it's doing today. Good to see you, Mr. Yanni. <laughs> um, we have no prosecutors, no defense attorneys other than Mr. Yanni. That'll speed things up. Well, can you go find him and... I can't find them. They don't want to come in, and I'll just start calling cases and do what I got to do. <laughs> it's like, uh, Bella should, Parker? Shouldn't oh, we have some attorneys here? You don't have a client. <laughs> no clients, no attorneys. That goes so well for you, then. <laughs> what happened? You got to get a truck like me, just put it in four wheel and just start climbing over people. That's what I do. 
I'm always happy when people have lip. <laughs> well, maybe he's got a little road rage. Call from Melissa Filson. Hey, Melissa. We're listening to Judge Cedric. Hey, it's a road rage right now. What, what's happening? Oh, okay. Great. Well, we, I was just going to uh, tell you a little bit more about the, the Scott Peterson. I saw a um, Nancy Grace <laughs> episode about this and the new information in that van. And evidently they did not even investigate that. But there was a burglary, I believe, in the area. And they're thinking that Lacey may have witnessed something and then the burglars abducted her hmm. and they think that her blood may be on the mattress in that van. There, there's no way they're going to find that mattress. I mean, I, I realize landfills. I don't, I'm thinking they may have it. Oh, okay. But I'm not sure. That, I can't remember exactly what she said, but Nancy had a whole thing about it <laughs> and it was pretty informative. I don't know the, if they have a mattress with blood on it that they didn't test. I think so. I think that that's what they were saying on the Nancy Grace show that they knew about it, but did no investigating on it. Man. Crazy. So I, I'm not sure where the mattress is or the van is, but that they did know about it and just chose not to look into it. Man, that, so, that is, that is it weird. Interesting. It, it's yeah. it, it is interesting, but uh, it doesn't seem probable. Like in my head, I'm like, this this doesn't sound like, yeah, that could happen. Uh, if they've got a bloody mattress, yeah. first of all, they, they, they took it in evidence, but did they take it in evidence because of the robbery or because of the murder? It's like the two cases didn't meet. Right, see, so I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure how they even knew it. I'm thinking maybe it was on somebody's camera, you know, like a ring cam or something, but they knew about it, but I don't know that they had it in evidence or if they knew about it when they were doing their investigation and did nothing about looking into it. I can't remember exactly what the details were on that, but that was what they, I think we're trying to base getting the new trial on was that they didn't, look into all the possible leads. Man. Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll go through the hearing and see why, see what, uh, see what they say, but, uh, it'll be interesting. Yeah, I'm anxious to see but to have him back yes. in court. It'd be crazy. Thank you very much. Appreciate yeah. the call. Thanks for that. Okay. Update. All right. We'll see you. Sure. Bye. Bye. Is there a plastic? What? It's a too. I don't think that's what I was saying, but okay. <laughs> So, so like there are, there are like 50 prosecutors and, oh, well, nice of you to arrive. Good morning. I was just talking about you. Why? Well, I was saying that you were probably feeling neglected. I was. I, I am sitting here and there is nobody. Yeah. Well, Mr. Gaddy was here. Are we ready on anything or no? Um, well, my understanding is that we can call Ronald call Ronald Moat because uh, we are unable to proceed, and Raman Slater, Tiffany Hughes withdrew, so that will need to. He be is not withdrawn because I haven't signed the order. Oh. Yeah, is she here? Is Tiffany Hughes here? Oh yeah. No. Well, that might be a problem. <laughs> Judge has something up his sleeve. Hmm. You know, one thing I think young attorneys need to realize is that you have an obligation to fulfill to the court and to your client. And when you don't do so, it is the court's responsibility to hold you accountable. So I really hope Mrs. Hughes gets here. Otherwise, there's going to be a problem and a potential show cause. Not the prosecutor, Ms. Hughes. Oh, I'm I know you were interrupting my conversation. <laughs> He's on one today. So that may be a problem. Would you like me to do the waiver now to get that out of the way? 
Anybody here that can help you on the other side? Sure, let's do that. Go ahead. Assistant Prosecuting Attorney Morgan Barroso, I have the people. We have a conflict between this honorable court and public defender's office, but the people do not believe that such a conflict exists. The people make this waiver in avoidance of any doubt. Anybody from the PD's office? Uh, but, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Your Honor, uh, on behalf of the public defender office, um, we don't believe any conflict exists. And to the extent one does, you would waive it. Extent. All right. The court for its <laughs> the court for its part also does not believe there's a conflict either in the Michigan court rules or the cases decided there under. To the extent a conflict exists, given the waivers, the court will consent to hear the matter. All right, straight. We got that out of the way. Right from Mr. Um, who's who's on the other side of that, Mr. Gaddy? Oh, okay, he's here. Yes, we can do that one. I don't know. I don't know what the judge is drinking this morning, but he's enjoying it. What's his name? Arnold Just water? Watt, or Ronald Watt. I don't know what they're doing with the phone. Can you get him? What? Yeah. Okay. He busted it. The bailiff has left the building. I want to see what happens if this lawyer doesn't show up. The lawyer uh, that he's talking about, she filed a motion to withdraw and just assumed it would be rubber stamped. That's not how it works. Are they all next door? No. No. That, that court does court does call the case of the people versus Ronald Moa. Assistant prosecuting attorney Morgan Barroso. <clears throat> Mike Gaddy, assistant public defender on behalf of Mr. Moa, Your Honor, who's standing to my right. State your name, Mr. Moa. Thank you. Your Honor, at the date and time set for preliminary exam, at this time we are unable to proceed. Move to dismiss, Judge. People being unable to proceed, this case is dismissed. That's without prejudice on the defendant's motion. Thank you. You're awesome, sir. So that case is dropped, but not necessarily permanently. The state can re refile the uh, the charges. If he had said dismissed with yeah, prejudice, was. they could not refile. And we don't know why they don't proceed. It could be that witnesses weren't available. Couldn't be. It could be that they weren't able to meet the deadline investigatively. Um, it, it's a cheap little trick that they can do, and then recharge, and you reset the counter. But yeah. Oh, Miss Hughes was just here. Right. Is that? Uh, it, Cynthia, he would get out if that was the only thing that's holding him. A lot of times individuals in jail might have a, uh, a number of charges or another number of pending cases. And so there might be another hold on him. Uh, if that was the only one, they, the bailiffs do take him back to jail after the case is dismissed, but he's immediately or shortly thereafter, probably within an you hour ready or so, and yours, processed and released. Good morning. I'll be back at one o'clock. Thank you. Oh, that is at one. Mr. Gilbert, you're at 9 a.m. this morning. So, did you just... No, he's got uh, Thompson. He does have one at 9. Okay, I'm the only one here right now, and I need to turn the heater off because I'm like, I'm dying in here. It's like an oven. That's probably not going to go if he doesn't know he's supposed to be here. Are any of my people not in custody? No. <laughs> Well, 
You do. With whom? Joseph Thompson. He's in custody. He's in custody. Can you check the file? I think that's at nine. I, I talked to the prosecutor, uh, Morgan Barrasso. She said come back at one o'clock. It is at nine. nine. Miss Barroso was right there. She went to find Miss Hughes. But it's like sending people into a black hole. They don't come back. The ammo, maybe. I've turned the heater off, but it's still cooking. What does Mr. Brown have? Go get Miss Hughes. Okay, I'm sorry. I missed that sound by or any of my people not in custody. That's the one that's ready to go. Yeah. Who's on the other side of this one? Ms. Hughes and Mr. Vance. Oh. Ready to do Mario Brown? Because I don't have it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Let's roll. <laughs> Colin. You can't call. I can't call can, can you ask them to bring Mario Brown? Thank you, sir. Apparently you have to do work because they can't use a phone. Apparently, you have to do work. He says it's to his bailiff. Not sure. Where's she going? She won't come back. She's getting the officer. I'm sorry. I'm very confused. Because yes, you are. Says one PM. What? The Excel spreadsheet says one PM for Kyle Smith and Joseph Thompson. Yeah, I, that may be two that I was thinking because I sent out the cheat sheets. So our, none of our witnesses were planning to be here until 1 p.m. Case okay. dismissed. May I see your... They sent out a copy with their arm. Or does call the case uh, Big People versus Mario Brown. Yeah. Yes. You guys have to move. Judge is not happy now. No, good morning. This was the date and time set for preliminary examination. I don't know how long it's going to be here. Hold on. Okay. Let's right here. put your appearance. You want to put your appearance on? I call. Andrew Dennis, this is a public defender with not on behalf of Mario Brown. Mario Brown. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. All right. Date and time set for preliminary examination. You may proceed. Um, this is a case revolved, involving domestic violence. Um, Ms. Kristen Markham is not present. I do intend to proceed pursuant to MCL 768.27B with Officer Cooper. I don't know if there's an outright objection to that before I get started. No? Objection? Yes. Well, it depends, Your Honor, that, that statute has an expressly defined limited scope of what can come in as a hearsay exception. So. There's certain things that I think are within the scope of the statute and certain things that I think are outside. So it really depends on what it testifies to, whether I'll object or not. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure right. that I get them up there and then start the fight. Very I'm good. My first witness. You may. I have no other witnesses present in the courtroom. All right. Thank you. Please exceed, raise your right hand. You shall swear and affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So, yeah. 
Learn how to see. Stay and spell your first and last name for the record, please. Officer Howard Cooper, H O W A R D C O O E H R D N R, Police Department. Good morning. Good morning. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Officer, where are you currently employed? City of Ann Arbor Police Department. In what capacity? For how long have you been employed as such? Thank you. Your Honor, additionally, I would ask the court to take judicial notice that on March 9th, 2022, this is regarding the defendant's uh, felony conviction status, that on March 9th, 2022, the defendant was convicted of felony malicious destruction of uh, fire and or police property. Um, that is from the 22nd Circuit Court, and that is a felony that would make him ineligible to possess firearms and ammunition. Any objection? No, Your Honor. All right. Court will take notice of that. Officer, were you working in your capacity as an Ann Arbor Police Department police officer on February 16th, 2024? Hello. Were you working in the area of Packard and Crestland in Ann Arbor City, Washtenaw County, Michigan? I was. Were you working in the evening or early morning hours? Yes. yes. Um, do you recall approximately what time you were at, located at that location? Uh, no, That's okay. Um, are we talking evening or early morning hours at this point? Uh, early morning. Thank you. What were you doing in that area? Uh, conducting uh, dedicated traffic control. Uh, relevant to this case, did you make a traffic stop? I did. Tell us about the stop that you conducted. Uh, I was heading outbound on uh, Packard from the exchange area. There was a white SUV that was traveling uh, visibly over the post speed limit, 30 miles an hour. Uh, my radar indicated as such as well, and I conducted a traffic stop on that vehicle for speed. Do you recall the speed at which the vehicle was traveling? 35 miles an hour. In a 35 mile per hour. A mile. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you for correcting me. A 30 mile per hour zone. Thank you. Uh, did you make contact with the vehicle? I did. Were there occupants in the vehicle? Yes, ma'am. Do you know who the driver of the vehicle was? Yes, ma'am. It was Philip Dusky. Did you make contact with him? I did. Did you make contact with the um, occupants of the vehicle? The other occupants, I apologize. Yes, I did. Was there a front seat passenger? Yes, there was. Who was that? Uh, the individual sitting there in the orange jumpsuit. Uh, would I otherwise know him to be Mario Brown? Correct. Your Honor, please let the record reflect that the witness has identified the defendant. Without objection, the record shows so we're fine. Thank you. Um, was there somebody seated in the back seat behind the driver's seat? Behind the driver's seat, yes. Who was that? Uh, Haley May Gregg. Haley May Gregg, thank you. Um, and was there somebody sitting in the back seat behind the passenger seat? Yes. Who was that? Uh, Kristen Markham. Kristen Markham. When you made contact with the driver of the vehicle, uh, did you inquire as to whether or not the driver had a valid license? Do you know whether or not the driver had a valid license? He did not. Based on that information, what did you do? Uh, from the vehicle. Did you remove anybody else from the vehicle? Yes. Who did you remove from the vehicle? Uh, second, I believe, was <coughs> Aiden so verbally to me, um, after I requested that somebody else identify themselves if they had a valid license in the car. Thank you. For the record, Haley is H-A-L-E-Y, middle name May, M-A-E, last name Greg, G-R-E-G-G. -G. Um, when you made contact with her, did you receive a valid license? Uh, verbally, she provided her name. She did not have her physical license on. Thank you. Uh, why was she removed from the vehicle? Uh, she was removed from the vehicle ultimately because when she provided her verbal identification, it was determined that she did have a warrant for her arrest. Once you removed her from the vehicle, where was she? Uh, she was secured in the backseat of my patrol vehicle. When she was in the backseat of your patrol vehicle, did you have the opportunity to speak with her? I did speak with her. At this point, and I'm not going to ask you what she said, at this point, did you receive information that caused you to continue an investigation? I did. After speaking with Ms. Gregg, who did you make contact with next? Uh, Ms. Markham. And for the record, that's Kristen Markham? Correct. Kristen is K-R-I-S-T-E-N, last name Markham, M-A-R-K-H-A-M. When you made contact with Ms. Markham, where was she? Uh, initially, she was still in the backseat of the vehicle. And then wh where was she after that? Uh, I asked her if she would step out of the vehicle to talk with me so she would be in a more comfortable place. 
Where, when you when you asked Miss Markham to step out of the vehicle, where did you take her? Uh, towards the back of my patrol vehicle, sort of like almost behind it. When you initially made con, uh, I shouldn't say initially. When you were first behind your patrol vehicle with Miss Markham, were you able to observe what her demeanor was like? I was. Can you please describe it for the court? Uh, it was extremely frightened. She was uh, shaking, um, almost crying. Uh, seemed like almost paranoid about somebody who was going to see her. Kept looking back at the car. Constantly, whenever I was talking to her, just continually was looking back at the front of the car to see if somebody was going to come back, I guess. When she was looking back at the car, you're talking about the white SUV she was looking at? Yes. Correct. And was the defendant located still inside that white SUV? Correct. At the place she was looking at. Um, was there a point that you inquired of her about domestic violence? Correct. Did she make statements to you about domestic violence? She did. Could you please tell us what she told you? Yeah. Your Honor, I'm at this point proceeding under MCL 768.27B for our statements about hearsay to so an officer. The Excuse witness, me, our statements the witness about domestic violence, court, which are not hearsay officer is to an allowed officer. To share some of gone through. So, sir, what's your objection? You may proceed. Thank you. What did she tell you? Um, we're at... Uh, Yes, let's, we're going to start at the very beginning. You're start standing behind your car. What's the first thing that she indicated or told you about domestic violence? Uh, she indicated that she was a victim of domestic violence earlier that evening. And did she say who perpetrated the domestic violence? Who? Uh, the defendant? Correct. Did she tell you where the domestic violence occurred? She did. Where did it occur? On the area of Packard and Platt in the city of Ann Were they walking down the street? Were they in a vehicle or something else? They were assigned to vehicle. Inside of a vehicle. Right. Um, did she describe for you where in the vehicle she was located? And I, sh I should clarify here. Do you know what vehicle they were in? Uh, not the exact vehicle. It was not the vehicle that I had pulled over. It was a different vehicle. And this would have happened, of course, earlier because she's telling you about it after the fact. Yes. Right. Thank you. Did she tell you where inside this other vehicle she was? Yes. Where? She said she was in the back seat. And did she tell you where the defendant was? Uh, yes. Where was he? Uh, I believe, oh, I have to refresh my recollection because it's between two different places. If I do that, I Your Honor, to... may I have... Yes, you may. Thank you. He's going to check his report, refresh his recollection. So he's allowed to ad admit, they're allowed to admit this hearsay evidence through the officer who received the report from the complaining victim. That victim, as is often the case in uh, situations like this, did not want to proceed with testifying against the, the defendant. Okay, you've refreshed your memory. Where was she sitting? Uh, so she, she was sitting in the back passenger seat. He was sitting, he as in Mario Brown was sitting in the front passenger seat right in front of her. Thank you. And did she tell you what occurred? She did. And please tell us what she told you. Uh, she advised that she had been pistol whipped uh, with a handgun and threatened. Uh, subsequently, with that handgun by Mario Brown, she had been hit in the side of the head. I've had that happen. So to me. let That's me make no sure fun. this is clear. When you say she was pistol whipped, it was the defendant that pistol whipped her Correct. with a handgun Correct. inside a vehicle. Correct. Did you recover that handgun? Did. Where did you recover it from? The back seat of the vehicle that I pulled over behind where my room was sitting. So now I'm in a different, I'm in, not in the car that the domestic violence occurred in. I'm in this white SUV. That I stopped correct. And you said it was behind where the defendant was sitting. When you recovered this handgun, can you tell me whether or not it is a real gun? I can. How do you know that it's a real gun? I've had experience handling several firearms and a lot of different investigations in my career. Was there any ammunition inside of this gun? When you first made, I'm going to go back to your interview with Miss um, Markham. When you first made contact with her, did you immediately observe any injuries on her? Not immediately, no. At any point, did you observe, and, and let me ask you, what, what was she wearing? And I apologize for wording it like that. What was she wearing when you first made contact with her? Uh, it was a coat and then a winter hat and her hair was kind of held down to like the sides of her head. There's the winter hat. Was there a point that the winter hat was removed? There was. Who removed it? Uh, she did. Once she removed the winter hat, were you able to see injuries? 
I was. Where did you see injuries? Uh, behind your left ear. What type of injuries did you observe? There was bruising just below the base of her ear, kind of where her neck was, plus a little bit of blood around it. Throughout your interaction with Ms. Markham, did you observe any changes to the injuries? Yes. Please describe that. Um, throughout the course of my investigation, towards the end, just prior to releasing her from the scene, um, I was able to capture some photos before I let her go on her way. The bruising was significantly worse, looked much darker, it also looked a lot more swollen to me at first. Did Miss, you mentioned that Miss Markham told you that while she was being pistol whipped, she was threatened. Do you know, did Miss Markham tell you what the threat was or what the threats were? Uh, yes. Could you please tell us what she said? Uh, the defendant stated he was going to kill her. No, go ahead. What's your objection? Uh, I believe the officer testified that the gun he allegedly recovered in the other vehicle was the same gun that the complaining witness said she was going to slow it. My objection, that's speculation. So my question was, did you recover that gun? And he said yes, and this certainly seems like an area for cross-examination, perhaps. Yes. So to the extent that was an objection, it's overruled. Go ahead. Thank you. I apologize. I'm just making sure I've no, okay. covered all the elements. I'll share that story here during the break. It was a long time ago. Okay. Thank you, Honor. I have no further questions for this witness at this time. Cross-examination. Good morning, officer. Good morning. So, Ms. Markham, you testified that Ms. Markham told you that Mr. Brown pistol whipped her with a gun, correct? That's right. Okay. Did she tell you what the make or model of the gun was? She did not. Did she tell you what the color was? She did not. Okay. Do you have any, so you don't have any personal knowledge that the gun she was purportedly describing to you of the earlier alleged assault was the same gun that you testified located in the vehicle? I knew it. I'm not sure how the proceedings go here. So you have personal knowledge of that? No, it's from. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that might be it. You know, if I could just have one second. Right. I have to let you know, I did get a call yesterday from uh, Pickles the Cat. And and I so just want to be clear, the, the vehicle where she told you earlier she was pistol whipped is not the vehicle that was pulled over, correct? That's correct. Right. Yeah. Okay. Were any fingerprints taken on the gun that you said was located in the traffic stop vehicle? I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not the... I want to charge the case right now. I'm looking for the detective. So you don't know. That's fine. Okay. Um, do you know if the gun was registered to anyone? I It was not registered to anyone? Okay. And the vehicle that was pulled over on the, the 35 and 30 traffic stop, um, that vehicle is not registered to Mr. Brown, correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any redirect? Uh, no, no further questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You may sit down. Thank you. Oh, your next witness. I had a good talk no, with, with Pickles. Pickles the cat. Uh, she wanted me to, to Any witnesses send for along her, her, uh, her hellos and no, well no, wishes. Thank you. Not All right. And I returned the favor back the other direction. Do I have a motion? I'd like to see a motion to find over on the information that's written. All right. 
response. Your Honor, with respect to count one, I will leave that to your discretion. I do understand that there was testimony of an alleged pistol whipping by my client, and you allowed that in through the statute that was referenced. There was testimony about injury that the officer observed on Ms. Markham. There was testimony that my client was a front passenger of a vehicle that was pulled over for speeding and pistol was located in the vehicle. I believe there is not probable cause to bind over on all the other counts. These are all weapons charges. Count two, three, four, five, except uh, six. Count seven is a misdemeanor, so I'm not obviously addressing that. That could be um, that's separate. So on, on carrying concealed weapon, first element is that the defendant knowingly carried a pistol and that the pistol was concealed on or about his person. Or I suppose what, what they're really saying is that a pistol was in a vehicle and they'd have to prove even here at, by probable cause that defendant knew the pistol was there and he took part in carrying or keeping the pistol in a vehicle. I don't believe the testimony in a cited case, People v. Smith, 21, Michigan App, 717, goes all the way back to 1970. The CCW statute does not punish one who is merely present in a car when a pistol is found. Of course, there has to be. Yeah, but don't, don't I have more than that, counsel? They, well, there has to be at least probable cause that he knew a pistol was present. And he was carrying it, um, or he knew at least that he knew it was in the vehicle. But the mere presence of what I'm saying is just just being in a vehicle where a pistol is located is not enough. And I don't think whatever. Yeah, but there's more in this case, isn't there? There's testimony that goes to count one right. that my client allegedly pistol whipped uh, Ms. Markham earlier that day at a separate location in a separate vehicle. Uh, possession by possession of felon by firearm. Has to be a probable cause that no firearm in Michigan, and then the ammunition. I suppose to be candid, the uh, the testimony that goes to count two could could go to support the the allegation that he knowingly possessed firearm. <laughs> He's arguing the other side's position, I guess. If you say my client um, pistol however, with you, that would mean he possessed of ammunition. There's testimony that he allegedly pistol whipped Ms. Markham with a gun, but there's no description of that gun. There's no testimony that there was a, there was ammunition in that gun. So I don't believe that's sufficient for bind over. And then depending on what And for all those same reasons, Your Honor, I don't believe there's enough to support felony firearm because one of the elements, as, as I'm sure you know, is at the time the defendant committed or attempted to commit the predicate crime, in this case, say, GBH, he normally carried or Great possessed bodily firearm. Um, with prosecutor's case thus far, Your Honor, is that there's no evidence to connect, in my opinion, respectfully, the alleged gun that was used to pistol whip this person, allegedly, and a gun that was found in a vehicle later that day in a different vehicle at a different location. There's no fingerprints. It's not registered. Immediately behind the defendant. I believe the testimony was that the the gun was located in the backseat area behind the defendant 
where other people, where someone else was sitting. Behind the defendant in the sense that there's testimony he was in the front seat. Wow. A little bit more. And also, it wasn't my client's car. And again, just merely being in, in a vehicle with the presence of vehicles, not enough. Those weapons charges, Your Honor. Thank you. Response. Thank you. So, finding the weapon, the police officer finding the weapon is kind of the cherry on top. So we have domestic violence cases constantly, unfortunately. But a victim tells the police that he pistol whipped me with a gun, that's enough. That is evidence that the defendant, who is a convicted felon and ineligible to possess, was possessing a firearm. And so if we were to accept the defense argument, we would be then saying that in cases where the police don't successfully recover a firearm, now we don't have firearms charges. That's not typically how we proceed here. And that is probable cause. The victim's statement that she was pistol whipped with the gun is probable cause, not only that the defendant committed great bodily an assault with intent to cause great bodily harm on her, but also that he possessed a gun. The question that I deliberately asked the officer was, did you recover that gun? I asked it like that intentionally, and he answered in the affirmative that he he recovered that gun. That issue then became ripe for cross-examination. And at this point, the evidence that is in through the officer's testimony is that the gun that was recovered is the gun that the defendant used to perpetrate the domestic violence on the victim. And that gun was loaded. So there's my probable cause that he possessed a gun with ammunition. The gun also being located directly behind him is great evidence of probable cause that he is still in possession of the firearm. But I certainly have the theory that the victim's statement that he used that firearm to, uh, he used a firearm to assault her, and then the testimony from the officer that that gun was recovered and it's loaded is similarly evidence and probable cause that he also possessed the ammunition. But, okay, well, all right. That's Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Anything else? Well, Your Honor, I, I, I think you probably already see my point when I made that. Well, probably not, but go okay, ahead. Okay, well, um, it, it's really, if we're, it's really speculation by the officer that's the, the same gun. I mean, he can say it's the same gun, but there's, there's no testimony that supports his statement that it's the same gun. It's, he got no description of the gun. I'll call it the alleged pistol whipped gun. He got no description of that, no make, model, or color, nothing about ammunition. So the fact that he says it's the same gun doesn't mean there's evidence to support that. It's really speculation that it's the same gun. That's your challenge to two? But I thought you had indicated that just the what's what's been shown in count one supports count two. It it seems interesting that he well, pistol whipped her, and then when the police showed up, the handed her a loaded firearm. Theory is that count two is based on a gun that reportedly was found in. The traffic stop vehicle. No. No. My theory is that he assaulted her with a firearm in a vehicle, which is carrying a concealed weapon. I'm not going to buy my search for prosecutors who certainly want a trial. Standing here today, he assaulted her with a gun in a vehicle. That's what she's okay, that's fine. I understand that. Um, I guess the only thing I should add, Your Honor, is that. Um, Isn't your real argument as to count for what? Yeah. Possession of ammunition? Yes. Yes. I mean, I do have an argument. I mean, if, if one believes in the testimony that I have before <laughs> me is one, it would support count one, two, certainly three. Five and six. Count four is your real argument. I agree that that there's that that should not be bound over. And thank you for pointing that out. I mean, <laughs> he's assisting me it, to the extent. Well, I'm not assisting not anybody. I'm just, I'm just trying to get clarification on your argument. Yes, that's your argument is is 
would it be that there's no evidence that if the theory is that he possessed the weapon when the GPH uh, was create was committed, that all everything else would be bound over, but there's no proof that that gun at that time was loaded. Correct. Isn't that really your argument? Yes, but I do feel I should also add on count two, the CCW, something I didn't mention before, but relates to my argument is that I believe the prosecution has a burden of proving certainly at trial at beyond reasonable doubt. I recognize it's a probable cause standard here that the defendant was, did not have a CPL. No. Well, he, I don't a, think you have to show that. Uh, it's a carry a in a vehicle. Deal. My understanding is you can carry a vehicle, a gun is in a vehicle a if you have a valid CPL. Defense and defense? he has to assert that that's an affirmative defense. Okay. It's, that's what we may have to prove the negative, though. Is he asserting that? No, I'm not asserting I mean, I don't, today. unless he wants to come up and testify. <laughs> No, Your Honor. Uh, My understanding was under the jury instruction that the prosecution has the burden to show there's no CPL. But concealed pistol license, at least at trial, he's he's not going to have a CPL if he's a felon. Asserted. I understand that You're he has authority to carry it. Okay, thank you. Anything else? No. All right. No, but at court, I do agree. About it. court having heard the testimony the court believes that the people have sustained their burden of showing um by probable cause that the defendant committed the offenses contained in count one two three five six seven would tag along with that if the people's theory is that the he's going to be bound over for trial weapon was that was at the time of the pistol whipping, which I think is the, really the evidence in this case, it supports all of those charges. It does not support count four, as there's no evidence that at that time that the defendant would have been in possession of ammunition. I mean, one could maybe make an inference of that given what was found, but rather than do that, so the court will decline to bind over on count four. The defendant will be bound over on counts one, two, three, five, six with seven pound. So he is going to be held in jail, but Thank one you. of them gets thrown out. Renee, Renee Smitley, thank you very much for the gift you of need membership. To do the circuit. Well, he needs to come back, please. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna bail on this. You need to do the circuit court arraignment. Your Honor, I'll acknowledge receipt of the amended information because I know that's in progress. My client stands mute and waives formal reading. Defendant having waived formal reading, standing mute, court will enter not guilty plea. Pretrial in this matter will be set. April 25th at 1.30 before Judge Slade Thursday. April 25th, 2024. Judge Slade. 1.30 Slade Thursday. Thank you. Bond will continue. Thank you, Your Honor. I sign the additional cross out count. Those brilliant red sleeves. <laughs> Judge Simpson has a, a pretty cool style, clothing style. looks uh, looks awesome. All right, we're going to jump over to uh, to Judge Boyd. I think she's coming back here right now. Let's see what's happening here. I think we've also got Judge Wolf. We're going to be popping in on a little bit. Might jump straight to Judge Wolf because he's got something happening. Oh, you're going. 
Then in docket number 413, uh, you are found, you will be pleading no contest to shoplifting, sentenced to 11 months and 29 days to the county jail. And that will be consecutive to the prior case, but concurrent with the next case I'm about to deal with. You, it will be suspended to supervised probation. You will be ordered to pay restitution to Walmart in the amount of $27.29 in court costs. And you will be banned from Walmart. You will have a $150 fine and cost. In front of the Walmart. In document 415, upon your plea to simple possession, you will be found guilty. Uh, plea of no contest to simple possession, you were found guilty, sentenced to 11 months, and 29, 11 months and 29 days. That will be concurrent to the prior case, but sus, um, suspended to supervised probation. It will be consecutive to 381. So you're going to have eight years plus 1129 effectively. You understand yes, that? Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, raise your right hand. Let's place you under oath. State your full name for the record. Nicholas Vincent Hanlon. Mr. Hanlon, you are here today charged with three different indictments. You've heard me go over what your agreement is, but have you seen or been shown a copy of those charges, talked them over with Mr. Howard and you, and he discussed the range of punishment you're facing as well as any possible defenses you might have? Yes, Your Honor. Well, it's indicated you want to enter this plea of, of uh, no contest. What that simply means is you understand what the state's evidence is going to be against you. You're not going to admit you did anything wrong, but you're not going to deny it. And the state will then tell me what their evidence would be at trial, and I'll find you guilty based on those facts. Do you understand that? Yes, Do you guilty. understand, however, Boom. that you have a right to plead no uh, plead not guilty and have a speedy and public trial by jury? Yes, Your Honor. You understand that if you went to trial, you would have the right to have an attorney and to have one appointed, as I've done with a public defender? Yes, Your Honor. You understand at trial, you'd be presumed to be innocent until such time, if ever, the state proved your guilt beyond a reasonable doubt to the satisfaction of all 12 jurors, and their verdict would have to be unanimous before you could be convicted. Yes, Your Honor. You understand that if you went to trial, you and your lawyer could confront and cross-examine. If your witness the state called to testify, you could bring in your own witnesses by the use of a subpoena. Yes, Your Honor. You understand that if you went to trial, you would be presumed to be innocent. You would not have to testify or prove anything. And no inference of guilt would arise because you did not testify at your own trial. Yes, Your Honor. You understand that if you went to trial and you were found guilty, you could appeal the conviction and the sentence imposed to the Court of Criminal Appeals and have a lawyer appointed to help you with that appeal. Yes, Your Honor. You understand that by entering this plea of no contest, or these pleas of no contest, you're waiving your right to a trial and to an appeal. All I'm going to do is approve what your lawyer worked out. Yes, Your Honor. But those, that's going to result in, in a series of convictions, and those convictions are going to be on your record in the future to make more severe the punishment you receive if you're ever again convicted of a crime. Yes, Your Honor. You understand everything I've explained to you? Yes, Your Honor. Do you want to enter a plea of no contest according to this agreement? You want to plead no contest? You want, yes, sir. You want this deal, this, in other words? Yes, yeah. yes, I do. I want to do <clears throat> Is your decision to plead no contest today voluntary? Yes. Anybody forcing you to do this? No, sir. You understand I can't accept your plea unless I'm satisfied that there are facts to support it and that you are guilty? Yes, Your Honor. What are, uh, then I want you to listen as the state tells me what their facts would be if this case went to trial. Judge, in regards to 2023 CR 413, Mr. Hanlon uh, did go into Walmart on April the 23rd of 2023, and he did take and conceal items, um, scissors, handsaw, and pliers, Whoa. which he removed from Walmart without paying for them. Duct tape, garbage bags, he and was bleach. Then caught, arrested, and, and I believe some of the items were recovered, but not all of them. Clearly on the murder aisle. And then on. May the 16th of 2023, Mr. Hanlon was supposed to be in General Sessions Court for this hearing. She's standing behind the defendant at the prosecutor's appear. table. 2023 CR 415, Mr. Hanlon on September 4th of 2023. <laughs> was um, officers had been dispatched out due to a person who was slumped over in the parking lot in a parking space. They officers arrived, um, found out that it was Mr. Hanlon. He was passed out um, in the car. 
He admitted that he was a chronic user of heroin and other opiates. Um, officers then did um, speak to him. They observed what appeared to be uh, some paraphernalia at that point in time. He was detained and he was found with a small amount of fentanyl. Mr. Hanlon, I'm not asking that you there's, agree with those facts. There's one more, Judge. I'm sorry. Oh, there's more. <laughs> you paused long enough for me to jump I, in there. So. I know. Sorry about that, Judge. Um, and then in 2023, CR 415, on December 3rd, 2022, the detectives with the police department in Dixon were dispatched out due to a death um, that occurred in Dixon. The the, the victim in this case who was found deceased was Mr. Golden, Christopher Golden. Um, he later, an autopsy determined that he had died of multiple drug toxicity, including fentanyl, methamphetamine, and alcohol poisoning. Um, the investigation led to speaking to Mr. Hanlon, who was a family member of Mr. Golden, and Mr. Hanlon admitted that Mr. Golden had reached out to him that day asking that he um, bring him some drugs in which Mr. Hanlon admitted that he did bring him some drugs um, and then Mr. Golden did overdose. All right, Mr. Hanlon, now I'll ask you, do you understand that's the state's evidence and I'm not asking you to agree with it, but do you understand that's what the state's evidence would be if you went to trial? Yes, sir. You still wish to enter a plea of no contest? Yes, sir. Are you satisfied with your attorney's services? Yes, sir. You feel like Mr. Howard's done a good job of representing you confidently? Yes, sir. Howard, do you know of any reason you should not enter this plea? I do not. And <clears throat> then Nicholas Hanlon in docket number 2023 CR 318, upon your plea of no contest to count one, I find you guilty, sentence you to eight years Tennessee Department of Corrections. That will be suspended to supervised probation after completion of treatment selected by the 23rd Judicial uh, Recovery Program. So you will not go on probation until you have successfully completed your treatment. $2,000 fine of cost. <clears throat> Once you are on probation, you must successfully complete recovery court as a condition of your probation and you will be furloughed to that treatment facility selected by the drug court or recovery court and it will be a zero tolerance violation for your probation. In document number 2023 CR413 upon your plea to uh, no contest to shoplifting, um, I find you guilty of that. Sentence you to 11 months and 29 days in the county jail that will be suspended. Will uh, be consecutive to the prior case of 318 but concurrent to the next case I'm about to deal with that will be suspended to probation. You order to pay restitution in the amount of $27.29 to Walmart. You were banned from Walmart in order to pay a $250 fine. And uh, on docket number four, or the fourth count, which is failure to appear, I don't have a disposition, but I'm assuming it's a class A misdemeanor. So he would be sentenced to 11 months and 29 days in the county jail as well on that. It will be suspended to probation concurrent with count one of that indictment. That's great. <clears throat> 23 CR 415, upon your plea of no contest to count one, I find you guilty, sentence you to 11 months and 29 days in county jail. That will be served consecutively to CR 318, but concurrent to these other misdemeanor charges. It will be suspended to supervised probation in order to pay a $750 fine and cost. Count two is dismissed as a part of that. I don't think it was ever announced, but there's another case, 23 CR 414, that would be nollied as a right. And that case will be nollied as a part of this agreement. So. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Hamlin, I'm going to hand this back to you. Did you go over this with him, Mr. Howard? I did, yeah. And it's got a place for you. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, don't do that. There's also a meeting attendance election, which I'm not sure is required for me to have anything to do with it. Hanlon, I've been handed a document indicating that you have uh, 
acknowledge that you have it's a participant's acknowledgement of understanding of the attached recovery court entry order. And the reason I'm going over that with that is that your signature on that document? Yes, sir. Do you fully understand and go over it with your lawyer, the order of entering the uh, drug court and all of the rights that you're giving up? Yes, sir. And the reason I ask that is because you are surrendering certain rights that you would otherwise have, and I need to make sure you fully understand that. But you read it over with your lawyer, and you and he both are in agreement. Yes, all right. Then you are declared to uh, be furloughed. I'm going to furlough you to treatment. You're not in the drug court until you successfully complete that treatment. So. All right, so two people banned from Walmart. Now we're going to pick up a trial. We're going to go back just a couple days because we were so doing something else. Do we're, going to, to... we're going to jump to Judge Boyd. Uh, she had a trial just the other, um, the end of last week, I think. That uh... Your Honor, uh, we are quickly perusing some video to skip some time. Three minutes, five minutes. Okay. And, and we were just going to step out and talk to our complainants. They just flew in from Florida, so we were okay. going to bring them in here. All righty. I think we've got a stolen trailer case. DUI case from last week uh, was guilty, but on lesser included, it hey, was a weird one. For the case from last week, she was found guilty on lessers for the, so it was negligent, negligent homicide or something, and, but they dropped the DUI portion of the homicide charge, but found her guilty of driving under, under the influence anyway. So it was, Court is calling was 2021 CR 7016, State of Texas versus Jose Lozano. Could I have parties announced for the record for the state? Hank Wilkins and Daniel Escobar for the state, Your Honor. Defense. Raymond Martinez and Victoria Cruz for Mr. Lozano. And are you, uh, hi. And are you Mr. Lozano? Yes. All right. So the court has received the motion in limine. There's an amended motion in limine. And then there's a motion for discovery of exculpatory and mitigating evidence. All right. With regards to the motion for exculpatory and mitigating evidence, um, State, you have to turn that over. So is there an issue with that, counsel? Well, they gave it to me, Judge, but remember, they gave it to me like the day before yesterday. All and right. So it, it kind of goes hand in hand with the limiting issue on what I'm trying to limiting out is the complainant's testimony. About oh, and please remain seated. It makes it easier for the court reporter to, to hear. What I'm trying to limiting out is, the, is any testimony from the complainant about the value and as you can see from the indictment, the state has the burden to prove a certain amount. So it's a critical issue in the case, obviously. So well, isn't the complainant allowed to say what they paid for an item? Is that well, what you're trying to limit me out? What I'm, trying, what I'm trying to limit me out is the fact that I didn't get discovery on that issue, which I've been asking for for a long, long time. I finally got frustrated because I wasn't getting anywhere with it. And I filed a Brady motion, but I had been having that conversation with the state since I've been on the case. And this is the question. He made an insurance claim. Obviously, he's going to state what the values are to the insurance company. The insurance company and him are going to negotiate. Potentially, he's going to settle that claim and agree to a value by accepting a payment from the insurance company and signing a release. So all of that was relevant to the issue, one of the core issues of the case, which is, what is the value of this item? Just one second. Excuse me, who is this in the... I'm going for ATR, do you need that to see that first? Okay. All right. Thank you. Just have a seat. All right. You may continue. Just walking into my court. Prepare and probably defend my client. I need to know those that information. So, finally, um, day before jury selection, I get the printout that is before the court from USAA, which exactly addresses what I've been asking for for more than a year. And as you can see from the dates on that document, they settled this case with the complainant. Some of it two years ago. Uh, 2021 and 2022. Um, so they've had that information. Well, the complainants had all that information all this time. So, and right, I, because you're not saying that the state had this information in their possession and did not turn it over to you, correct? Not necessarily. I don't know if they, I don't know when or if, I'm sure they can tell you when they got it. I don't know. And I'm not, I'm not attributing any ill motives to them. This is how things work out sometimes. Bottom line is it's affected my ability to prepare because all they gave, they gave me a listing from the complainant. These are all the items and these are the values that I'm putting on them, right? But if he says that and testifies to that, when he goes and settles with the insurance company, he accepted their values, which are different. Mm -hmm. 
Maybe. There's no way to know because as you see from the document, it just gives you a summary of personal items, $15,000. Well, what does that mean? Which item was valued at which amount? How, I, how, can, I, how can we ever know that? How can the jury ever know um, how to come to those numbers when I haven't been given those breakdowns to properly cross-examine them? I fully expect that there's items that he put values on that the insurance company paid him less for that he accepted and signed a release for. But I have none of that information. All right. State? Yes, Your Honor. So uh, for purposes of the record, I received these two documents uh, mm -hmm. on Monday at 525. And I'm not sure exactly the time I emailed the defense, but it was shortly thereafter. I just dragged these PDFs that I received over and sent them over. So as soon as they were in my possession, I did turn them over to defense. Um, the, the limiting, I believe defense is trying to limit out that he doesn't want the, the complaining witness, the victim in this case, to testify to the value of his property that was stolen. And I don't think that's supported by case law. Um, the case that uh, the CCA has decided this in 1986 in Sullivan v. State, which is 701 Southwest 2nd, 905. And the relevant quote from that is, the owner of stolen property may testify as to his or her opinion or estimate of value of such property in general in commonly understood terms without making specific statements as to market value or replacement value. So, Judge, I, I don't see, um, we have this information from USA, but I, I think if anyone's ever dealt with an insurance company before, um, you know that sometimes you might settle with an insurance company for an amount that is not equal to what your items were worth, right? That's how insurance companies make money is they insure something for $100 and they might settle with you for 50. So I, I, I don't think it would be an appropriate remedy to uh, exclude the victim in this case from being able to testify uh, about the uh, the, the value of his items that were taken. And it, that's not just my opinion. That's what the CCA says, Judge. All right. So here's my question. Attached to the defense's motion for discover of exculpatory mitigating evidence is a claim details report from USAA. And if you'll see the November 22nd, 2021 date, it has the payee's name. It has an amount, says status complete. And then it says view details. Where is, or is that the detail? This is what I received from the um, the complaining witness judge. I, I'm not sure what what happens if you click on view details. Um, it's a what I received is a PDF. Okay. Well, what I can tell you is this: number one, if the defense uh, wants the USA a payments issued excluded, the court is gonna exclude that. Uh, and for these reasons, the date that's listed in the payment details are from 2021. Here it is, 2024. They should have received that from the insurance company. So I see a date also from 2020. So, um, Defense, if you're asking that the USAAA documentation be excluded, the court will grant that. Well, Judge, I mean, that kind of is well, not around what I'm asking for. But no, no, no. Is this is what we're dealing with. Yeah. What we're dealing with is this. A complainant can come in and testify and say, for example, I bought this computer. I gave them $500 for this computer. They are allowed to testify to that now. If people want to cross-examine that person and say, well, when did you buy that computer? You're more than welcome to do that. But the complainant is going to be allowed to testify to if they know what they paid for an item, not what USA gave them, but what they actually paid for an item. And then you all can handle it in cross or however you all want to handle it. Uh, if you want to use the USAA payout, you can use that. But I will not allow the state to use the USAA documentation to prove up a value amount in this uh, because the defense has just received it yesterday. Your Honor, Daniel S. Clark with the state of Texas. There, were, there was documentation that was handed over to the defense prior. It was the USAA documentation payout regarding the vehicle that was uploaded 
pretty soon after, and I can look it up on Verapik. What yeah. what I'm talking about is what the court has in its possession, which it it states claim details properly property burglary theft December fourth, twenty twenty, and then it says payment issued payment details November twenty second, two thousand twenty one. $101,850, uh, May 7, 2021, $78,022.29, December 16, 2020, $15,000. And then it says personal property, stolen firearms, $927.55. Personal property, stolen silverware, goldware, platinumware, and uh, pewterware, $43.79. Personal property, stolen jewelry, watches, and furs, $9,992.92. Sorry, $9 Personal property, money, $200. That's what I'm speaking of that. Oh, and then the following page. They have amounts of $65,358.03. The USAA report that was just turned over to defense yesterday, that report is going to be excluded if the defense wants it to be excluded. If something that was turned over to the defense before that with the original discovery, then of course the defense has access to it and they've had access to it. But this will be excluded. The complainant is allowed to testify to what they paid for a specific item. Judge, I don't have a problem with him doing that. Mm -hmm. I also had the converse, which is what he agreed with the insurance company was worth at the time they settled his claim. Mm -hmm. because, because the value of his property at the time it's stolen is the value that we're working with in terms of what the state mm -hmm. has to prove. Now, and if he bought something years ago, he settled with the insurance company for a certain amount. And that list, I could match it up to the items, as you see in the indictment, mm -hmm. specifically lays out what the items are. Where's the, is this the most detailed list that USA gave you? This, this is what the complainant gave us. All right. So, has anybody called USAA no, to ask them for a detailed list? No, ma'am. Does anybody want to call USAA? and ask them for a detailed list. Their number's all over the TVs. Should be easy to call that number. There's always a commercial plane for USAA. So they're going over the details of what can be allowed in. Obviously, it's gotta be the complainant or the state. So they're not gonna... And it would more than likely have to be the complainant because we would have to subpoena it and they're yes. not gonna give it immediately. All right, so here's the thing. The complainant is allowed to testify to what they paid for the item. State, you all need to call USAA or either somebody have the complainant bring records with them showing what USAA paid them for those amount. Now, whether someone is allowed to cross-examine them about that, you know, people can make their objections, whatever they may be, if they have any. But the defense, I would see why they would want that for cross-examination purposes. Judge, it may be easier than all that because if you notice, they categorize the different items on that list. If, if the category that says personal items is encompassed with all the items on the indictment and, th and that's $15,000, I can live with that if they wanna tell me that, right? Because if you notice in the indictment, there's no guns, uh, there's no, some of those other items you talked about, the, uh, computer wear and that other, some, whatever that other word was. All right, so this is what I know. State, I know that you received the PFD, I mean, the, the uh, PDF, but this where it says view details, whoever received this email from USAA, I imagine that if they clicked on view de details, it's gonna have a list, I'm assuming, I'm making assumptions, of all the items that's covered under that $101,000. So does anybody want to, uh, and I'm sure the complainant Somebody received it by email. Does anybody want to ask the complainant? Yes, ma'am, we can have a moment. All right, if you all will do that. But uh, the ruling of the court is 
the complainant is allowed to testify how much they paid for an item. And of course, I'll hear whatever objections y'all may have, whether it's hearsay or whatever objection you want to raise to that. But if you'll see if the complainant has that. Okay, yes, yes All right, so we'll go on a short recess. Any objections to me speaking to the jurors to let them know that we're going to start a little bit late today? No, Judge, but there, there are some other items in the limit. So I don't know if you want to just stop here or finish. Yes, all let's first. have them get that because that may solve other things. Okay. Okay, I would remind people, uh, if you have seen how this concludes, please don't spoil this. A lot of us are watching this for the very first time. This happened while we were watching the other court uh, with Judge Wolf uh, last week. So this is last week's trial with Judge Boyd. Please don't spoil it for anybody. Uh, anyone who does issue, uh, provide spoilers um, will, will be uh, given a lengthy, lengthy timeout uh, to think about what they have done. Um, let's see. We're going to skip ahead to see where oh, I'm on the wrong I'm on the wrong screen. There we go. Everything's moved. I don't know how to navigate around. Let's see. Skip the timeout. We're calling USAA and boom. Uh, we are just blacking. Oh, the big one. All right. So were you all able to get the out? Yes, ma'am. All right, and did you turn it over to defense? Uh, we are just blacking out the address of the complainants. Redacting is the right word. I'm just trying to double check and make sure. I, I know some of you are posting funny um, fake spoilers. Just know that my mods may not know that you're trying to be funny, and you might end up with a 24-hour timeout. Um, so just, just be cautious because <laughs> if they think you're, they haven't seen it either. So they don't know what's coming. So if they don't get the humor, you might, uh, you might be thinking about it for a while. Are they waiting for someone to deliver the Sharpie? This guy's charged with stealing a trailer with everyone's like a family moving. Okay. They're moving across the country. They stop at a hotel. While they're asleep, someone steals their trailer and it has everything they own in it. Like $300,000 worth of stuff. And it's gone. It's gone, gone, gone. And I believe most of the stuff that was, that was personal, sentimental, just got trashed. So we'll hear, we'll hear what happens. It's, uh, this is like... Okay, I, I've never, I've never been a been someone who believes that uh, that you know corporations have insurance, so it's okay to steal from them. I'm, I'm not okay with that. Um, but for some reason, in my head, stealing somebody's personal mementos, their family history items, the things that that are not replaceable, it seems worse. Uh, I'm not saying the first one was okay, but it seems worse when when something's uh, stolen personal and you just mm -hmm. you you care more about yourself than anyone else. So. We'll see. See what happens here as this goes along. We're going to skip the breaks as much as possible. I don't know where the judge went. The file on that. <laughs> she's coming back. All right. Are you all ready? Oh, she's back right now. Yes, Good thing I didn't skip it. The jury has been ready waiting. Ready to the motion, Judge Harris. Hmm? Ready to proceed on the motion. This will be I'm a jury sorry? trial. Ready to proceed. The motion. All right. So which motion you want to proceed on? Well, Judge, I just wanted the court to be aware the listing has, this is why I was asking for this for so long, 306 items. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping I'm not going to have to cross-examine him this afternoon without having any chance to read. All right, so this is what we're going to do. Items. This is what we're going to do. Who's your first witness? An officer, Judge. We, our first three witnesses are officers. All right, so uh, do the officers have anything to do with the cost of these items? No, ma'am. No. Defense? That I'm aware of, Judge. All right, so we're going to proceed with the officers. You can uh, call your complainant tomorrow. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All right, anything else? The other items are the limiting. Yes. 
All right, the mo motion in limine. Well, as far as the motion in limine, it's a complainant. He's going to be allowed to testify about what an item cost and what he paid for yeah. it. If that's what you address that, Judge, I have a, a limine issue on uh, the search warrant as well. Uh, before the state is allowed to introduce anything that was obtained pursuant to a search warrant, we ask the court to conduct a hearing on the validity of that search warrant. All right, so here's my question. Did anybody ask to have a hearing on a search warrant prior? Are these officers having to do with the search warrant? Uh, the first initial officers, I don't believe, are dealing with the search warrant. All right, then. Approach when, no, no, no. Approach when you have somebody who's Not uh, dealing with the later. search warrant. And just, just to give the court a heads up, Judge, the question is the sufficiency of the affidavit. Yep, sorry about that. Question, but the court can certainly pick up by perusing it themselves. And I, and I have brief argued on that. That's All right. Twitter. Well, someone give me a copy of the search warrant, but we're going to, the jury has been waiting here for over an hour. So we're going to line the jury up and we're going to bring the jury in. Is there anything else? Yes. Um, as you, as you can see in the indictment, there's, there's a whole listing of um, various categories of items. Uh, and Judge, can we conduct our hearings outside the presence of the witnesses? All right. Complain if you'll step outside and any witnesses outside. Bring the jury. Everybody's going out. So real briefly, Judge, the, the allegation in this case is that the complainant's truck and trailer, uh, trailer of the kind that carries stored items, an enclosed trailer, I don't know the verbiage for trailers, that they were stolen with the contents. As you can see from the indictment, the, co the contents is basically what my client's been charged with. He hasn't been charged with stealing the truck or the trailer. Neither one of those items are included in the indictment. So I'm asking the court to rule on whether or not the state's going to be putting on evidence suggesting something that they have not charged him with. Because they've been very specific in delineating the items that they think that he stole, they should be bound by that indictment and not bring in really big value items and suggest that he has something to do with that when it's not part of the indictment. In other words, prosecuting for something that they have not indicted him. Well, if, if this, if the question is whether or not the witness can testify that these items were taken from a trailer, if they were in fact taken from a trailer, then that's coming in. Right. But, the, but I'm talking about the trailer itself and the truck itself, two very, you mean that, items. that he's alleged to have stolen the trailer in the truck. Correct. State. The truck was recovered. I'm sorry. The trailer was recovered abandoned, Your Honor. Um, but I, I guess the tough part for us would be how do we say that the entire contents of this trailer was not stolen? Because our uh, theory of the case is that um, the defendant took the trailer with all the contents, emptied the trailer, and then abandoned the trailer. All um, right. So, I mean, it'd be, I don't know how we could say, like, well, these items were stolen. Like, it would have to be him like I guess going and filling up a different vehicle and then you know does that um I think what the defense does not want stated before this jury is the fact that the trailer or truck whatever it is was stolen by his client and in the indictment judge it does say motor vehicle parts which I think would encompass um what they're talking about with the vehicles I don't think motor vehicle parts mean the vehicle Am I wrong? Well, especially just because on the listing, there's motor vehicle parts on their list of personal property. So it doesn't, I agree with the court, that does not mean the truck or the trailer. So that's what he's asking for. He's asking that you not present evidence that you believe or the witness has tied him to the actual theft of a vehicle. What is your response to that? And that is the alleged theft, I'm assuming again, of the truck and of the tractor trailer. Yes, ma'am. So as part of the items that were taken, the the defendant or, you know, the it's alleged defendant right now, he, uh, he took the truck and the trailer and the items are inside the trailer. So, I mean, that's kind of part of the, these, these folks wake up, they notice the truck and the trailer are gone. All right. I understand what your argument is. All right. Um, he took them. The motion in limine with that will be denied.
if your allegation is that he actually took the truck and the trailer and your witness testifies to that, your witness can testify to that. My understanding is that the state, you are not attempting to say, this is how much the trailer costs, this is how much the truck costs, and that's included in the $300,000. They're saying that because they recovered the truck and trailers. Well, that, well, time out, one at a time. They're gonna answer the question. They're not charging for theft because sure. they found them abandoned. But that's, yeah. I mean, he stole them. Just because they recovered him from a place where he hid them they or go, right? abandoned them. We might need medical attention here. Hmm. Oh. All right, you can line the jurors up. We don't need to allege, allege the vehicle, Judge. Okay. So you are going, to, my, my assumption, and I'm assuming, and if I'm incorrect, let me know. The state is allowed to say, if your witness testifies that he took the trailer and the tractor, but you are not using the truck or the tractor as value for your $300,000. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. Well, Judge, are we going to make it clear to the, to the jury that he's not being charged with stealing those items in well, the that's, indictment? That's what you all need to do on cross-examination. That's the court's ruling. So You're allowed to say the $300,000, no one is to mention how much the tractor costs, how much the trailer costs, because that's not a part of the indictment. Well, but, but you are allowing them to prosecute him for stealing something that's not included in the indictment. Okay, I've made my ruling. <laughs> wow. I'm just trying to make sure the record's clear, Judge, because obviously- The record, this is the record. The record is, if their witness is saying that he took a tractor and he took a trailer, and there were items in that tractor and that, that trailer, you can make your objections. When you make your objections, I will rule over that but I'm not doing a motion in limine as it relates to that. My understanding from what the state is telling the court is that the tractor, the trailer is not a part of the $300,000. And they're not including that as a part of meeting their burden of a theft $300,000 or more. So then they're saying he didn't steal those. They're conceding that point. I don't know how clear clearly I can make it, counsel. You can cross the way you can cross. I'm denying your motion in limine with regards to the uh, trailer and the tractor. We're ready. All right, for the jury. Going back over the uh, the super chats and messages from this morning, in case I missed any of you, I do apologize. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations to all those who reached milestones. Thank you once again for our wonderful gifters who have gifted memberships today. Some repeatedly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are amazing. All right. Oh, please be seated. We stand for you all. All right, everyone, please be seated. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have you raise your hand. I know you were given an oath downstairs, but this is an oath that's related for this specific case. So if you could raise your right hand for me, please. Do you and each of you solemnly swear firm in the case of the state of Texas versus Jose Lozano, you will a true verdict render according to the law and the evidence so help you God? Yeah, I do. All right, you may lower your hand. All right, state. Judge, we'd like to invoke the rule, Judge. All right, the rule has been invoked. Do you have any witnesses in the courtroom? Uh, Your Honor, just the uh, complainant. All right. The rule is invoked. Uh, to the complainant, if you'll come forward, please. This is the person who is alleging that the trailer was stolen from them. All right, sir. The rule has been invoked. What that means is that you're not allowed to review any testimony or um, talk about your testimony with anyone else. The only persons you're allowed to speak to are attorneys for the state or the defense. Do you understand? All right, thank you. So I'm going to have you excuse. All right, state. So he has to wait in the hall. True bill of indictment in the Attorneys name like, and by authority of the state of Texas, the grand jury of Bear County, state of Texas, duly organized, impaneled and sworn as such at the July term 80, 2021 of the 187th Judicial District Court of said county, in said court at said term, do present in and to said court that in the county and state aforesaid and interior to the presentment of this indictment. On or about the fourth day of December, 2020, Jose Lozano, here and after referred to as defendant, 
with intent to deprive the owner, Terry Kirkbride, of property, namely clothing, electronic items, household items, tools, toys, sporting goods, weapons, fashion accessories, jewelry, magazines, books, paintings, artwork, collectibles, vintage movie items, antiques, motor vehicle parts, military collectibles, United States currency, and food items. Did then and there unlawfully, without the effective consent of the owner, appropriate set, I- a set property by acquiring and otherwise exercising control over said property. Said property being other than real property, which had a, had a value of $300,000 or more against the peace and dignity of the state. How do you plead to that? Thank you. All right, state, do you have any opening statements? Yes, John. All right, you may proceed. So the uh, so just like we talked about, the family's been compensated by insurance, the but this is the criminal charge. So the theft happened December three years ago. Twenty twenty, Terry Kirkbride and his wife were moving from California to Florida, and they stopped for the night in uh, in San Antonio, and they were staying at a hotel uh, at four ten and two eighty one, and they had almost all of their worldly possessions uh, in a trailer, the type of trailer that you. Uh, tow behind a a truck. When they woke up in the morning, they noticed that the truck and the trailer and all the contents of the trailer were gone. Um, So they did, uh, I think what anybody would do in that situation, they called the police uh, and they reported, hey, all of our our stuff is gone. Uh, And so the evidence is gonna show that uh, the police came out to the scene. Uh, They tried to search around the area, see if they could find the trailer. Um, they, they, they were unsuccessful in that effort. Um, later on that day, the next day, a uh, different officer found the abandoned trailer. Uh, it was mostly empty. And you're going to see that it, there were some, some items in there, but it was mostly empty. It had been full before, and there's just a few items in there. Uh, and it was abandoned like that, mostly empty, on the south side of San Diego. As, process, as part of processing that I've seen, uh, the police uh, searched it for fingerprints on the outside. And they found fingerprints on the outside of that trailer. Uh, police matched those fingerprints to the defendant, Jose Lazano. Um, they did some research, figured out where the defendant lived, they went out to his house, they got a warrant for his house. And they found the contents of that stolen trailer in the backyard of that house, as well as inside the house. So over the next couple of days, you're going to hear from uh, the victim. You're going to hear from uh, police witnesses. And you're also going to hear um, from the mother of the defendant's uh, children who, who lived with the defendant at the time where they found all his property. And by the end of uh, what we're going to present to you, we're confident that you'll have enough evidence to find the defendant guilty of theft. Thank you. Defense. So they're just charging him with the theft, but it's a big theft, over a quarter million dollars. So in opening statements, the lawyers give you a preface of what they believe the evidence is going to show. This is not evidence or testimony. It's just a summary, a preview, a trailer, if you will. And I'm not going to go through the whole case as counsel did. I just wanted to make clear to you that what you're going to hear from the witnesses is that there's no no suggestion or no allegation against them that they actually stole the truck or the trailer, but that he was in possession of the contents. And so the question becomes uh, whether or not that, in fact, is a theft uh, and whether or not they can bring evidence to suggest that he was aware that those items were stolen at the time he came into possession. Thank you. Wow. All right, State, call your uh, first witness, please. That was more of a closing state argument. State calls uh, of Officer the... Alan Contreras. So first police officer. So basically the defense is, yeah, my client was in receipt of stolen goods, but you, there's no evidence that says he stole it. Well, fingerprints might prove otherwise, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, his use of the word trailer was probably not the best. Not the best. Yeah, the defense is open.
All right. Could you raise your right hand for me, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give would be the truth and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. I do. All right. If you'll lower your hand, make sure you keep your voice up so that members of the jury can hear and the court reporter can hear. If you'll state your name for the record. Alan Contreras. State. Officer Contreras, who do you currently work for? San Antonio Police Department. How long have you worked for the San Antonio Police Department? A little over six years. And are you a certified peace officer? Yes, sir. What type of training did you have to go through to become a certified peace officer? You do eight month training at the training academy, and then you have to complete a one year probationary period. And that would be with a field training officer and uh, under the supervision, obviously, of your supervisors. And what type of things did you learn at the academy? Um, obviously, the penal code, uh, CCP, general manual, um, and just, you know, fundamental training as far as driving shooting tactics all that would help us uh, out on patrol and so what back i'm going to take you back to december of 2020 uh what were your duties uh, with with sapd december 2020 yes sir. i was a patrol officer and uh yeah i was a patrol officer on north dog watch okay so uh what area did you have to were you assigned to patrol the north the northeast side of san antonio and you mentioned dog watch what's that it's like the graveyard shift. It's from 10.30 p.m. to 6.30 a.m. And do you still work uh, at that location or in that area? No, I recently moved to the downtown bike patrol unit. So I want to take you back again to December of 2020. Were you working on December 4th of 2020? Yes. Okay. Were you uh, wearing a uniform? Yes, sir. Is it similar to the one that you're wearing now? Yes, sir. And were you driving around a, a marked squad car? Yes. Now, do you remember being called out uh, for a theft of a vehicle report? Yes, sir. And where were you called out to? Was it the home suite? Home, Homewood Suites. It was a, it was a hotel um, right there on the corner of, I believe it's uh, Jones Maltzberger and 410. And would, and again, would looking at your report refresh your memory? Yes, please. Could you honor, uh, approach? Yes. Officer Contreras, if you can do me a favor, please don't read directly from the report. Just whenever, if you need your memory re uh, refresh, just take a moment, read your report, and then answer. Okay. So where did you respond out to? Okay, it's the Homes Two Suites by Hilton. And what is that by? Do you remember? Uh, it's near North Star Mall. So it's in Bear County, Texas? Correct. And do you remember what time uh, did, were you called out there? around 5.30 ish. And when you were called out there, did you speak to anyone? Yes, spoke to the victims. This I'm gonna case, approach with what I'm marking as state's exhibit one. This case happened last week while we were with Judge Wolf, so we're catching you up. recognize this? Yes, sir. What is it? It's a copy of my body cam footage. And aside from any audio redactions, has it been altered and amended in any way? No. Okay. And you were able, back on that night, you were able to operate the body-worn camera? Yes. And it recorded what, what happened? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, state what Auburn states is at the number one. Judge, with the qualification that I think it's been muted. So much. If it's been muted, we're okay. So I, yes, Your Honor. That, that. All right, then. Uh, States exhibit number one is admitted as muted. Granted. I'm skipping ahead to 541.29. Uh, what are you doing here, sir? Putting the vehicle in park. I've arrived at the location. And did you immediately start speaking to the people who called you out? Correct. And did you take their information down? Yes, sir. 
And do you recall what were their names? It'd be Rachel Grant and her husband, I believe, is uh, Terry Kirkbride. And what were they showing you? They were showing me where they parked their their vehicle and trailer. Yeah. And did you see anything when you were looking on the ground? I saw shattered glass. And on what side? It, we're looking at a Penske truck. It's 542.14. We're looking at a Penske truck. What side of the truck was that on? It, it would be on the right side of the truck if we're looking down. Yeah. And so did they give you a general understanding of what had happened? Yes. Okay. And did they, were they able to give you information on the, well, did they describe what was taken? Yes. Well, what was taken? So it was their belongings. They, from my understanding, they were moving from California to Florida. So they had to pick up a truck, um, a large box trailer, and all of their belongings from their home in that box trailer. Now, were they able to give you any information regarding license plate or VIN number for the truck? When I first got there, they gave me a description on the vehicles. Uh, and then later on, they were able to give me the VIN on the uh, pickup truck. Uh, and when you were talking with them, how were they? Were they, uh, how would you describe their emotional state? I mean, they were very upset, emotional. And was that causing difficulty in them uh, getting any of the information? Somewhat, yes. And were they able to give you any information in regards to the trailer? They gave me a VIN number for the trailer, um, but on my end, I wasn't able to verify uh, if it was accurate, but they were able to give me the VIN number on the pickup truck. Okay. So once you get this information, what did you do? Uh, around this time, I believe my uh, partner shows up, so I start relaying that information to him and let him know, hey, start searching the area and then i go back to my computer and i start verifying all the information make sure it's accurate to the description they're providing so when he mentions a ford pickup i'll run the then i'm sure that it does come back to a ford pickup and what do you do you put this information in any system yes um i i end up putting it in the nic system the stolen vehicle system um i have i'll have the dispatcher um enter the vehicle as stolen and what's the purpose of doing that? So that any time, let's say a patrol officer is um, running license plates and he comes across that vehicle, it'll notify him that that vehicle is in fact stolen. And you said they weren't able to give you all the information on the trailer. Is that true? They attempted to give me a VIN number, but um, on my end, I couldn't verify it. it. It could be possible that when I wrote it down, maybe I entered incorrectly. It's a 17 digit number, but Initially, I wasn't able to get the VIN number on the trailer. Well, what did you direct them to do? I went ahead and uh, gave them the information for our, uh, it was either our auto theft unit or our property crimes unit. Let them know, hey, as soon as you get that VIN number, call them so that they can enter that trailer as stolen as well. Now, did you ever enter the actual hotel they were staying in? Did I, yes, I did. And did you attempt to talk to people who worked at the, at the hotel? Yes. Were you able to do? Were you able to do that? Yes, I did. And, but did do you ever see any type of surveillance video? No, I didn't. Um, they they advised me that it's possible there was footage, but uh, she didn't have access to the surveillance system itself. So, once you finished putting on all this information, did you ever give uh, the Kirk? Did you ever give the Kirk Brides any further information to follow up on? I gave him the. Uh, follow-up unit information and I gave them the case number um, so that they could follow up um, in regards to this incident. And did you ever attempt to drive around in the area to locate, to locate their vehicle or the trailer? So my partner drove around, searched the area. And then as I, as I left the scene, um, after I got all the information, I gave them the case number. I also um, patrolled the surrounding areas. Pass the witness, Judge. All right. So, Officer Contreras, um, you did not locate any potential eyewitnesses to the theft. Is that right? I remember speaking to the the lady at the front desk, and she says 
And she says to me that she might have seen the vehicle. All right. Um, just make sure you listen to the question that's asked and then just only ask, answer what's asked of you. The judge calls so non-responsive. Before you get into what she says, my own question is, were there any potential eyewitnesses? Yes. And how would you gather the information from that potential eyewitness? I got her, um, I mean, I got her name. Um, I've, I've been at that location numerous times, so I kind of already knew who she was. Okay. And so what is the, what is the process for taking a statement from somebody? How do you mean exactly? Well, I mean, in the old days when I first started, uh, witnesses would give written statements, right? Right. They either write them out themselves or they'd sit down with an officer and they'd type on the computer and they'd print the statement, right? Correct. Do you still do that? No. So, How are we doing that? just based on her uh, verbal statement. But, but it has to be recorded somehow. So, it's on, you record it on your body cam? Yes, sir. Okay. So whatever she tells you in her statement is recorded on your. Yes, sir. Okay. But um, you were not. You didn't get any leads from her that would allow you to uh, broadcast over the radio, for example, like uh, a suspicious vehicle identification, a license plate, things like that. Correct. Okay. Um, is it fair to say the general information she gave you didn't attach to any particular person? Correct. Okay. Um, now, in terms of the the um, surveillance system, whose job would it be to follow up with the hotel management to see if they could recover the potential uh, video footage? It would be the detective assigned to the case. Is there? Any, would you know who that is? It would be um, at the time. I would imagine the um, auto theft unit. Okay. So, so once you once you take your initial report and broadcast the information. Uh, and forward your reports, that's the end of your involvement. Correct. So other than the, the lady that we see in the picture who's at the front desk, did, did you speak to anybody else who had knowledge, any relevant knowledge of this incident? No. Um, was there any canvassing, or were there any other buildings uh, or businesses around there that might have video that could have been checked on? That I'm not aware of. Would that also be the property crimes follow-up unit's job? I would imagine so, yes. Okay. I'll pass the witness, Judge. State? Uh, nothing from the state. All right, is this witness excused or subject for recall? Uh, excused, Judge. Excused, Judge. All right, the rule has been invoked. What that means is you can't discuss your testimony with anyone. The only persons you're allowed to speak to are attorneys for the state or the defense. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. All right, you may step down. Thank you. State, call your next witness. The state calls uh, Officer Moya. I'm sorry, Officer Moya. To you take a seat here. All right, if you can raise your right hand for me. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give will be the truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? All right, you can lower your hand. Make sure you keep your voice up so members of the jury and the court reporter can hear. If you'll state your name for the record, please. Uh, my name's Alexander Moya. State? Officer Moya, who do you currently work for? Uh, San Antonio Police Department. And how long have you worked for the San Antonio Police Department? Uh, 10 years. And what unit, um, I want to take you back to December of 2020. What unit were you assigned to back then? Uh, at that time, I was on light duty and I was working the uh, front desk at vehicle crimes. And so what did you have to do as a part of working the front desk at vehicle crimes? Um, mostly uh, took telephone calls uh, from officers in the field or from service agents or anyone who had uh, questions regarding vehicle crimes. Did you ever have to reach out to anyone to gather information? Uh, yes, sir. And when would that happen? I'm sorry? When would that happen? Uh, if if something, if they had a question or if something was missing in the report or we needed more clarification, certain items or certain things. 
We would reach out. Now, I want to take you to December 4th of 2020. Were you working on that day? Yes, sir. And what do you remember? What shift were you working back then? I, I'm not too sure what shift I was on at the time. It's been a couple of years. But, um, I, I was on patrol at the time, but I was on light duty at vehicle crimes at, at that time. Yeah. So back on December 4th of 2020, were you ever asked to reach out to anyone? Uh, yes, sir. Do you recall who were you asked to reach out to? Uh, so uh, I, it was the victim of the crime that uh, the officer that sent before me. Uh, he took a report, and I guess the North Service agent at the time reached out to uh, vehicle crimes and needed some extra information. And would helping, uh, would looking at your report, would that help refresh your recollection? Uh, yes, sir. Oh, more. Well, it's two pages, but it's two pages. Okay. Officer Boy, I'm telling you your police report. Now, I'm going to ask that you don't read directly from it, but use it to refresh your uh, recollection. So, you don't remember something, take a, take a moment, read, and then you can answer the question. So, do you remember who did you end up speaking with on that day? Uh, Mr. Cookbray. Okay. And what were you trying to speak to him about? Uh, I was getting his uh, VIN information for his vehicle. And what specifically on the vehicle were you, were you getting? Or what, 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 what uh, I guess, part of the vehicle were you trying to get information? Uh, the on? VIN number. Okay. And was he able to provide you the VIN number? Uh, yes, sir. And did you ever talk about the trailer that was involved in this case? And again, sir, if you need a refresher recollection. This should be an easy answer. Is he, I guess he's not refu reviewed his report. Uh, reading my report, uh, it appears that I did speak to him about the trailer and uh, getting his VIN for it. And did, were you able to put that into the NCIC system? Uh, yes, sir. I, uh, well, we don't in, put it in, but we contacted uh, the service agent and, and they put it in for us, sir. And what's the purpose of putting uh, information in, into the NCIC system? Uh, that's So we put the VIN in to, uh, to make so it comes back to the vehicle and it can be put as stolen. And as far as you were aware, you were able to then report it as stolen? Yes, sir. Pass the witness. Defense. So, Officer Moya, um, you said you're on light duty, just so the, so the jury understands. What does that mean? Uh, so, light duty uh, basically means I was injured and uh, I wasn't able to do, I was unable to work full duty on patrol. So, when you're on light duty, they put you behind a desk to still be able to work and help out in some capability. Okay. And how long have you been with the police department? Uh, 10 years, sir. Okay. I see that you have three stripes. What, is, what does that indicate? Uh, I'm a sergeant now, sir. Um, and explain for those of lay people, what is a sergeant? How is that different from your average patrol officer? So uh, a sergeant basically is going to supervise uh, the patrol officers and it's going to help guide officers if they have any questions out in the field and uh, make sure rules and regulations and everything's being followed. Are you required to have additional training other than a basic patrolman to become a sergeant? I know we go to a supervisor school and et cetera like that, sir. So how do you become a sergeant? Is it passing a, an exam? Uh, uh, as far as the department, department works, sir, yes, yes. it's uh, we've taken a we've taken an exam. Does it require a certain number of years of experience? So uh, before you get to sergeant, you hit detective, and you have to have five years on the department. And then as a detective, you have to have two years as a detective, and then you're able to take the test. Yes, sir. OK. So you have, you've been on the police force for five years, you become a detective for two years, and then you're eligible to become a sergeant. Yes, sir. Okay. So um, as part of your duties as a police officer, are you required to study the penal code and understand what the different laws are in the state of Texas? Yes, sir. Have you worked with thefts before? Yes, sir. So in a scenario like this where someone's vehicle is stolen or a vehicle in a trailer is stolen that has items in it, um, 
do you necessarily arrest every person that might come into contact with those vehicles, those those that vehicle's items somewhere down the line? Thank you. Your Honor, I'm going to object to calls for a legal conclusion. All right, that'll be sustained. Well, let me ask you a different way. Um, in your experience as an as an officer, have you recovered stolen property before? Yes, sir. Can you give us an examples of different scenarios in which stolen property can be recovered? Uh, I guess I'm not understanding the question. Have you ever recovered stolen property from a pawn shop? Uh, no, sir. Not, not, never a pawn shop. Have you ever recovered stolen property from a flea market? I can't, I can't say I have, sir. <laughs> this guy's nice. we don't, we don't, no we experience. Have, we don't, that doesn't happen too often for us. It's always have you uh, ever had people call in saying that they saw their stolen property somewhere and they wanted you to intervene and get it back for them? <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, there you found In this found particular case, works. the allegation is that a truck and a trailer were stolen, correct? Yes, sir. Are there scenarios in which sometimes the items are not found altogether? Like you might find the truck somewhere, trailer somewhere else, and the content somewhere else. Uh, I'm going to yes. object for speculation, Judge. All right, that'll be overruled. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, do you know anything about the result in this particular case in terms of where the truck was found and or the trailer and or the contents? I don't, I don't know the full details off the top of my head. In a situation where stolen property is recovered, who makes the determination about what, if anything, to charge that person with? It's, it's typically going to be a handling, handling detective on the case. So you spent five years. Is it a crime to be in possession of stolen property if you don't know that it's stolen? Uh, I'm going to object for calls for a legal conclusion. Sustained. Do you know the answer to that question, officer? Can you, can you ask again? I'm sorry. Do you know the answer? That's all I have, Judge. It was sustained. He said, state? do you know the answer? Further from the state. Is this witness excused or subject for recall? Uh, excuse, Judge. He spent two years as a detective right, in that time. The rule time. has been invoked. What that means is you can't discuss your testimony with anyone. You're only allowed to speak to attorneys for the state or the defense. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. State, call your next witness. State calls uh, Officer Todd Tackett. During two years, at least two years as a detective working in stolen property, he's never once been able to find stolen property and get it back to somebody that was involved in a pawn shop. No, I would have thought that would be like the prime situation. Oh, this guy's tall. Look at this. He could have just stepped over the bar, but instead, wow, he's a giant. This guy is massive. He makes up most of the police force right there. All right. Could you raise your right hand for me, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give will be the truth and nothing but the truth will help you, God? All right. You can have a seat. Make sure you keep your voice up so members of the jury and the court reporter can hear. If you'll state your name for the record, please. Todd Tackett. State. Good afternoon, Officer Tackett. Um, can you uh, tell the jury um, how long have you been with SAPD? About 15 years. Todd Tackett. And what are your uh, duties as a, as a SAPD officer? I'm a patrol officer. work nights. And um, how long have you? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, has that was that your uh, was, was that your duty on December 4th, 2020? Yes, it's been the same for 15 years. Okay, right on. Um, so, uh, when you're on duty, are you dressed like you are now? Are you in a uniform? Yes, sir. And uh, do you drive a marked patrol vehicle? Yes, sir. Um, okay, so he seems a little more relaxed. Do you remember responding to um, a location on the south side of town on uh, December fourth, twenty twenty? Yes, sir. And uh, would it help you to have your report in front of you to refresh your recollection? Yes, sir. I approach judge. Yes. A lot of times uh, the and judge doesn't want to be asked. That about yes, person. sir. And uh, is it capable of uh, recording events as they as they occur? Yes. And is it, was it in good working order? Yes. Do you recognize the disc I have? I yeah. marked it as States Exhibit 2. That's my body cam video. How do you recognize it? My initials and badge number on it that I wrote. 
And uh, you watched this earlier, right? Yes, sir. Has it been uh, altered besides being muted? No. Uh, Your Honor, I offer uh, State's Exhibit 2. No objection. All right, State's Exhibit number 2 is admitted without objection. May I publish, Your Honor? Yes. Todd just noticed he's on camera. So what was the address that you responded to that night? Be 10,500 Hunter's Pond. And why did you why did you go out to Hunter's Pond? We got a call for a suspicious vehicle or trailer parked in a dark area. Okay. And what was suspicious about it? There's no houses right there, and it's just a dark strip of road. It was under construction at the time, or not even under construction. The, the lots were for sale at the time. Okay. Has he been in patrol for 15 years? Never, never tested for detective? <clears throat> so for purposes of the record, we're skipping ahead to 2304... 52. He, he must really like his job. I, mean, I know there are people I that went do that. a little too far here. Um, I've got a friend who was a detective. Like, the record, we're at 22, 55, 37. What, can you tell the jury what, you, what we're looking at? I was checking the trailer to see if it was unlocked and see what's going on. And then right here, get to the license plate and try to verify on the vehicle is stolen or not. Okay. And so what are you looking at? You're, what, you're looking for the plate and the VIN. Is that, are those two different things? Yes. And I can't really tell in here to, and I don't really recall exactly, but um, if it's a uh, solid, like a typical license plate, it's just a license plate number. If it's the paper plate, sometimes they'll have the license plate number and the VIN number on there as well. What are you looking for the VIN number for? To check in the system to see if it's stolen or get a registration to see who the registered owner would be. Let's skip ahead. Um, here. So you're in your car and you've, um, this is a, for the purposes of the record, this is a 2257-27. Can you tell the jury what you're doing on the computer here? I'm running the license plate and trying to get a return, registration return to see who the owner is. Or if it's stolen. Can you tell the jury what you're doing with your phone now? Um, I don't remember this part right here. Um, it's Candy Crush. I think yeah. I'm trying to verify the, the actual vehicle, and I've got to return to see what it was, and trying to verify if it's or what kind of trailer it is, if it's a proper return. And so. When you searched it on the computer, what, what result did you get? Um, that I'm not sure about. Um, it, it's been a little while. <laughs> yeah, could you just review your report? Um, oh, on that on, on that return, I think because I think I get up again in a little bit and I go check because I, I can find the actual return for it. So I go back and check and I get the actual VIN number for the return. And then that's when I discover that it's stolen. Okay. If that's what you're... And, and so once you discover it's stolen, what do you do? Then I call for a, a CSI or UEDI to come over and get prints, and then I try to get a hold of the owner over the phone. And who was the uh, UEDI that you called out for this this case? Uh, Detective Vincent Gonzalez. I'm going to skip ahead on your body cam a little bit here. So for purposes of the record, we're at 23.11.30, and it looks like you're trying to uh, look in the trailer. And at this point, hey, did you determine that it was stolen already? Yes.
This is what he spends most of his time doing. Hey, can you reach that for me? Why, yes, I can. Just trying to skip ahead here to when uh, the UVI arrives. Okay, so um, can you tell the jury who this is that you're speaking with? Detective Vince Gonzalez, who was a UEDI at the time. Okay. And can you tell the jury what a UEDI does? It's, it's a uniform evidence detective. It's basically like a CSI. They'll do prints, photos, and things like that. So for purposes of the record, we're at 23.52.36 on your body cam. Um, and so what happens when he gets there? Uh, he'll take photos of the, of the trailer since it came back stolen. And then after that, he'll go back and try to find prints of suspect prints or any prints he can find on the, on the trailer. Okay, so it looks like he's got his camera there. So did you watch him uh, take photos? Yes. Did you watch him... Uh, Process the trailer for fingerprints? Yes. Looks like you're pointing things out to him. What are you doing there? Um, I, th I think I was actually talking about like what I found because I believe at this point I've already contacted the owner and they've said like yeah, everything is stolen from there. Shouldn't you know that it was an actual stolen trailer? And I just kind of pointed out and said here, like I, I touched over here, I did this, and just so he knows when he's taking the pictures as well. And so you're telling him where you you touched on the trailer also? Yes. And what's the purpose of that? So he doesn't go and get my fingerprints and sees where I didn't touch, basically. Doesn't want to confuse you're everything guiding, with police. You should take fingerprints here. Fingerprints when I touched over here, that sort of thing. Yes. Can you tell the jury what uh, Detective Gonzalez has in his hand right now? It's his, um, the fingerprint powder and the little sticky stuff to actually put on a Take. card for it. And for purposes of, of the record, we're at 4000428 on your body cam. And so you, you stood by and, and watched while he took the fingerprints off the trailer? Yes, sir. If his fingerprints what, are on the what trailer. What trailer is he looking at now? I believe it's a uh, pretty open and shut. He set his stuff down on the actual hitch part, but he's actually looking at the door for the trailer to actually try to get prints off in that area. The side door. So there are there two do two doors on the trailer? One yeah, door? Yeah, there's like a side door, which is like a typical vertical door, and then the big back door that flings open. When you say flings open on the back, that's yeah, I mean, it's like a ramp. It's like a semi-truck. Can you tell the jury what's going on here? That's where he's actually trying to test and get prints still. So he's marking it, and he's put his little dust on there and Pixie checking dust. to see what he, what he has. Even if this guy just He's still looking for bought here. stuff from uh, someone, zero, 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 six, if he had to yes. pick him up from the back of a semi truck, that's that seems, uh, yeah, in the middle of nowhere. So you stood by wall and watched him while he's taking the fingerprints, right? Yes. And what else did you do on this case? Um, I from there, I just stood by waiting for the uh, owners to show up and take custody or check out the trailer and see if they can actually get the trailer. Um, other than that, I'm right now I'm just standing by and making sure he didn't get hit by a car coming or anything like that. <laughs> Being nosy, watching him do his work. <laughs> did you call in the VIN and say, we we found this? Before? Yes, I, would, I, I think I already did it at this point. And so describe to the jury, what, what what is that that you when you call in? When we call it in for the VIN, um, basically saying that it was stolen, that we recovered it, it's basically taking it out of the system. So anytime the plates ran, it's not going to show stolen and, you know, that type of deal. 
And so did you have an opportunity to talk to the uh, complaining witnesses in this case? Yes. I believe that's them right there. Yeah. So for purposes of the record, we're at uh, 002634. Can you tell the jury what's going on now? Uh, they're checking out to see what was taken. I told them there was a little bit of boxes there, which not much, but there was a little bit of stuff there. If they can scavenge through it and they basically look at it and say it's basically trash. I believe there are some metals in there, but I'm not sure on that one. When you say metals, do you mean? They had some kind of, I, I, I want to say it was uh, military metals. But I'm not sure who's, it was just, they're like, yeah, this is all we got left. And I think they carried out like a little booklet. And this is who you spoke with that night? Yes. And did he, he identified himself to you? Yes. I don't remember his name. I think I put the wife's name on the report, though. Okay. And you spoke to her as well? Yes. So I've skipped ahead a little bit to 00 um, What's going on here? Same thing? or? Yeah, they're just still looking. I, I believe they're waiting for a truck to, to come take the trailer. A lot of it's just us talking to, waiting, and getting their, their story of how everything went. And is this the woman we spoke to? Yes, I believe that's what she's holding right there was the medals or something. They, they found something in there. Did you put her name in your report? Yes, uh, Rachel Grant. And did, if you work on a case like this, is there a case number assigned to the case? Yes. Can you tell the jury what that number is for this case? It's going to be SAPD 2023-0259. Zero zero what's the purpose of the number? The like for what the the whole case number so you can identify the case. Uh, usually it starts off with twenty, which would be the year. So it happened in twenty twenty, and then basically continues on there. There's numerical from all the cases that we've had throughout the year. So is the number that's assigned to this case for you? Um, is that the same number that the other officers will have for this case? For this one, yes, because since it was a stolen vehicle, we just. Do a, I did a supplement to the original case of when they actually took the report. So if UEDI Gonzalez did a, a report, it'd be the same number? Yes, but I believe his was say like CSSR or something like that with his for a CSI stuff. But, you know, like uh, Officer Moy testified earlier, would his be the, uh, the same number? Same case number, just another supplement for it. Thank you. I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. All right. Defense. So, Officer Tackett. As part of your job in this case, do you try to develop any leads out of the scene where the trailer was recovered? At that point, no, we didn't have anything going. It's It was just a refuse complainant, and we just basically were recovering the trailer. That's that's all we had at that point. Tell the jury what you mean by refuse complainant. Somebody just called in and said, hey, there's a trailer parked down the street. So they didn't want to give their name or or maybe they gave their name, but they didn't want to be contacted because they don't care to be involved with it. So you're not sure which of those applies? I, I, I don't remember on this case in particular. So there's nothing to be, there's no reason for you guys to follow up with that person to see if they're involved. You just take their report and move on. Yeah, at that point, no. Um, do you get these phone calls or do they come to your unit or do they go to somebody else? For, for this, like, well, somebody calls 911, goes to the, they'll put it, they'll dispatch it to whoever area it is. And that's my, my, that's my district area. So, so we can't really speculate about why we don't know the complainant that called it in. At this, I mean, if, I don't know if you'll have that information, but um, actually there's like CAD notes, whenever to do that, the actual CAD calls. It actually may say on there who called, but like I said, if they, they may not want a phone number, I may not give the address. Uh, we, 
that area right there is actually a common area for people at, at that time doing like um, drag racing type through there. So it would, somebody would call all the time. So I get that call just about every night for something over there, suspicious vehicle, because they didn't all the time. So just so the jury has a general idea, this is a, a, like a subdivision, correct? Yes. Um, and you said you were watching cars going by. Are there houses somewhere near where this was at? So where we were at, basically north of us and south of us, there was houses. But at that point, there's no, like it's like empty lots on both sides of the street. Probably now it has houses. Yes, now it does. Okay. Um, but there, were, there, was, there was nothing close enough to where there might be some camera footage to maybe identify who might have left it. Nobody in that area right there. I mean, you could probably go a few blocks down maybe and see, but that you can't tell from right there. There's nothing showing at that area where the vehicle is parked or the trailer is parked. Would it be, if you know, would it be part of normal procedure for somebody to go look at video cameras, like, for example, the entrance leading up to where that spot is? Um, uh, usually we can, I mean, can use the detective if they have reason to go by that they can but being that it's the trailers there all you're going to see is a vehicle pass by so you ain't going to be able to see anything at overnight like that to actually get any evidence of a person going by she might get the vehicle that towed it over there it's possible yes uh and by looking at your body cam video and looking at when the initial report was made it looks like it's only been like 24 hours uh, i'm not sure when the actual initial report was Yeah, my, my report didn't have the initial one, but well, let, let's let's get the, the time and the date of your report, and we can work backwards. Okay. Yeah, my report's December fourth at uh, twenty three forty, which eleven eleven thirty almost at night. And so, if um, for example, let's say let's say the reported stolen time is December fourth at three zero three hundred. What time is that? At zero three hundred, yes, at three in the morning. So if it's recovered at eleven forty at night, and reported roughly around three in the morning, it's about twenty around twenty four hours. Yes. Um, so if somebody was going to ch check surveillance, they wouldn't have to go back day after day after day. They just need that the one day. Yes. One day's. I'll pass witness judge. State. No further questions, John. Is this witness excused or subject for recall? Excuse, John. Excuse, John. All right. The rule has been invoked. What that means is you cannot discuss your testimony with anyone. Only persons you're allowed to speak to are attorneys for the state or the defense. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you. You may step down. Uh, do thought, you all need a break? I thought she all was right. excusing. All right. Me. We're going to uh, take a short break. And I will have you all come back at. Is 3.45 enough time for everyone? All right, so these are my instructions. You are not to start individually deliberating about this case or thinking about what you've heard so far. You're not allowed to talk about it in your mind. You're not allowed to talk about what you've heard with each other. Everything that you need to know about this case is to come from inside this courtroom and nowhere else. Does everyone understand? All right, everyone, please rise for the jurors. Jurors are headed out. Let's see if they have anything to talk about before the break. Don't think we will, but we're going to do a quick check. Break, 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 and back. Okay. We're going to be on day two in no time. It is a two-day trial, so... Uh, yes, please. I think she's she's distracted, and she's got a couple that are excused, and she keeps telling them not to talk to anyone. I think once they're excused, they can talk to everybody, but maybe there's, she's saying don't talk to the witnesses who are under that rule. Yes. Is there wrong? All right, and then uh, with regards to your fingerprint person, if you all still want to have him fingerprinted, 
before the day is done, then, and, and defense, if you have any objections to him being fingerprinted, the court will hear the objections for that. Otherwise, his fingerprints are going to be taken today. All right, we're ready. The only, I'm sorry, before we bring the jury judge, I'm, I'm sorry. The only other thing is the way they get to the location um, is through the fingerprints. So are we going to be able to call those witnesses out of order? You know, understand I, I Yeah. Sorry, I, I can't let them talk about evidence as if it's already committed. No, when it's here's the thing. Day. They're not calling. They're not allowing you to call witnesses out of order. I'm going to make them follow. So the there we go. So I know what people said in the beginning, that witnesses would be called out of order, but that that's not happening. But what you so ask me is you going to stipulate to the evidence. I would have said no. Who's clearly so no. witnesses are not being called out of order. So who do you have to call? I think this witness, right? Yes. And then after that, Judge, we would need some, some time. OK, because our understanding was out of order. Okay. All right. Bring the jurors in. All Not right, going to happen. Jury. Must, must call them in order. I'd like to watch Black Swan. Um, let's see. Black Swan, that is... That's Ashley Benefield. It's uh, slated for July 1st. I, I really wonder, around that same time, we've got... I don't know, I don't know when Corey Richens is going to happen. Corey Richards would, would take precedence over Black Swan. But uh, we need to All figure right. out Corey Everyone Richens' please date. be seated. State, call your next witness. State calls Edith Serrano. All right, could you raise your right hand for me, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give would be the truth, that nothing but the truth will help you out? All right, you can lower your hand. Make sure you keep your voice up so members of the jury can hear and the court reporter can hear. If you'll state your name for the record. Edith Serrano. All right, you may proceed. And Edith, if you can speak into the microphone just to make sure that we can hear you. <laughs> so, Edith, how do you know Jose Lozano? He was my partner. Okay. And how long I'm have you crying. known Jose Lozano for? Like middle school. And, and again, can you speak up just because it's oh, difficult? Like again. around middle school. And at any time, were you dating? Yes. How long were, did you date Jose? Almost 15 years. At any time, were you married? No. Did you ever hold yourself out as his, as his wife? No. So mm. how many children do you guys have to share? Three. Uh, what are their ages? I'm sorry? What are their ages? Uh, 18, 16, and 14. Now, I want to take you back to December of 2020. Were you and Jose living together? Yes. Where were you living at? Uh, in, um, Greenwood Road. Would that be 13641 Greenwood Road? Yes. What city is that in? Um, Atascosa. And how long had you and Jose lived there for? Like three years, I believe. Two or three years. And at that time in December of 2020, was there ever an occasion where a lot of property showed up at your home? Like what this case is about, yes. And so what what showed up? Like yeah. Um, boxes. And what was inside of the boxes? Like clothing, other items. And did you ever question Jose as to how they came to be there? I he purchased them, or I was told he purchased them. Did he tell you who they who he purchased them from? No. How about where? No. How long had the items? So, well, we scratch that beginning. Did the police ever uh, go to go to that home? Yes. Okay. And from the time that the items uh, arrived at the location to the time that the police arrived, how long was that? I don't remember an exact time frame. Was it a day? No, like maybe. I think I had told you like a week or two. And so you have spoken to me, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And when did you speak with me? Earlier. And what was one thing that I asked you Earlier. to say when testifying? Nothing. Huh? Nothing. Like just, just tell the truth. Speak the truth. So this property was there for a little bit before the police arrived. <clears throat> yes. And what had you guys done with the property? We looked through it. And what was in that property? Mm, like the clothing. 
the Monroe stuff. Um, I don't know, just the toys. The kids liked toys. Was it a little bit of property or was it a lot? It was a lot. Was there some property that was in your home? Yes. Was there also property that was outside the home? Yes. And why was the property, why was some of the property inside the home and why was some of it outside? Because we purchased, he purchased the stuff and we were looking through some of the stuff that we liked and we took it inside. But you left some of the property outside. Right. And was it just all around the yard? It was in the backyard. Was it neat and tidy? Was it thrown around? Describe it to me. Um, it should have been neat and tidy. Like it was. Like we didn't mess with that much. And were you noticing any names that were appearing on any no. of this property? Can you answer the question? I said no. And <clears throat> did you notice any type of metals or plaques that I did some. And, and here, ma'am, just let me finish the question. Okay. You. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's all good. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you ever notice that there were any plaques or awards with anyone's uh, name? There was plaques, but I didn't pay attention to the names. And was this something that was common at your home for Jose to buy a large amount of property and bring it? No. So this was the first time he had done that? Yes. And speaking of that home, <clears throat> who was paying the bills at that home? We both were. Were they both in your names? No, only the electricity was under my name. And whose name was it under for everything else? It was just both our names. It was a verbal rental. There wasn't a contract. And? Or a lease, I should say. And let's describe the homes. How would you describe your, your home and I guess the, the area? Okay, so it was a... Um, a property with three homes. And was there any area that was shared between these three homes? Like the backyard was an open area. And like, but yes, we had like our own areas. The kids played around on all the areas. So your kids would go from just one area of the backyard, the communal backyard mm -hmm. to, to another. Right. Area. Mm -hmm. And did you put, so you put property outside of the home, right? That I put property outside of the home? Or par property was placed outside of the home? Yes, property was placed. But was there any delineating line or like a line between your area and a neighbor's area? Not really. Like it was just like, I guess we just kind of said, like kept it to like, oh, your home is there. Kind of divided. Excuse me. I'm going to need you to speak up so that the jurors can hear and so that the court reporter can hear. Okay, I'm sorry. So can you repeat what you said? And so it wasn't like an actual line that's divided, but it's like, I guess, like whatever is your behind your house is your backyard. But like I said, we were all just there. Like my kids were the only kids in the property. So they, they just roamed around. So pretty much if, if you were someone from the public and you visited that area, you pretty much could walk around. From the public? Like, what do you mean? Like if I were to go to that home and kind of just see, it's the entire area is kind of open. Mm, I mean, if you live there, yes, we know who lives there, but is somebody from the open area, no. So let's say I'm visiting and I'm just trying to speak to someone. It, you could pretty much go from the front to the back. Pretty easy. Mm, not really. Like, I mean, if you, you have to pass behind the houses, to, I mean, to get to the backyard, but we wouldn't have people just come and go to the backyard. Was there a gate stopping anyone from going to the backyard? Um, like on our side, there was a dividing line, like where it shows that the backyard was there, like a gate. And so the police ended up uh, coming to your home. Mm -hmm. And how long were they there for? I want to say a good, maybe, well, I get out of work at five. Um, and I'm sure they were there for a while already. They didn't tell me how long they were there for, but they didn't leave until, like, it was really dark already. So I could say like 10, 11. Did they ever show you that they had a warrant? 
They showed me the warrant later in the evening, yes. And once they showed that to you, did you start to indicate just what yeah, property? Yes. Objection. He didn't want the warrant to come in. Can a stranger enter your backyard or is it secured? If a stranger en enters your backyard, can they just take your stuff? What if you had taken it from them first? These are great questions. Uh, does the witness uh, seem credible to you? Do, you? do you think she had no knowledge of what was happening? She says it's the first time the defendant had brought home a whole bunch of stuff in boxes, like purchased in bulk, and it could, could, it could be a storage unit he bought. Uh, some people, you know, like what the hails, they buy storage units and they, they clean them out. And I imagine there have been probably been times where they flipped a storage unit where they bought one and said, hey, might not want to handle this one. Look, I'll sell it to somebody else. I'll make a little bit of money, but I'll sell it. And you just take it over. Could happen. I think she's not a willing witness, but she is. I mean, you know, she says she's telling the truth. Seems credible so far. It, I guess we're going to hear on the fingerprints if his fingerprints were on the trailer. And that, that might right. be a little harder continue. to explain. Now, did you ever direct the police as to what items were already there or were, were actually were yours versus what items were brought by Jose? From the items that were brought from the outside, yes, I did direct them. And did they take those items from the home? Yes. And again, these were a substantial amount of items. Would you agree with me on that? Right. And did you and Jose ever talk about, uh, about what happened? Did you ever talk about it uh, after this point? No. And did you stop living together with him shortly after that? We stopped living together a few months after that. And were you upset that this had happened? I was more upset that my kids were questioned while I wasn't there. Did Jose ever tell you what he was planning to do with any of these items? No. So what about the items that were inside the home? Well, there were items that we liked, so we were keeping them. And then what about the items outside? I don't know what he was going to do with them. But they were sitting outside where they were exposed to the elements. Would you agree? Yeah. And so if it had rained, it would have destroyed the items or damaged them? Yeah, if it rained, yeah. And do you see Jose, Jose Lozano here in court? Did I see him here in court? No. Do you see him right now? Oh, it's right there. Uh, and can you identify him by an article of clothing that he's wearing? Okay, the baby that blue almost, shirt. That almost. Uh, let the record reflect right. that the witness has identified the defendant. In the baby What's blue Jose's shirt? full name? Jose Manuel Lozano. And do you know what's his mother's maiden name? Um, Alarcón. And... Social again at the time, Jose was living there uh, at that address. He was. What is the address again? It's the uh, Greenwood Road address, one three six four one. Did you get it wrong? Pass the witness. Defense. <clears throat> Ms. Serrano, um, describe for the jury more or less where this is located. It's in Atascosa, the city of Atascosa, borderline in Atascosa County. What's in the country? The country or U.S.? No, I mean, I'm sorry. It's <laughs> not in the city. It's in no. Within the county lines, but not the city limits. Right. So would you say that... Uh, Describe like the general area. Is it like a subdivision or is it big, big lots with houses? It's a, um, there's a lot of big properties around. 
So your neighbors are not necessarily right next to you. Okay. Um, in the case of my neighbors that were next to us, we lived on one property. But like the closest neighbors were like, let's say maybe five houses away, which would be in San Antonio or like it, it's separated in acreage. So when you say on your property, you mean on the lot where your the house lot. was? That's right. There's three houses. That's right. How big is that lot? Roughly. Mm, maybe an acre or two. Okay. So there's each each person has a relatively large space. Mm -hmm. You have to say yes or no. Yes, sorry. Okay. And so when council was asking you about the yard, if you went to your house, could you determine just by looking what would be the backyard to your property? Yes. And were there some fence lines, even though there may have not been fence lines on every single spot? So on our side, it was divided by a tree. So I guess that, that divided us from the other property. And on the side of the house, there was a fence, like half, like a partial fence on each side, but it wasn't completely covered. If you recall, were there some spots where there was a fence that was maybe had fallen or was not standing? That one on the side. But but you knew that was the fence line because that's where the fence was. Right. Okay. So I want to clear up your answer to the question. Did you just permit anybody just to go behind your house? No. Did you? Was it your belief that the area behind your house was solely your property? Right. Yes. And so when you said the kids would roam around, what, what did you mean then? Well, because they 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 would see like um like rabbits in the back and they would go look for them. The neighbors had rabbit uh, like rabbits that there were their pets, I guess, and they would go over there and they would feed them carrots or whatnot. So like it was just like a mutual type thing where the kids would just let roam whenever they so when you said you were more upset about your kids being questioned, who who questioned your kids? Um, I don't remember the the, the sheriff's name, um, but uh, my daughter said that they that they knocked on the door once, and my oldest son told them that his parents weren't there, and then that they um, they banged again, and they were like, "Where's your mom? We need your mom," and they showed them a picture of their dad. Is this your dad? Um, oh, look, we saw him doing this, and they showed them a picture um, of a slim man, like, next to, um, like, a dark vehicle, and their dad isn't slim. So um, my daughter was like, no, like, that's not my dad. Like, that's my dad. The first picture you showed me is my dad, but not that second one. I um, is this the same date that you talked about them being there all the way until late evening hours? That's right, yes. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> you said that your understanding was that Jose had bought all those items. Right. Did you, have, did you have any reason to doubt when he said that? No. Um, at the time, would he have had money to buy something of that kind of value if somebody offered it to him? Yes. Would he keep would he keep money in, like in cash money in the house? Yes. Had you known him to buy and sell things at, on other occasions other than this one? Like to buy himself things? No, like, like let's say somebody had some tires to sell and he thought he could resell them or something like that. Had you known him to do that before? Yes. What was he doing for work at the time? The mechanic work. Mechanic? Okay. Now you said was helping people there with were their some items trailers, in the I collection think. that you had an interest in and maybe you wouldn't resell. Is that is that what I understood? Yes. Well, I mean I wouldn't sell them. <laughs> um why would you leave things outside exposed or was it because you didn't think they had really high value? We had a very small home. We couldn't fit the stuff inside if we wanted to. He still bought it now, all, though. Did you ever see any vehicles parked on your property within that two-week period that didn't belong to you or to Jose? No, sir. Uh, any cargo trailers? No. Anything, any other type of motor vehicle or trailer that didn't belong or titled in your name? No. <clears throat> now, 
Now, you said that the two of you separated sometime after that. Was that as a result of this situation or something else? It's something completely different. It had nothing to do with the fact that Jose got arrested. No. State. Now, in your backyard, were there any other, were there any vehicle parts or vehicle items that were there? Not that I remember, no. So if there were parts to a truck or other vehicle that were just out in the backyard, that would surprise you? The only vehicle that was back there was his father's truck. Like that's the only vehicle that I remember seeing back there. That's what it is. What did that truck look like? It was a red Ford Ranger. And if if somebody comes to knock on your front door uh, or approaches your front of your house, can they see that red truck? Yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. behind the house or in front of the house? It was in the back part of the house. So how would they see it if they were at the front door? If they looked back there, kind of. In other words, they'd have to go around the house, correct? Yeah, Ooh, a little bit. Like, because it was red and it was, um, there was a lot of like trees in that area as well. You can kind of see it, but you have to like, kind of look back there to see it. So let's say, for example, you wanted to look inside of the truck. How far was it from the front of the house? Mm, like from here to the clock. Okay. Prosecutors all look. Where's the clock? A passive administration. State? Another from the state. All right. Is this witness excused or subject for recall? Uh, subject to recall, Judge. That's fine. All right. The rule has been invoked. You're not allowed to discuss your testimony with anything or watch anything regarding this trial. Do you understand? Make sure that you're available if either the state or the defense wishes to recall you. Okay. All right. You may step down. Thank you. And judge, may we approach? Yes. Just walk out. Thank you. Uh, Pauline. Pauline, I don't have the answer for you right now. It depends on schedules and what happens. This is a jury trial, Holistic Robot. The jury is there present. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to release you all early today so you can enjoy the river walk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we're going to start back tomorrow at 1.30. Again, the same rules apply with regards to the parking uh, at 1.30. No double parking. If you're probably here by 12.30, you should have a, a place to park. Remember my instructions. You're not to start thinking internally about this case or deliberating internally or with each other. Everything that you need to know about this case is to come from inside the courtroom, nowhere else. If somebody talks to you about this case or wants to talk to you about this case, or if you see something about this case, you to completely ignore it. Does everyone understand? Yes, yes, You're not allowed to do any research. All right. All right. Every Yes. Um, are we going to come early the rest of the uh, days, Friday? I'm sorry. Friday, most likely. Okay. But I'll be able to let you know tomorrow. I'll let you know what time on Friday. And I'll let you know when you come in what time on Friday. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Everyone, please rise for the jurors. All right. The jurors are leaving. We're going to jump ahead. You're not allowed to start thinking about this case. All, yeah, all the jurors are like, um, I haven't. I promise. I've just been sitting here with a blank look on my face. No thoughts go through my head. Yeah. Immediately, what do you start thinking about this case? It's weird instructions. Turn your brain off for 24 hours. All right. Everyone, please be seated. Yes, please. Thank you. 
No. Ooh. All right. So, defense, you're you're objecting or asking that the search warrant be suppressed. Yes, Judge. If you if you look at the, just the four corners of the document, the officers clearly state that they go to within private areas of the property, which is the backyard, um, to, and that's when they start looking around. They actually look around and they look inside uh, the truck that's back there. And then they take that information that they gain through their trespassing and go to the magistrate and ask for a warrant. Uh, it, it shocks me that they would admit to uh, intruding upon somebody's private space in that manner uh, in a sworn document at the same time asking the asking a court to issue a warrant. Um, whether whether the backyard has a fence on it or it doesn't have a fence on it, it's still their backyard. Um, and he doesn't deny that. Their, their, their suggestion is, our justification is, well, we were going to knock on the front door, so we want to make sure nobody came out the back door. Well, they didn't have a warrant for anybody. They weren't looking for anybody to arrest. They were just gathering information. This wasn't you know, armed people holding somebody hostage in the house and they were worried they're going to run out with guns to the back door. That was, it was a totally um, false impression to the court. But I don't, even, I don't even think it's that because when you read it, it's clearly we're just doing a knock and talk. And that somehow that justifies them going to the back door. And even if it did, even if it did, does that mean you get to go poke your head in, and look inside the contents of vehicles that are in the property? Um, so, and, and, I, and I agree that the state's probably gonna argue that there's other justifications that they have to suggest why they know there's contraband on the property. But if, if they admit to and, and tell the court that they're asking for the warrant, information that admits to illegal searching uh, and illegal trespassing, uh, that should nullify the whole thing because we don't know what Fruit of the poisonous tree. The, of the affidavit the court relied on in granting it. And if there's portions on there that's admitting to wrongdoing in the, uh, in the, in being in the place that they're at, the warrant should not stand. It, it, it's, if we analogize it to a, um, plain view situation, plain view, the case law in plain view is very clear. You can't put yourself in a position where you're not supposed to be and then claim it's plain view when I see it, therefore the search is legit. And that's exactly what happened here. They put themselves in a place that they were not allowed to go to, which is their private backyard, and then snooped around and used that information to obtain the warrant. All right, and was a motion submitted in this? A motion to suppress or no? There was, but I, can't remember I, I don't think we did judge, but I still and, and judge, I, 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 believe, judge. I believe that they did. All right. I, I just need to see the motion. That's why I'm asking. I don't remember. Give me just a moment and I'll look it up. So and then I'll hear argument uh, from the state yes, when sir, you're ready. So, um, I got it. Oh, you got it for you? Okay. Yeah. Um, so the, the backyard wasn't enclosed in this case, Judge. We're, we're arguing that this was an open field search. There's bags, uh, evidence of this crime out there in plain view. Uh, the name of the uh, victim in this case is, is all about the bags. Uh, once they see that name, they say, hold up, wait, we got to go get a warrant. You know, and they go get a warrant from the uh, detached magistrate. Um, and there's this um, preference uh, in this line of cases um, that uh, reviewing courts should uh, give deference to the magistrate. We're not, the reviewing courts are not supposed to play Monday morning quarterback and say, well, the officer or the magistrate at the time should have done A, B, and C. They're just, the reviewing court, the reviewing court's yeah. role in this case is just to review to see if there, uh, there was enough for the PC at the time. And, and there was in this case, judge. Um, and even if that, um, that initial search, there was something wrong with it. I think once the neutral detachment out of straight, uh, signs off on the warrant, signs up, reviews the update and signs off on the warrant that, that, um, uh, that negates the the search that the and and there's that the, the part from Illinois v Gates uh, where the trial court can excise the information from the warrant that was uh, wrongfully obtained and examine the warrant to see if the affidavit nevertheless establishes PC um, and so even if you take Probable out um, the part of the of the warrant um, 
that may have been obtained unlawfully. I think the rest of the warrant that uh, the rest of the information, the affidavit um, that the officer saw uh, is still enough for probable cause to um, to allow the search. And so I, I do have just a few cases, Judge. I that have no um, punishment for breaking the law for the right, co cops. Up. I have Brown v. State, uh, Brackens v. State, and State v. Le. Um, so in, in Brown v. State, the court said that uh, if the tainted information is contained in the emphasized sentence in the affidavit, if that sentence is eliminated, the rest of the, the, rest of the affidavit is clearly sufficient to justify the issue of the warrant to search for the boots. Um, and, and so, Your Honor, the court has said in, in other cases that if you excise the part of the, the affidavit that, um, that contains information that is legally uh, obtained, but there's still probable cause, then the warrant's okay. And so, and that's what we're saying here, Judge. Um, and, and Bracken's v. State, that's a, a similar deal. If there's something in the affidavit that, that it was unlawfully uh, obtained, some information that was unlawfully obtained, but the, the affidavit still contains sufficient probable cause without that unlawfully obtained information, then the affidavit is still sufficient to grant probable cause. Um, and so, Judge, we would ask that that you find that there is sufficient probable cause in the affidavit and, and not suppress the, the warrant and the search, Your Honor. All right. Defense, it's your motion. I'll give you a final argument. Judge, the only thing that I would I would ask the court to reconsider is that, uh, and I know the court knows this, but I still have to make the record and make the arguments. And that is, we are solely relying on what's in the document. Uh, when the counsel says, well, it's an open field and, and they could go back there, you can't, you can't consider those things. You can't consider... Uh, suggestions of evidence of things that the magistrate could have relied on and it's not in the four corners of the piece of paper so uh, i'd ask the court if you focus just on that and you take out i agree with it you take out the parts that was illegally obtained it becomes very very slim and i think probable cause is lost he specifically says in the affidavit he sees the items that he thinks of what they're looking for well of course a magistrate is going to sign a warrant in that situation but I, I don't know why the magistrate at that time didn't ask, well, what were you doing in the backyard looking inside of their vehicles and looking through their backyard? Because they, that might have given a reason to pause about whether or not to sign that or not. All right. All right. I've heard both parties' arguments. I will give you all my ruling tomorrow at 10. So what? be back here at 10. I, I'm printing out these cases that I referenced. Judge, do you care if I give them to them? I can email them to you. Okay. Yeah, if you email them to me. All right. Yeah. I need citations. All right, I so I'll see y'all back tomorrow at 10. Thank you, Judge. Is what the print's done today? Is the jury coming back? Oh, the jury's coming back at 1.30. And uh, if y'all could go ahead and do your fingerprints. We might have sent that person away. Why? Yeah, Judge. Uh, we'll Why have them here on away? Friday. That, that's when we told them. All right, so those... All right, I want everyone to understand something. Uh -oh. The Sit jury down. was here. And then they waited for an hour. So with that fingerprint person on Friday, they need to be here and they need to be ready to go. And it appears that on Friday, we're all going to be here at eight. Whoa. Okay, so we're going to catch up with, uh, with uh, because that was the previous day. So now we're jumping to Friday. Man. Lots of fun things happen while we're away. So let's see this. We want to see how this one ends up. So see, Friday was the now we need March eighth, right? Tell me I'm doing this right. March sixth, March seventh, March seventh. Do we go to March eighth? Samantha, somebody help me here. We went we went from six. Was there nothing in court on seven? Oh, there's part three. Hang on, hang on, wait for it. I'm finding it. Part four. Part. There's our morning docket. Part one. Part five. Where's part two?
Okay, I think it's the morning docket one. March 7th. We just watched part one, so I think it's this one here. Give me, give me just a second to find where we're at. Looking for the defendant. Not seeing him. Okay, so we're going to jump to the part. Sorry, this is. There it is. Tuesday, March 5th. Oh, man. Okay, so, Samantha, I think you just sent me the 7th. Judge needs to update her thumbnails a little bit. March 7th. There we go. That's this one right here. Okay, got it, got it, got it. We're good. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Can we, can we do that now, Judge, with fingerprinting? Or you want to do uh, Sorry, you said you want to do the other. Well, the court reporter isn't here yet. So, uh, Ray, are you all going to want the Say fingerprint sure. issue, whether or not they can take fingerprints? You want that on the record, or are you going to agree to printing? Judge, I know the court's going to grant that motion, so it's okay for okay. him to be appointed now. All right, so if you'll go ahead and print it. Okay. Look at him making assumptions on what the court is going to do. I've ever made that request has been denied over the years. So. But you know what? I love to hear the objections, though. <laughs> motions motions for, for any kind of pretrial motion is required to be filed seven days before trial. We're in the middle of trial, uh, and you file a motion for printing. That's a motion. Yes, there you go. Uh, that's, huh. that's my objection. Follow, oh, okay, follow, I follow I appreciate that objection. Filed in 2023. That'll be overruled. <laughs> <laughs> but Ray, I do yeah. like that. I actually made that objection once, Judge, on a, on a court of appeals judge who was sitting there as a visiting judge. Mm -hmm. and he goes, "I like." Yeah. Oh, we're just going to turn this in. Did you do it. October twenty twenty three. Okay. There you go. Uh, we're waiting for the court reporter. Judge, were we going to do a few pleas before? No, we're going to do the pleas after we. Oh, wherever you, where's your fingerprint person? Hi, if you come forward, um, right where's your client? Wait, wait. All right. Oh, right here. She's going to do the fingerprints. Is this same old kitty? Yes. The apocalypse may be upon us. There's our defendant in a tan shirt. Yes. No. I'm just sitting here. I hope. Bring the jury. Okay, that's the first idea. Hi. Oh, no problem. Take a deep breath. They're doing fingerprints, so you have time to set up and compose. Court reporter is here now, or court recorder. Um, 
Oh, sure. Still waiting. We're going to skip ahead a little bit. Oh, those are bright colored pants. Come back, come back. What was that? No. What did I just have there? Um, here's the problem, Sean Smith. I believe that's why they say it's going to work out. Yes. And then yes, I'm, I'm waiting. Thank you. And I'm waiting for the attorney on Christopher Medina. Yes. And I do have the plea paperwork for Ochoa. Okay. We're going to skip ahead just briefly here while we can. He just went to the 175th judge. Do you need him? Do you need us now? Yes. Do you want us now? Okay. Mm -hmm. You made it to the elevator. <laughs> Thank you. I Waiting for the attorney. Because court's part. CR. There we go. Here we go. We're calling court. And 2021 CR 7016, State of Texas versus Jose Lozano. Can I have parties announced for the record for the state? Hank Wilkins and Daniel Escobar for the state, Your Honor. Raymond Martinez and Victoria, please, from Mr. McFarland. And are you Mr. Lozano? Yes. All right. So we're here for the court to make a ruling on the affidavit for search warrant. So defense, the court just wants to be clear with regards to the affidavit for the search warrant. Uh, if you review page one. Right. Just do you have a copy of the affidavit council take your time all right so page one where it says where it starts with your affiant has probable cause that paragraph on page one do you have any complaints about that paragraph uh, Sorry, second, okay all right starting where it says your affiant has probable cause that first paragraph on page one that continues on page two with that first line do you have any objections to that paragraph or any complaints about that paragraph she's making him i guess my complaint judge is that highlight the whole none thing. of that addresses no 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 i'm, I'm going to go paragraph by paragraph that's what i want to do because i'm staying in the four corners right so that paragraph relates to the complaint by the complainant at the location at home to Sweets by Hilton. Right. So that first paragraph, no complaints. I, I guess my, I don't know if it's a complaint or just a comment that that doesn't address why they believe there's no, we're, we're getting there. Okay. So I just want to make sure. So there's no complaints about that paragraph on page two no complaints about paragraph two three or four your objection is to paragraph five where it says detectives approach the front of the residence to perform a knock and talk and bear county deputies who were located to at the location to assist detectives and went to the back door of the location to ensure the safety of detectives and the deputies at the scene while at the back of the property de deputies were able to see military artifacts that were described as well as military cargo bags bearing the victim's last name that's the issue the search of the backyard am i correct without a warrant 
Yes, Judge. Although I would say the paragraph before it, it all, the last sentence addresses the same issue where they claim that they see something in plain view. I think that clearly they're talking about being in the backyard and seeing something in plain view. All right. So I, I make no assumptions with regards to the affidavit for search warrant. I just read it within the four corners and whether or not it's sufficient. Well, I, I just think I just and I agree with that, Judge. I'm just saying if you read it all together, okay. they're talking about what they're seeing. When, when, they, when they're seeing things, it's when they're on his property, without a doubt, they have to be on his property. And secondly, in the backyard. I don't think there was, in, you read the totality of it, I don't think they saw anything in the front yard mm -hmm. or in the entrance that gave them any rise to have articulable facts to include a probable cause affidavit. All right, the sentence that the court is Looking at, it says, while at the back of the property, deputies were able to see military artifacts. It doesn't say while at the back of the property, the detectives saw the gray camper shell. Was there a gray camper shell stolen? I mean, okay. I, I hear what you're saying, Judge. I mean, no, no, no. Every reason the way I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep seeing it the way I see it. I, I, okay. I, I know right. what you're saying. All right. Uh, with regards to the motion to suppress the search warrant, the motion is denied. And for the record, Boom. Uh, the court reviewed the search warrant in its entirety. In reviewing this uh, search warrant for sufficiency, the court is not taking in consideration the paragraph where it states the following. Bear County deputies who were at the location to assist detectives and went to the back door of the location to ensure the safety of detectives and deputies at the scene. While at the back of the property, deputies were able to see military artifacts that were described as well as military cargo bags bearing the victim's last name in parentheses is the word Kirk bride. The court is not considering that paragraph or, um, I don't like this rule. The following paragraph in making a decision on whether or not the warrant is sufficient. So if that paragraph were removed, the court would still find that the warrant was sufficient and the, um, and the affidavit is sufficient. The court will deny uh, defense's motion to suppress uh, the search warrant. Yeah, it gives the cops too much to leave. Is there also anything else no... before the jury is brought in? And, and Judge, just let me address all the rest of it. Yes. Clearly in the, in the next couple of paragraphs, we talk about looking inside of vehicles. I'm taking it the court is just cool with that i'm not considering any in that what i what the court is considering i'm considering paragraph one on page one paragraph two paragraph three and paragraph four based upon those four paragraphs the warrant is sufficient okay so we're stuck at the next paragraph to, to the end you're disregarding that because there's actually with with regards to the last paragraph, it says the second vehicle, red in color, and it gives the VIN number, is parked at the location. In plain view, inside the vehicle is a plastic storage bin described by the victim as belonging to the victim. The bin is marked with military stuff and pantry. What I'm, I'm telling defense is, if this affidavit only had paragraph one from page one, paragraph two, Paragraph three and paragraph four, that is sufficient for this search warrant. So the uh, defense's motion to suppress the warrant is denied. I'm going to have the jury brought in and state who is your next witness? Uh, the complaining witness, Your Honor, Terry Kirkbride. All right, if you have them take the, the witness stand, please. The, the problem I have is that the cops obtained information. And to those who are waiting yes. for your uh, pleas, you need to talk to the deputies so that you can do your plea paperwork with your client. And then once we have a break in the jury trial, then your pleas will be taken up. It seems like the, the end justifies the means here. 
That's what it feels like. It's like, well, we found the stuff, so there's no penalty for us breaking the law to find it. The Supreme Court has a case on this. Is there an issue? Which way did it rule? Jurors are ready, Judge. All right. Just bring them in. Just bring them in? Yes. Bring them. Right up yeah. It's plain view All from right, them being in the, the backyard. Oh my Good faith. They went to the backyards to ensure their safety, to make sure nobody was leaving out the back of the house and circling around. The but they didn't have any evidence yet to justify a warrant. Oh, please be seated. We stand for you. All right, everyone, please be seated. I hope you all were able to find parking. And uh, some of the people who are here, it, it has absolutely nothing to do with this case. I always have a docket in the morning. So some of them are from this morning. All right, State, call your next witness. State calls Terry Kirkbride, Your Honor. Could you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give would be the truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? All right, you can lower your hand. Make sure you keep your voice up so that members of the jury can hear and the court reporter can hear. This if is you'll the gentleman state your name for the record. stuff stolen. Jerry Kirkbride. State. Thank you, Mr. Kirkbride, can you uh, tell, the, uh, tell the jury what you do for a living? Uh, I am retired Air Force. I did 35 years uh, Air Force. Um, He's uh, retired as a chief master sergeant out at Travis Air Force Base. Where is uh, Travis Air Force Base? It's in Northern California. What's the town that you lived in when you were at Air, uh, Travis Air Force Base? Uh, Vacaville. And how long did you live in Vacaville? From 1979 all the way up to uh, 2000. And uh, 79 to 2000? Yes. Are you married? I, I am. What's your wife's name? Rachel. How long have y'all been married? Ten years now. And uh, what kind of uh, what kind of jobs did you do within the Air Force? Um, aircraft maintenance is my background. Um, aircraft structural maintenance, and then through the years, I had uh, promoted into flight chief, where I ran several different shops, and then later to superintendent, where I ran a squadron, supporting the maintenance on the C fives, AC tens, C seventeens, and the 141s before they re, uh, retired. And um, what did you and uh, you and Rachel have been married for 10 years? 10 years now. Uh, what type of things do y'all like to do? In our retirement, uh, Rachel took an early retirement shortly after I did. And so travel, uh, we enjoy uh, antiquing, um, collecting. I have had several collections, so that was kind of a passion of mine. Uh, historical uh, research was a big passion of mine and also of Rachel her mostly for her Native American type history that's her lineage and for me it was a lot of military history and other things I, I think I collected probably too many different things okay could you tell the jury about some of your collections what, what type of things do you collect um, I had a military military collection uh, my my father was a avid collector so I inherited a lot of his collection mm -hmm. Uh, from World War II items, uh, both from uh, his time when he was in Okinawa during the Okinawan campaign during World War II, and also from uh, Germany, of the German collectibles that were from that same time era. Um, that's just one of many. I, I collect arrowheads, I collect um, shifting knobs for race cars, I mean, going back to the 30s and 40s. Like I like vehicles. I, I've, I've been a car collector. I was up to 13 vehicles before I moved uh, from California, making my journey to to Orlando. I got rid of all my collector cars, kind of leaned everything out. Um, I had a hood ornament collection that was a real big thing. I'm talking a lot of high-end hood ornaments that go all the way back to Lincoln Zephyrs, all the way up to the 40s and 50s aircraft style looking hood ornaments. Just a whole... Uh, grab bag full of various collections. Um, I even I even had a vintage uh, ashtray collection that I don't even smoke that went back to the, the 30s, 40s, you know, 
that type of thing. So did y'all uh, did y'all live in an apartment there in Vacaville? No, I lived uh, in a home. I was on a five acre property. Okay, with so a pretty, shop that I had built, that type of thing. Five acres, so pretty uh, big size house there. Yeah, it was. It was. I think it was 23, 2300 square foot home with a three car garage and a shop that I had built. And um, what uh, were you just gearing up for a move in 2019, 2020? Yeah, um, my my son moved first and his wife to Orlando. He, he worked for the VA. And uh, then a few years, years later, two years later, my, my, my daughter's husband took a job in Orlando. So I found we found ourselves with our kids gone. They were in Florida. And our grandkids, we have five grandkids now, but at the time it was it was three. And uh, we just decided one day, maybe we need to move to Florida. And so we just kind of put that thought in our head. And uh, literally within three months, we were had our house sold and everything that we didn't want to bring with us, furniture items, a lot of collector things that I figured it was time to let go of. We just sold everything, got rid of everything. And I kind of got it all down to... We rented a Penske truck. I think it was a 24 foot truck. I had to check maybe 28. It was a big truck and that had a lot of garage and, and uh, garage items, tools, those type of things, bicycles, all that kind of stuff went in it. And I also had a uh, 1937 Ford truck. I call it a rat rod because I, I built it myself. And the engine for that, I just had rebuilt. I had that on a pallet in the back of my F-350 truck. So. Basically, my F-350 truck, a 24-foot enclosed trailer that we had just purchased uh, for this move, and three months of very meticulously packing everything so that it, that it would all fit in the trailer, all of our collectibles, uh, all of our memorabilia, all my military accolades for, for the many years that I served, a little bit of everything, our, all of our historical stuff, photographs, videos, everything was in there, our collections from floor to ceiling, side to side. And then we made our journey. And so I just want to go back to your family a little bit. So you have five grandkids. How many kids do you have? Uh, four. Four kids, okay. And uh, two of them are in Orlando or? We have three of them in Orlando. Um, our one son, he had got out of the army and really didn't want to stay in California. So he asked if he could move with us. So he was accompanying us on the move and coming to Florida with us. Okay, so it's you and, and Rachel, and, and what's your son's name? Yeah, Thomas. Thomas is helping you move? Yeah. And um, so you talked a little bit about the preparation. So that took about three months? Yeah, from the time we sold our home or listed our home, to the time we actually left, it was about a three-month period. It was every day just packing and getting rid of stuff and getting prepared for the move. Did you do a uh, one of those uh, life-changing Tidying up type things, or the Marie Kondo thing. Did you, does this spark joy? Was that part of it, or? Oh, yeah. we were, we were so excited about this. I mean, my wife talking about how we felt about. When, yeah, we were we were so excited about making a big move like this. I didn't never think I would leave California. I was, I had a real nice property, and but I wanted to be around family. We wanted to re, be around our grandkids and family, so we um, did what we needed to do. I, I did do a big purge. Got rid of a lot of things. Uh, I figured. We could always purchase new furniture when, and if and when we ever found our home. At the time, uh, we had it already set up to stay in a in a like a condo apartment in uh, in Orlando while we were figuring out what our next move was after we after we got there. And you told the jury a little bit about um, the vehicles that you had, but you, you had the the big Penske truck, right? And then you had an F three fifty. Is that right? Yeah, I had an F three fifty dually uh, Ford Ford truck. And uh, that was pulling the 24-foot enclosed car hauler trailer that we had just purchased. And then the Penske truck was just a rental truck, a big truck. And behind it was a trailer that was towing my 37 Ford truck on, on it. Okay. And who's, who's driving what vehicles? Um, myself and Rachel, uh, we switched up, actually. We did have a couple friend of ours that asked if they could do, help us with the move. Um, so Joe and Sherry, good friends of mine from the military, they drove my truck and they also drove the Penske truck. We just kind of changed it up along the way as far as San Antonio. 
Okay. And so uh, can you describe to the jury uh, your route? You So you, you left Vacaville and you're headed to Florida. Is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we basically uh, had some stops kind of planned along the way. Um, when we made it as far as San Antonio, we thought we might be going further through San Antonio, but we decided that we were pretty tired from the drive and had made reservations on the road for the hotel we stayed at. And then, uh, yes, but we had stops along the way, hotels. So, so y'all decided to spend the night in San Antonio. Do you, um, do you remember the hotel y'all stayed at? Yes, it was a uh, home to suites in San Antonio off the, I don't remember the name of the freeway loop, but it was off, they called it the, the loop. And did you, did y'all pick that for any particular reason? Well, yes, uh, the criteria was to make sure that we had a, a location that was, that we think we could park two trucks with trailers behind them and park them in uh, where we could actually see them from our window, from our room, and also uh, well lit. We wanted a well lit place so that we could keep them safe. That's kind of what we were doing all along the way. And uh, okay, and was that on um, December fourth of twenty twenty? Uh, yes, it was. Okay. And so you checked into the hotel, and, and what did you do next uh, after that, after you checked in? Well, we, we finally got situated in our rooms, uh, Joe and Sherry in their room, me, Rachel, and Thomas in our room, and uh, got some sleep. And uh, come morning, I was in the shower, and our son Thomas said, hey, Pops, did Joe and Sherry move the truck? And I'm like, what? <laughs> So I went to the window, looked down, of course, the truck and trailer is gone and everything just kind of spun from there. And of course, I got a hold of Joe and Sherry and they didn't move the truck. And, and uh, we, we were we were spinning for a while trying to figure out what what do we do here? You know, uh, but yeah. And, and before the before it was before that morning, were you, you were looking for a place that was well lit. To, why were you looking for a well lit place? Oh, to avoid theft, to avoid temptation of theft. Um, we we actually didn't park in a parking space. We took up several spaces, and they told us it was fine to do that. There wasn't a whole lot of people. It's still during kind of the height of COVID it was double when we were parking. making moves. So it wasn't a whole lot of folks at that hotel. But we were right out front of uh, the the lobby entry. Kind of if you were walking out the lobby entry slightly to the left was the parking lot. That's that's where we had the two vehicles parked side by side. Uh, crossways in the parking spots. And so were you uh, keeping an eye on the truck overnight or was your son keeping an eye on the truck overnight? Uh, yeah, we right up to the time we went to bed, we were looking out the window kind of obsessively, just making sure everything was okay. There was nobody around it. Uh, I know Rachel stayed up a little later than me. She, she did the worrier. She worried uh, about something maybe happening. But yeah, we finally, we finally got sleep and then got up early because we were going to do a, a, an early start. So I think it might have been around 5, 5 a.m. in the morning. I was, I was getting myself ready for the day when I found out that we didn't have the vehicle anymore. And so what did you do next? Thomas says, hey, did somebody move the truck? What, what happened next? Well, we rushed downstairs, uh, ran out of the, the building looking around, um, talked to the clerk, asked if they had seen anything, um, called Got finally got a hold of the police. Uh, they came out. Um, it uh, it was just a real kind of surreal setting for us. I mean, I mean, the, the items that we had in that trailer were literally our lives. A full, I mean, literally a representation of our lives. I should say everything that I had from my military career, all my collectibles, all of our family heirlooms, um, pictures, all my financials records were in there. Uh, my VA records, my medical records. Um, my last deployment when I was in Afghanistan, I was there for 10 OEF 10 and 11, 10 and 11. Oh, I'm sorry, what was that? Um, <clears throat> enduring freedom, it was Afghanistan. I was there for uh, 10 and 11 for a year. And while, while there I had some things that had happened that caused them to ultimately medically retire me out bomb blast exposure, TBI, that type of thing. So I had 
uh, all of my VA records, all of my medical records, everything was in 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 the the, uh, the vehicles were stolen, uh, along with our photographs, and videos, and everything that you might have had that was of importance. Sir, I'm sorry, you're trailing off. If I can get you to speak up. Okay. It was just basically all of our all of our paperwork, uh, things that were intangible, uh, as far as putting a value on because it, it was priceless. Photographs, videos. Um, all of our family history, my VA records, my medical records, our financial records. And so what happened next? Well, um, got a hold of a friend of mine that was a retired colonel uh, there that lived in the area, of, here in this area of San Antonio. He came out, uh, me and him actually started driving around all over the place, seeing if we could see maybe the vehicle or the trailer. That didn't. We didn't find anything. We didn't really know if we should continue to Florida and the Penske truck. We didn't know if we should just stay in the area. We, we were really in a uh, kind of a confused state, I guess, for a little bit. Our friends, uh, Joe and Sherry, they flew back home. They made arrangements. No sense in them going anymore. We don't have the vehicle. Um, the police, when they had come out, they had taken kind of the initial report on, on it. And uh, so we ended up going out to uh, uh, Randolph uh, Air Force Base and got a room there, figured it'd be safer uh, for a few nights until we finally decided that there really wasn't much more we could do here in San Antonio. So uh, myself, Rachel, Thomas, and our two, two cats crammed in the Penske truck and we continued the journey to Florida. And um, they recovered your trailer, right? The police did? Yes. Um, that occurred early morning, uh, late night, probably uh, 11 o'clock or so at night. I think it was about three in the morning before we finally had, uh, had the trailer in our possession. It was found some miles away from, from the home to suites, uh, parked in a neighborhood, and it was emptied. So we met uh, Joe, our friend Joe, took us out there, and we met with the, uh, there was two officers that were there. And uh, made arrangements to have it towed over to my friend Joe's house, the trailer, so we could figure out what we were going to do next. So the the trailer was towed to your your buddy's house in the Sierra town. Yes, sir. Initially, it was towed to his house, and then later he moved it. We moved it. We, while I was still here, moved it over to his daughter's house, who had a little bit of property to keep it stored. And so, how many days after uh, the theft did you? Did you all keep driving to Florida? That was day three that we left. And uh, what was your next interaction with the police? Um, it was frustrating at first because we weren't getting a lot of information. Uh, the forms that we were given was basically list all of your items or you know your theft, which was almost an incredible task in itself because of the volume, thousands and thousands of items in various collections. So. Um, we just did a general statement of what we had. Everything was filed as a, as a police report. They gave us the report number. That was kind of the end of it while we were here. Um, it wasn't, I'm being very honest, it wasn't until days, weeks later that we started making a lot of inquiries with, with um, San Antonio Police Department trying to figure out, you know, what's going on with our case? What's going, is anything happening? Have they found anything? And, uh, I didn't get the feeling that, and, and I think it's kind of common trans transient type thefts, you know, where you, you, people don't live here, so therefore nothing ever comes of it. But I was pretty persistent. I actually wrote a letter uh, to the mayor, to city planner, anybody that would listen, kind of a generic letter who I was, what I was about, what had happened to us. Even got media involved in it, your local news media. So all this, from the time of the theft to the time uh, that things started really moving it was about a, about 28 days had elapsed, and then the fingerprint was processed. They, and things started moving from there when they found the, found the, the property where you know remnants of our stuff was 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 stored or, or left. And so, uh, were you in communication that. with police when they when they found some of your property? I was initially it was uh, a detective um, Reed. And then later it became uh, Detective Hodge. Detective Hodge became the lead investigator. I had actually got a call like 
after I sent that letter, it was like literally the next day I got a phone call from chief of police. Chief of police told me they were going to put a, de a detective on it. It was Reed initially, then it was Detective Hodge, who's, who's now since retired, since this case has been going for a while. And uh, he kind of kept in communication with me of what, what was going on uh, as far as they had found remnants of our stuff. And, uh, and so did you wind up recovering some of your property? Um, yes, the, the detective, I guess when they went to the, went there to go through everything, I had actually received a few photographs to say, is, is it, you know, is this your, is this your, your stuff basically? And, and of course it was, a lot of it had my name on it. Um, I had some bags that had my military clothing, that type of thing that had my name on it. So I, uh, I, he took some other officers. He, I coordinated with my friend Joe Bentley where the trailer was kept at his daughter's house. He brought the trailer over to the site and they tried recovering items. But most of the stuff that we recovered was incomplete, partial, broken. A lot of it was just left out in the weather. It looks as if, it looks as if well, every tub, we had plastic tubs, we had boxes it was just kind of ransacked through in, in the yard and took all the good stuff and left kind of the other stuff out there and a lot of that other stuff was photographs things like that paperwork just left out in the rain up just left left to be destroyed so we uh we didn't really recover much we did get some of our stuff back um but all in my opinion all of the things that were of, of value or sent or sentimental value or personal value really it was none of that and uh, may i approach the witness here yes i'm going to show you some photos um, i'll show you what i'm marking now is uh states exhibit uh three and four can you tell us can you tell the jury what states exhibit three and four are? It's a camper shell. That's the camper shell that I had on the back of my F-350 truck. Uh, it's an eight foot bed. Mine was an eight foot bed. It's an ARE model. That's what it was. The glass back that lifts up, which never really stayed locked. Uh, I was always having to mess with it to, to get it to lock. But yeah, that's, that's our camper shell that's, that's on the back of my truck. That's your camper shell? Yep. Okay. So this is a fair and accurate uh, photo. These photo are these fair and accurate photographs of your camper show. Yes. Okay. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Your Honor, I offer uh, States Exhibit Three and Four. No objection, Judge. Right, States Exhibit Three and Four is admitted without objection. Can I publish these, Your Honor? Yes. So we're not seeing the pictures of the camper shell. Imagine seeing the gray camper shell that fits on the back of a Ford F-350 eight-foot bed. All right, so that's uh, your camper shell? Yes, it is. Okay. And I want to show you what I'm marking right now is uh, states exhibit five, six, seven, and eight. Can you tell the jury what these are? I'm just here to help. Yeah, see, this is the owner manual that was in my F-350 Ford truck. Um, and this with the code number on it was our keypad number to enter. Uh, if you, for whatever reason, got locked out of your vehicle, you could enter this keypad and open it remotely. And that was with the owner's manual in the glove box. Sure. And is this a, are these fair and accurate depictions of uh, 
your um, your truck's owner's manual? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, I uh, offer State's Exhibit 5, 6, 7, and 8. Judge, if I can take a moment. Yes. Mr. Kirkwright, where was that recovered? If you know. I don't know the address, sir. Uh, I mean, was that at that property? Was it in a box? Did the police give it to you separately? Oh, um, the way I recovered it is it was put upside down in the trailer with the other recovered mm -hmm. stuff that they tried to attempt to get for me so that I actually got that camper shell back and, and it ended up coming back to florida with me when i picked up my when i had my trailer shipped because your friends and the police went and recouped some items when you were still physically in florida that is correct okay. so you don't have personal knowledge of where this was recovered from correct you just know that it was in the trailer when you got back to san antonio to look at what they recovered uh, yes sir and and ultimately back to orlando And so was it separated from all the other items or was it just in the trailer in one of the boxes? No, the the camper shell was oh, sorry, excuse me, just one moment. Which exhibit is this? Judge five, six, seven, and eight are all various depictions of the item he described. All right. So the exhibit that's on the screen now. That's actually the that's not the one we're talking about. All right, so if you all could take that off the screen since they're talking about a different exhibit. All right, and you may continue with your voir dire. Sorry. No, I, until he finishes with his voir dire. So I, I'm going to repeat the last question, if you don't mind. So when you get back to San Antonio and they, ship, they let you into the trailer to see what's in there, do you recall where this was located? Yes, sir. It was upside down and uh, forward in the trailer, all the way forward. Um, it has a ramp that drops down in the back. So if you were to come in from the back and go all the way forward, it was on the floor of the trailer upside down and then other stuff thrown on top of it, boxes and stuff. Judge, we would object to him not having personal knowledge of where this was located. It's misleading to give the impression it was at my client's property when that hasn't been established. State. Uh, Your Honor, he has personal knowledge that uh, this was one of his items that was recovered. All right, let me see. Uh, States exhibits five, six, seven, and eight. Is that correct? Yes, yes Judge. And if they're only offering to say that it's his, you don't have an objection to that. We just don't want there to be misleading that he's suggested. Who he knows where it came from? All right, State. You're calling the witness to testify that this is his property? That's it. That is his property. Yes, sir. All right, then uh, States exhibits five, six, seven, and eight are admitted. Mr. Kirk, Brad, I'm going to show you what's, I'm going to mark as uh, State's Exhibit 9. Can you tell me what this is? Yes, this is one of two wooden cats that uh, belonged to my wife that she had for many years before I met her. Okay. Um, and is this a fair and accurate depiction of, of that wooden cat? Yes. Okay. And can you, yeah. can you tell me what State's Exhibit 10 is? That's one of Rachel's rings. Can you tell me what State's Exhibit 11 is? These are uh, two Native American chief salt pepper shakers, uh, part of a, a pretty mass collection of different salt and pepper shakers from, from that time period. And can you tell me what State's Exhibit 12 is? And that's Rachel's Montana purse, one of her Montana purse. She had quite a few purses. Is that a brand? Yeah, Montana is a concealed carry purse. The so judge it has a, up here. a place on it to where you can conceal like, carry. Purses? Okay. It is a brand. Can you tell me what State's Exhibit 13 is? I recognize all of these knives. The, the buck knife was my father's, and these two knives here I had. Okay. And are these fair and accurate uh, depictions uh, of your property? 
Yes, sir. Okay. Your Honor, I offer States Exhibit 9 through 13. Um, once again, Judge, if I may. Yes. Um, so, Mr. McBride, again, you recognize them as your property. You don't necessarily know where it was recovered. Is that correct? I only know from what the officers told me when they said they were covering my, my stuff from the property and putting it in a trailer for me. So I wasn't physically there. And and the way that it's displayed, you also do not have personal knowledge. That's how they found it. They may have just posted it there for the picture. That is correct. Judge, you don't have objection to it being admitted as his testimony reflects that it's his property. Um, as long as the state's not offering it to suggest it was located at a particular place. All right. States exhibit number nine and 13 are admitted. Nine through 13. Yes, I'm sorry. Nine through 13. Can I display these, Judge? Yes. I'm going to, for the purposes of the record, I'm going to display number nine and then I'm going to pass states exhibit uh, 10 through 13. Can you tell us what State's Exhibit 14 is? Judge, I'm going to have to object to It's not the proper foundation question. I think he needs to ask me if he recognizes it, not to just blurt out what it is. All right. You I can ask your what it is. Sorry. No, just one second. Uh, State, if you ask your question, please. What uh, What's depicted in this photo here? In this Objective. photo, there's one of two Coleman Object. mini bikes that were new that I had purchased. Um, it has a Elkhorn that was a shed that I found when I was elk hunting. There is also um, Judge Smiles, cheap, skin, missed it. Uh, cheap skins, I guess you call them. We had a few of those with us. And I see one of Rachel's purses on there. The Everlast, I don't know anything about that. Okay. And the Mr. Coffee that is sitting on, I don't know about that. Okay. And can you tell me what this is a photo of? Yes, it's a uh, ashtray from Las Vegas. And uh, one of Rachel's cookwares, I recognize it. And it looks like it's sitting on a sheepskin, too. Okay. And can you tell me what uh, this is in State's Exhibit 16? It's just part of a bunch of camera equipment. It's uh, tripods. There's three of them in there. Um, I really don't recognize the other stuff around it, like the chair, tripod. the folding chair. Don't I do recognize tripods. The, uh, tripods. Can you tell me what's in this photo? I've just marked a state's exhibit 17. There's boxes full of items that I can't see inside of. I also see one of my uh, amplifiers. That metal sculpture you see there, I made that in 1977 when I was when I was in high school. It's just a welded airplane uh, with a spark plug head guy flying it. This man's it looks like, like 16, on top of the boxes is one of my uh, motorcycle toys that I collected. Do you recognize the boxes? I do. Uh, we we spent a lot of money at, at Home Depot buying boxes, so they, 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 I recognize them as the same type of boxes that we had at Home Depot. Can you tell me what's in uh, what I've just marked as State's Exhibit 18? There's a lot of items here. I, I see the bongo drums, those were mine. Um, I see one of my dad's kendo fighting gear, which is a samurai. Um, part of gear that's used for doing practice combat. And um, I also see one of Rachel's, um, I don't remember the name brand of them, but it, they were from the 1950s. She's got, she, she had about eight of them that she collected. They're picnic baskets from the 50s that are really in good shape. And our, our plan was to get them and have them outfitted with picnic stuff and make them as gifts for family members. Can you tell me what's in uh, State's Exhibit 19? My sombrero, which I, I, I did get that back. This is this is sad. And can you tell me what's in State's Exhibit 20? It's the cornucopia of belongings. I see some of my Marilyn Monroe collection. Uh, a Marilyn Monroe doll sitting on the, the counter. A couple of smaller ones down below. Um, this feather print was something that I got Rachel. It had a little saying on it. And this, this I brought back from Kyrgyzstan. Uh, it's basically a Santa Claus. 
with a um, Disney theme and pull one out of the other until you get down like to a Russian small dolls. one. Can you tell me what's in uh, the photograph I've just marked as States Exhibit 21? It's one of Rachel's Native American blankets. Can you tell me what's depicted in States Exhibit 22? Again, I see Home, Home Depot boxes, um, but I do see a couple more uh, also Native American chiefs that are on it and Indian paw that were part of a salt and pepper collection. Shakers. Can you tell me what's depicted in uh, States Exhibit 23? Um, military clothing bags. I can see partial my name on here. Uh, I had a lot of my military clothing, uh, the camouflage clothing that I kept, and I had bags of it. This little teddy bear here, I can tell by the camo hat, was like a bear that I got Rachel from well, after a deployment. It was just a, a bear that had, it used to have a shirt on it. They had stripes that I had. Can you tell me what's depicted in uh, States Exhibit 24? <laughs> I can see a box that's open, and I, I'm the one that wrote that on there. It says cool shit, and it just had a lot of cool stuff in it. And uh, these boxes look like the boxes that we had. And this wooden box was one of the uh, crates that Rachel had that she used to use for displaying. Can you tell me what's in States Exhibit 25? Yeah. Uh, I see the Ford booklet that was the owner's manual that was in the truck. And I also see a World War II parachute. The parachute's missing, but it's the bag with all the markings on it from, from that time period. And uh, yeah. Your Honor, I offer States Exhibit um, 14 through 25. May I inquire, Your Honor? Yes. Uh, Mr. McBride, I noticed that you identified some things but it seemed like maybe there were some things in some of the pictures that you didn't recognize. Is that fair? That is fair. Um, did you notice that when you went uh, through the trailer that there actually were items in there that didn't belong? A trailer hitch was in the trailer, or was in the trailer that was not mine. Um, I don't remember all the stuff. We, we threw away so much of it because it was incomplete or broken or damaged. Well, the trailer hitch comes to mind, and it was like a large trailer hitch with a with the hitch ball on it and everything. So, and I still have that. Well, without going through every single picture, if you did that, you'd you'd see the things that you recognize. Maybe some things that you don't. I'd say that'd be fair, but I, it was nothing of any value. It was just uh, I think that there was um, like a windbreaker that wasn't ours. Um, but everything else seemed to be remnants of our, our, our belongings and a lot of leaves, a lot of leaves. Cause they just left them out in the weather because you weren't here in order to be able to tell anybody in charge what belonged to you and what didn't. Yeah. Um, not the case. Uh, I was in contact with Detective Hodge on the scene, and he was saying, do these items look like your items? And, um, of course, I was telling him what was ours. And so I think he did a pretty good job of rounding up what was left in some of those uh, boxes that were strewed around the yard and a few items that were inside the house that we were able to identify, one of them being uh, like a 1920s, framed, very, very old frame, but a beautiful condition of The Last Supper. Uh, it was in our family for lots of years, and that was on their wall in their house. So that got taken along wow. with the Marilyn Monroe statues and all that stuff. And, uh, Congrats, Melissa. That is awesome. Judge and they're being offered for purpose with his qualification for the purposes of him identifying what actually belonged to him. We don't have that objection to that. All right. States Exhibit 14 through 25 is admitted. Thank you. Can I call the C's? Yes. Okay. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to just pass the stack. States Exhibit 17, 25, and 23 on the overhead. I'm just going to pass the other one. Sure. Thanks. 
So everything's so being is a, handed um, through the jury. This is State's Exhibit 17. Is, um, can you describe, is this the, is your statue in here? Well, what you see there is a metal sculpture. All right, if you wish to step down to the well, you may. We're not going to be able to hear him very Yes, better. just, you know, uh, it's for the jury to see. Did you, did you make this? I did. Yes, I made that. It's a metal sculpture of a World War II airplane, double or a World War One airplane, like a double wing airplane. It had a little spark. Oh, right sorry, there. sir. So here's the thing. That's okay. I understand. You'll need to keep your voice up and speak at an even pace because the court reporter has to take down everything that's being said. All right, thank you. You may repeat that, sir. And so that is a metal sculpture that I made in 1977. I even wrote that on the bottom of it. And, uh, he keeps getting it quieter. A World War One double wing airplane, like a radial engine made out of bolts. And that's a spark plug for the head. Above that, on those boxes, is a uh, police motorcycle for GI Joe. I collected a lot of motorcycle toys from all the way from the tin wind ups all the way to the GI Joe type stuff. That speaker is just, I had a couple of those actually. They're just amplifiers for guitar. And then in States Exhibit 25, um, is that your uh, the handbook for your um, your vehicle? Yes, it is. And then in States Exhibit 23, can you tell the jury about these bags? What are these bags for? They're military deployment bags that I had stuffed full of uniforms uh, from my military career from different time periods. I have the greens in there, like the desert ones in there. And uh, I just kept them. So I had a lot of military uniform so okay thank you so can you check the video scene again all right so we get the idea okay do you recognize what like i'm marking now as states much. exhibit 26. yes um shall i just talk about what i'm seeing here yeah what do you recognize in the photograph Okay, in in the box, there's a lot of various things, but I, I it stands out is uh, my my awards and decorations for my military career, which had, they were all kind of pulled apart and the silk the lining were ripped out of them. A bronze star medal, I see, I see an achievement medal. Uh, bronze the medal star was out of the, the container. It was found in, in the in the boxes. A uh, little magic trick thing there with the cups and the balls. Um, but I'd see one, two, three metal metal boxes that had my military medals in it. And then the other box, an American flag, um, a box that was for 45 records, which was like in mint condition. It was just a box that somebody would take their little 45 records from one place to another so they could claim. And I see one of my chief master sergeant stripes in there. And on the far right side is a washboard that belonged to Rachel, an old school washboard that kind of used to do laundry with back in the day. Do you recognize uh, any of the objects in States Exhibit 27? Yes, I do. I see uh, I see a saw in the middle, was part of it that was given to me by my grandson. I see that zebra blanket, which was kind of a joke in the family, but I have it. That uh, World War II box set of the entire World War uh, DVDs, or and uh, I see a little cigar box that I kept trinkets in, and the rest is very difficult to see specifically what's in there. Do you recognize any objects in this uh, States Exhibit Twenty Eight? I do. I see uh, th those red, white, and blue photo books. I had a stack of those. And I see what looks like one of Rachel's Native American books out on the bottom. I see a corner of it. That's it. On that. Do you recognize any of the objects in States Exhibit 29? Yeah, this is just a picture of Marilyn Monroe, a black and white photo of her framed. Do you recognize any of the objects in States Exhibit 30? I do. These, 
again, I had a lot of uh, vintage toys. I had some Star Wars toys, and that guy you see there laying on his side is called Captain Laser. That's from 1964. I had three of those. Do you recognize any objects in States Exhibit 31? I see a military strap, but I, I don't know. And I, I see one of my... Uh, one of my cards that I would carry from being a uh, superintendent had my, my rank on it and my squadron logo. I can see that on the ground. The rest of the stuff in that box, I really can't make heads or tails of. Okay. Do you recognize anything in States Exhibit 32? I do. Um, the wooden piece is upside down, but it's representing it. It was made out of wood for me for one of my retirement gifts. Uh, it was a tea tail. Uh, on an aircraft, the tail assembly, they called them a T-tail if it looked like a T. And, um, they had made it for me and it had the retirement plaque. And I see a little boxer statue that my sister gave me. Do you recognize any of the items in States Exhibit 33? Yeah, I do. Uh, again, I see some of my retirement plaques. Um, one of, of a... Uh, of a C-17 from the C-17 squadron. And they gave that to me before or when I retired. The box that you see that's shaped like a flag box uh, was given to me by um, the squadron that I was in when I was in Afghanistan. And it had my name and my rank and the deployment dates inlaid into it with like a brass. And I can see that little boxer guy down here again. It was given to me by my sister. It was a vintage statue. Do you recognize any of the objects in States Exhibit 34? I do. Uh, in the center, I, that tray that you see is from the 1950s. It was a chow hall tray that was given to me. Um, it had the U.S. on the bottom of it. I just used it as a trinket tray. I used to keep it alongside my bed. These are just the tops of uh, like conductors from old telephone poles. I had a whole box of those. They're glass, and you see them. Occasionally, they come up for sale. They're not super expensive, but I had a bunch of them. Do you recognize any of the objects in States Exhibit 35? I see my Coleman mini bike. I, again, I had two of those. Um, the helmet you see there uh, was graphicked with Monster on it. It was one of the uh, motorcycle racers of that day, signed it. So I, had, I had that. There's that elk shed um, horn. It's there, and I see one of the uh, two of the sheepskin covers. The rest of the stuff I have, not mine. Your Honor, I offer uh, States Exhibit 26 through 35. Objection. All right, States Exhibits 26 through 35 are admitted. That appears to publish, Your Honor? Yes. On well, Saints Exhibit uh, 32, uh, can you tell the jury this? What was this? Back down there again, man. Oh, if you wish to, or either you I can could, address from the here. That's a that was made by one of my squadrons. Um, it's a it's upside down, but it's it's a plaque. It looks like the tail of an aircraft with all the markings on it, and that black box that you see there had some really nice words on it that were basically saying thank you for your service and in the top i see part of a, it was like a decanter holder it was a boxer uh, like made out of porcelain so the plaque had your name on it it it, it did have my, it does have my name on it and then on states exhibit 26 uh you were describing the condition of one of these metal boxes to me um what was what's the what was the condition when you put it in, when you packed it up, and what was the condition when you got it back? Okay, um, I was awarded the Bronze Star Medal by the Army while I was in Afghanistan. That one in, in the top, and I only know because I I got it back, and it, it had the the silk, it's real silk lining ripped out of it, and the medal was found in another box, the actual medal, and uh, I see some of the other metal boxes that are in there. And what stands out is that box in the upper left corner is just one of those magic cup tricks that I had picked up 
probably was going to give it to one of my grandsons. And then I see a washboard on the right side. It's just a, what they used to wash clothes with. She had it. Rachel had that in her laundry room. Laundry room. And in the upper left corner was that 45 record box that I was talking about that that held 45 records. And I see one of my chief master sergeant stripes next to that American flag. Hey, can, do you recognize anything in State Exhibit 37? Yeah, I do. I mean, there, there's all kinds of stuff in here. Uh, the tubs and boxes look like my tubs and boxes. They're tossed pretty well. I see a milk jug. We had, we had some antique milk jugs. Um, it looks like it's mixed in with some things that I don't recognize. Okay. But, yeah, they appears to be remnants of our items in, in the containers that they were in. Do you recognize any of the objects in State's Exhibit 38? Yes, I do. I collected some Time Life magazines from, from wartime. Uh, these are some of them. Um, in that lower left, well, you don't get, they don't see it yet. In that lower left corner is a box. Uh, I had a Jack Russell dog. To, uh, I had him for 20 years. He was like, literally that long before he passed away. So I had his paws printed and I had his ashes. And a lot to me that dog so that's what that is do you recognize anything in uh, states exhibit 39 yes i do that that is a bell with a motorcycle on it. it's a vintage motorcycle that was affixed to a bell that you ring um, i see some drumsticks i had a couple i had one from uh, led zeppelin bottom drumstick um, i had one from aerosmith those are the two that you can see there Man. everything else looks that's upside down or tossed so i don't know what it is do you recognize any uh, anything in State's Exhibit 40? The only thing I see is uh, I have a rock tumbler, and that's one of the boxes that holds the the various grits that you use to tumble rocks. rocks. That's one of those grits. This guy's memorabilia, right on it, with the exception of the war stuff. Do you recognize any of the items in State's Exhibit match 41? Mine. It's he's got he's got cool stuff. Oh, this is sad. What stands out in this is is in the lower right corner, there is one of uh, garage signs that I have. It had a, uh, I could tell by the rivet pattern that it was basically a bomb with a lady riding the bomb and it said bombs away. And then I see one of my framed Marilyn Monroe life magazines that I had in a, in a frame. I had a lot of framed ones, different subject matter. The Do you recognize any of the objects in States Exhibit 42? The defendant is going to say that he that he bought these items from somebody, that he didn't steal them. So the fingerprints are going to be very, very important here. See, two things. Uh, there's a little tractor that's in there, a far, a far mall tractor. It's a toy. It's old from the 50s. And I see part of a, um, it's a skull, basically, that's inlaid, inlaid with uh, beadwork. The whole thing's done in beads. So you can see part of that. The rest of the stuff I can't I can't tell. It looks like the bubble wrap we used and something's wrapped in it. I don't remember what that might have been. Do you recognize what's in uh, anything in State's Exhibit 43? Yeah, I do. It's just one of my medals that I ISAF medal that I got when I was in Afghanistan. And this little wooden one here was a placard that had a piece of plexiglass on it that had three coins that were given to me as part of a project that we did in the military and it was like a commemorative plaque do you recognize anything in uh, states exhibit 44 hey. driver's license okay. which i look like that still do you recognize anything in states exhibit 45 i do uh, i see my humidor skateboard the guitar a dream catcher there's some Native American stuff that's in that Native American uh, bag, some more baskets. Um, again, a lot of Rachel's collection. And uh, some noon chucks that I had, and I see three of those uh, samurai swords that we talked about. They're, they're not samurai swords, they're kendo fighting gear swords that they used for practicing. John, I offer uh, states exhibits uh, 30, 
46 through 45. 37 through 45, Judge. I'm sorry, is it 36 or 37? 37, Judge. Thank you, Amy. Thanks for not spoiling it, but uh, yeah, yes. this this so, is getting crazy. Mr. Kurt Wright, I'm sure we're all following, just, just to be clear for the record, uh, if we went through each one of these uh, photographs in detail, you'd probably see some things that you described and also some things that you're not sure what they are. That's correct. In, in some of those boxes, things were turned upside down, so I couldn't make out what picture or plaque that might have been, but uh, the ones I stated were ones that I'm, I'm sure were mine. So, so to summarize, you recognize a lot of things in all of the photographs, not necessarily everything. That is correct. All right. All right, then States Exhibit 37 through 45 is admitted. Can I publish your order? Yes. So this is States Exhibit 44, is that your driver's license? Yes, it is. This is States Exhibit 43. Can you identify what that is? It's an ISAF medal. Uh, Can you tell me what that is? A uh, coalition force forces medal for for uh, for my deployment in Afghanistan in, in ten and eleven. This is States Exhibit thirty seven. They just stuff strewed all over the place. And, uh, some stuff pulled out, some stuff not. So I'll say this trash is what I'm looking at here. The items that were stored, it, it does make it sound like one milk bottle. Whoever got this took the trailer. Then you opened recognize it and anything in states exhibit 46? The box belonged to Rachel, and it's a lot of her beads. Her Native American bead. She did bead work too, so that's just that's what I'm seeing here. But I recognize that box and the beads that are in it. Okay. Do you recognize anything in States Exhibit 47? It's it's a Christmas box of, of Christmas ornaments, and uh, I definitely recognize the. The rifle case is what it is, like a little miniature hunting rifle ornament. And it looks like one of the backs of the teddy bears that we had on our tree. The rest of the stuff's wrapped up. Do you recognize anything in States Exhibit 48? Yes, this is one of a few uh, baking pans that Rachel had that she picked up. Granite ware brick baking pans. They were still brand new. They hadn't even been used. Okay. I'm going to show you States Exhibit 49 and 50. Do you recognize anything in those? Yeah, these are some of the framed life magazines of Marilyn Monroe subject uh, in there. And I, I see Rachel's uh, jacket. It's a 1950s vintage jacket. I see her, what appears to be her, tortilla press. And uh, see one of the sheepskins. And off to the far right, I see what looks like the tripods from, from our cameras. that big pan uh, that's still in the box. And this one is also the same as that. It's just a blow up of the Marilyn Monroe. Okay. Do you recognize anything in States Exhibit 51? Kind of a variation. What we just seen is her tortilla press, part of the uh, Life magazine, Marilyn Monroe. The wrapped baking pan and one of the sheepskin covers. Can you, uh, do you recognize anything in States Exhibit 52? Yeah, what I'm looking at here is that at the bottom is part of that metal sculpture we were talking about of the airplane and the G.I. Joe Harley Davidson police motorcycle still in the box. And uh, and above that is a, a Barbie Harley Davidson in the box. Do you recognize any objects in States Exhibit a Barbie uh, Harley? I do. Uh, there's some photo books. Um, I recognize the blue one. And like, again, we, we ended up getting these back. So it was just framed, framed uh, photos and some photo books. Definitely not all of them, but there, there were some of them in there. The rest just looks like tossed garbage. I do see 
this metal object that you see in the upper left corner was just a display case. It had like, I think it had four tiers with glass shells on it, circular. That's, that's what that is. Do you recognize any objects in States Exhibit 54? Yeah, vintage bongo drums, one of the kendo fighting sticks, the amplifier, and I see the base of that uh, airplane. Do you recognize anything in States Exhibit 55? It's a variation of that picture we just seen. So I, it looks like it's been stacked with things that were not our boxes, but I see the kendo fighting stick. I see the drums. I see uh, the amplifier. This portable turntable was brand new, still in the box. It was just a record player that had Bluetooth capability. And um, the box that said Tom on it, that was the things that were given to Thomas, our son, from his father, his biological father. When he passed, he had put together some boxes of things for, for him. Uh, that's what that was. And I see the top of a, of a bar stool that had a chief it, with its chief's bonnet on it. It was all done in turquoise and just a bar stool. It was really cool. Your Honor, I offered states exhibit, exhibits 46 through 55. Uh, Mr. Kirkbride, you weren't present when any of these pictures were taken, correct? No, sir, it was not. And, and you're not even sure where they were taken at? That's correct, sir, other than what was told to me by the officer. Okay. So your, your testimony basically is you recognize the items depicted, even though the circumstances under which the pictures were taken, you don't have personal knowledge of? Not firsthand knowledge, but personal knowledge that the detective was feeding to me real time as he was finding them. So That's all I have to answer. All right, then States Exhibit 46 and 55 will be admitted. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to give you a break at this point so that I can take up some other matters unrelated to this case. And I will have you all lined up. I'm estimating probably 320. All right. So remember uh, my instructions. You're not allowed to start deliberating internally with yourself or with each other. You're not allowed to talk to anyone about what you've heard about this case. You're not allowed to start doing your investigation. Everything that you need to know about this case comes from. Yes, inside the courtroom. All right, everyone, please uh, stand for the jurors. I never deliberate internally with myself because I'm always right. So I never have to have that discussion, um, which is, is helpful. <laughs> but. <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna we're gonna try to find the next portion of this. So give me just a second to uh, let's see if they do anything without the the jurors present. And then we'll skip ahead. All right, sir. The rule has been invoked. What that means, you're not allowed to discuss your testimony with anyone. You're not allowed to talk to anyone about your testimony. You're only allowed to talk to attorneys for the state of the defense. Do you understand? Yes, sir. All right, you may step down and we will be back at 3.20. Okay, so. And then uh, the court reporter has informed me that I just said 46 and 55 instead of 46 through 55. So I'll correct that on the record once the jury is back. All right, if y'all want to take your break, now's the time to do so. Do you need? Is that a good What's your client say? If you don't want right. to take your break, and then you're the quiet. Do so. Okay, so while while the judge takes care of some business here, we're going to uh, we're going to see. Oh, I passed it to you. Hang on, we're not doing that one, not Sean Smith. That's not us. Let's skip ahead. Takes care of business, takes care of business, takes care of business. Pause, pause, pause. And we're back with Mr. Mustard in the courtroom. There we go. Okay. All right, witness is taking a stand again. 
Colonel Mustard is going to uh, remain in the in the chair on the far right, uh, though he's not a colonel. You can't call him colonel. If someone broke into our trailer, <laughs> they took my RA mug, my internet ownership certificate, and my prison escape hoodie. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Throw the book at him. Throw the book. Put the code to unlock the truck inside the truck in case you've ever locked out of the truck. Yes. That way, once you've paid the locksmith to open the door, which he'll do probably in about, I don't know, three minutes, uh, you can then be like, okay, here it is. I'll keep it in the truck for next time. If I was ever oh, no, asked please about the stuff I spent years for you. I'd be able to give detailed answers to, like, ask a 10-year-old about Gen 1 and 2 Pokemon. I dare you. All right, everyone, please be seated. All right, I know we're back later than I said we would be. This is from Friday. Diana always Thursday. does such a great job that sometimes we don't remember that she needs a break as well. So while you were all were out, we were still on the record with other cases in this court, not related to this case. And so then uh, I needed to make sure that Diana had a break as well. All right. So I believe the record wasn't clear. The state had offered state's exhibits 46 through 55. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And de defense, you had no objections to those? All right. So state's exhibit 46 through 55 then will be entered into evidence. And state, you may continue with your witness. You're still under oath, sir. So I'm going to show you some more photos here. I don't have too many more left. Um, but can you tell us, uh, what do you recognize in States Exhibit 56? Okay, what I see here is uh, one of my kayaks. I have two of these. And uh, I see one of the uh, Native American blankets laying on top of it. And also that piece of artwork you see is a drawing that was done for me for the, for the 37 Ford truck that I had. Okay, and what do you recognize in States uh, 57? Um, when I re the rank that I was at in the military was chief master sergeant. So these are chief bust that were given to me as retirement gifts. The one that's the largest that you can see in the foreground is was on a on a base with words on it that was given to me from the chiefs group when I made chief master sergeant. And the one that's sitting down in that bed of that truck is. Um, is a cheap bus that was actually just given to me for my retirement. I also see uh, one of the kayaks it appears to be the same one on a different angle and, and the blankets there too. Okay. What do you recognize in States 58? Okay. Um, the, there's an orange world war one. Um, I hate to use the word bomb, but it's, it's a, it's a practice bomb. It was, uh, that's what that is. And there's also a world war two practice bomb. And then there's two tail pieces from 500 bo uh, pound bombs. They're just items that I picked up that were just man cave garage stuff. I see also uh, two of the military bags. And do you recognize anything in States 59? Yeah, these are just military bags. Of course, one of them displays my name right on it in blue lettering. And uh, I can also see the, the two bomb backs is what I'll call them, the ones with the fins and the two laying on the ground. And do you recognize any uh, anything in States Exhibit 60? Yeah, copper kettle. That was ours. Um, I see another small copper pot on the right side. That's ours. And also on the left, that's ours. And the, and the box that it sits in is just a vintage box. And do you recognize anything in States 61? Yeah, these are two of the salt and pepper shakers, Native American theme. Do you recognize anything in States Exhibit 62? I see two of the uh, military bags. Again, I can see the name on one of them. Uh, I see boxes from Home Depot that are open. Can't see what's in them. Do you recognize anything in State 63? Yeah, the Marilyn Monroe trash can. Um, that's a crossbow that was given to me by my father. It was from uh, Vietnam. Shot, shot bamboo arrows so it was just a collector piece and i see a piece of artwork that's still in bubble wrap that belonged to my wife it's a native american lady and then there's one of those picnic baskets we spoke of 
Do you recognize anything in state 64? One of my military plaques. Actually, I see three of the military plaques in here. There were two of them were given to me at retirement. One was while I was in Afghanistan, given to me as a gift. I see that porcelain uh, old school boxer guy that again it was for a drink display. Okay, and do you recognize anything in States Exhibit sixty five? Um, yes, in in the one box I see one of the lawn darts. I actually had those uh, early nineteen seventy that they ended up outlawing lawn darts, uh, and a box. I'm not even sure it was in the box. It has my name and address That's on it. It's the worst game ever. Thank you. Your Honor, I offer states exhibit 56 people. through 65. Why did they ban lawn darts? Literally, kids go throw spears at each other in the yard. I was monitoring a couple other channels, and while, while this is going, while this is going, let me just show you. I saw... That's been speed racer for you. I saw speed racer right here on the zoom on this court. It's not one we're watching right now though. I just wanted to show you that <laughs> speed racer logo here. One more time. Speed racer logo right down there. You see him anyway, back to judge Boyd's. I, I've just, I've got too many screens on my screen now. I I've got like courts all over the place. I'm watching. Okay. All right, states exhibits 56 through 65 is admitted without objection. Do I have permission to publish these, Your Honor? Grant it. So this is states exhibit 57. Um, can you describe what these are again to the jury? Yes, in the bed of what appears to be a pickup bed, there's uh, in the foreground, the closest one to you is partial. It was mounted on a base that was given to me when I made Chief Master Sergeant in the Air Force. As a commemorative piece they gave to Chiefs, I see it. One of my two kayaks in the bed of the truck. I also see another chief. It's actually Chief Joseph. It was just a bust that was given to me um, for my retirement. Okay. And um, in States 64, um, what's in the, what's in the top right hand corner here? I guess left hand corner. That's a picture of a KC 10, or excuse me. Yeah, you know, that one was a KC-10 aircraft that was given to me by the, as a retirement gift from the squadron, the KC-10 squadron. I, I ran the maintenance squadron, and then they had other squadrons that were related to aircraft maintenance, and that was a different squadron that gave me that as a, as a gift. Okay. And this is State 65. That's the box that, I don't know what was in that box. It has my name on it. It also has a lawn dart that you can see. I had the whole, the whole set just nostalgic. I, I think I had that my entire life since I was a kid. And this is States 59. Um, are these more of those military bags? Yes, those are military bags that held military clothing items. Um, and in the background, I can see the uh, the historical uh, bombs, I guess you'd call them, a World War One bomb, World War Two, and then the back pieces, the, the fins. So can you tell me, do you recognize any of your, uh, do you recognize anything in States Exhibit 66, 67, and 68? Yeah, what just pops off is this no trespassing sign. I had a whole bunch of signs. Um, some were vintage, some were military, just stuff that you throw on it garage wall, like a man cave wall. That was just a, a private property, no trespassing sign. And it appears to be our tubs. That sign didn't work very well. The wrapping that we used to wrap it all up in. I can see one of the uh, sheepskin pelts on that one. This tub has my name on it. It's Terry. I think it just had knickknacks, things in it, collectibles, that type of thing. Um, the rest is pretty well screwed about. And in this picture, I see uh, the zebra blanket that I had mentioned before. You see one of my ammo cans. Um, that blue 
bag that you see there was uh, goes all the way back to my Air Force days. It was issued to me when I was in basic training, and it was just full of military stuff, like letters uh, between me and family. And do you recognize uh, any of the objects in uh, State Exhibit 69? Yes, in this box, uh, in one of my flights, it was the ammo flight that did the munitions. This was their logo, their plaque that they gave me at retirement. What's missing is uh, an inert grenade that had a, a little tag on it said, for complaints, pull the, pull the pin. Can you tell the jury what you mean by flight? Yes. Yes. Um, in my squadron, we had um, six separate flights. And in those six separate flights, you had shops. It's like fabrication flight would have an NDI lab, non-destructive non inspection lab, a structural maintenance shop, fiberglass facility. Um, they had a welding shop, machine shop. That so that would be one flight, and then ammo flight was just what it did. It did it did ammo, ammo munitions, squibs, uh, explosives, that type of thing, and you know, and so on. They had aer aero repair shop, and they did system systems that are on the aircraft. Excuse me, you said squibs. Uh, yeah, a, a squib. Can you just spell it, please? Uh, S Q U I B S squib. It's just a name for. Uh, a charge that gets exploded that maybe sets off a life raft. All right, I'm just asking you to spell it for purposes of yeah. court reporter. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Can you tell the jury if you recognize anything in states exhibit 70, 71, 72, and 73? Yeah, I see frames. You got, you got something see what's in each frame. A lot of things uh, were I dished, see the box damaged. that was in, I said, uh, chief's room i had a room with all my military stuff in it that was the original box for it i'm not sure if these are the original items that were thrown in this particular box but i can see the lid for it i see two of rachel's alabaster eggs looks like like a like a duck egg or a chicken egg but it's made out of rock and i see uh, a vintage eddie rockspin doll that's peeking out of that one box uh, states exhibit 71. did he have both the buttons Yes, I recognize uh, there's a couple of holsters, leather holsters, gun holsters that are in there. Um, I see a book that's familiar. I don't even know what that particular book is. But I see a box on the left that said uh, it had Bali shells in it. When I went to Bali, I had brought back uh, large seashells for Rachel. And what about in 72? Yes, this was in a bag. A uh, medical bag. It's a bag probably about three feet long and about two foot wide that had nothing but medical supplies in it. So bandages, splints, that kind of thing. And it's sitting inside of one of Rachel's uh, vintage crates. And what about in uh, 73 there? Yes, this, this has a lot of military patches in it that I collected from other services. Uh, a lot of them in this particular bag were from when I was in Afghanistan, different squadrons. We would do patch swaps with different coalition forces just to collect. That black box you see was full of military coins. Um, military coins are a big thing in the military. You get coined for different things, uh, memento, mementos, if you will. Like challenge coins. And I also see a picture of me and my wife uh, in that frame. And again, that same crate with the medical supplies in it. And do you recognize any of the objects in States uh, Exhibit 74? Yes, I do. Um, the bear carving is from Alaska. It's mine. And then the framed art that you see there is actually a picture of Jesus uh, when he was a teenager, kind of a rare print of that. And uh, a picture of Jesus yeah, as a teenager? I that one back. Did I hear that right? Do you recognize any objects in States Exhibit 75? Uh, yes, I do. Um, there is a picture of Rachel's father uh, that I could see when he was a young man. He was he was a Navy SEAL, actually. And she it looks like she there's lots of other photographs and stuff, and there's one of her boxes. Uh, there's also a shrunken head that's on a plaque, and uh, the rest can't make out, just garbage. 
A shrunken head. Your Honor, I offer States Exhibit 66 through 75. Oh, by the way, he was a Navy SEAL. Yeah, he just drops that in there. My dad was a Navy SEAL. I think the jury has heard all they need to about this. I think they're. I think we're almost done. Actually, I think we're, as far as covering items, we're about done. We need to get. We need to get to the part where we start establishing guilt. We realize what's been stolen. It was basically all life's possessions, and they got rid of. They they did the whole con. Was it con Mari? I I forget. Whatever. When you throw away all the stuff that doesn't bring you joy, my wife did that. We threw away a lot of stuff, some of which brought me joy, but. Uh, um. Including my kayak, by the way. The kayak had All right, to go. States Exhibit 66 through 75 is admitted. That's it. Can I publish these, Your Honor? Yes. They only kept stuff that was like okay, mementos so and all. States Exhibit uh, 68. Can you tell us about this bag again? That blue bag, um, when I was in basic training, I was issued that bag. And in that bag, it had a stamp that you would put on all your your, your uh, personal belongings. I had to petition hard for this. I also kept in there all the letters that I had uh we're talking all the way back to 1978 uh, letters from family, uh, my wife at that time, that, that kind of stuff, love letters, if you will, military stuff uh, was in that bag. And then States Exhibit 69, can you tell us what, what was this? That was from our ammo flight, the munitions folks uh, at my retirement. They gave me that retirement plaque. And the little bracket that's there is what had a grenade on it. And so when you say, sorry, I didn't mean to tell you off. It, was just, it was an inert wall hanger, basically. And so when you say flight, these are uh, fellows that you worked with? Correct. People that you they were with. subordinate. Uh, at the, I'm at the squadron level, running the squadron, and then they had flight chiefs. And then below those flight, flight chiefs had various shops. That's how, how it was kind of tiered. That was a standalone flight because they all they did was ammo, but it was one of my flights. And then in States Exhibit seventy three, um, what, what's in? What do we see in here? In the box in the center, it's full of patches. I recognize <laughs> the patches as being the ones that I traded back and forth with the patches I had with uh, various military organizations in, in foreign countries while in Afghanistan. The box with the handle on it is full of military coins. And, uh, and the box on the far right had some of that medical supply stuff I was talking about. And in that yellow one was some pictures and I could see one of them in the oval frame was, was me and, and a wife. And like an old fashioned picture, you know, like they do those old fashioned photos. That's cool. And can you tell us uh, what's in States Exhibit 7? That one's just full of framed uh, pictures, but the one thing that I can see clearly is the head, like that Teddy Ruxpin doll that I had. Also the yellow lid that had a uh, chief's room on it, my military stuff. Do you recognize anything in States Exhibit 75, uh, I'm sorry, 76? Uh, yes, I do. This was a project that I was a project manager on, on the C-5 aircraft. And at the end of that project, I was given this plaque, that's just a piece of it. It had three coins on it to commemorate what we were doing uh, from the Air Force. And it's missing the base for it, which had all the words on it that was given to me directly. And can you tell, do you recognize this, anything in uh, States Exhibit 77? One of my business cards uh, showing my rank, my title. Do you recognize anything in States Exhibit 78? This piece right here is actually the base to that one that I said was incomplete just a second ago. It had the coins in it. There's also a bag with coins in it, military coins, uh, the the ISAF uh, coalition medal is in there. I can see a metal box here. This is what was ripped out of one of the metal boxes. It still has the metal attached to it. That's the foam that it's set in. And do you recognize anything in States Exhibit 79? Yes, this was a curio that my mom gave me. It had uh, four glass shelves that 
that went out just to put curios on. And do you recognize anything in States Exhibit 80? Yeah, those are uh, some of my automotive uh, pneumatic tools, spray guns, sanders, stuff like that for restoring cars. Do you recognize anything in States Exhibit 81? Uh, yes, I see one of Rachel's uh, Native American baskets. I see uh, one of my Sims fishing boots. Uh, I go to Alaska every year and fish, and that was part of my gear. Um, I see a framed photo newspaper article that was of my father uh, back in his martial art days. Um, yeah. I see one of my name placards that were on my desk with my name on it. Do you recognize anything in States Exhibit 82? It's a closer uh, view of that name plaque with my name on it that went on my desk. I see one of Rachel's Native American books. I see some framed art with pictures of us, uh, an ammo can. Yeah. Yes. Do you recognize any of the objects in States Exhibit 83? Yes, these were full of photographs, some framed uh, and some not. It's a picture of my son. Uh, both my sons, Thomas and Brian. Brian when he was a kid, Thomas when he was a kid. This is an Air Force plaque. I believe that was from when I went through the Senior NCO Academy. It was just a plaque that had a certificate in it. Your Honor, I uh, offer a States Exhibit uh, 76, States Exhibit 76 through 83. I'm sorry, you said 76 through 83? Yes. <clears throat> Are we done with uh, the pictures? I don't know if they recovered the truck. I can't remember this. I mean, by can't remember, I mean, I, I haven't heard. This only happened last week. This happened Thursday, Friday last week. And nobody's told me, but I, I don't remember if they told it, if we've heard that they recovered it this morning. Many items were not recovered. I, probably the ones that were easiest to sell. Defense is going to have to call a witness that says, I bought all this fair and square from somebody. Guy on the street said, hey, I've got this trailer full of belongings. I'd like to sell everything. Sight unseen. Is that going to, is that going to fly with the jury? Probably not. NCD doing well. Welcome. Good to have you here. Uh, we like to call it mustard colored right, shirt. States exhibit 76 through 83 are admitted without objection. Your Honor, do I have permission to publish these? Yes. This is State's Exhibit 76. Can you uh, describe this for the jury? That was part of that commemorative plaque that was given to me for a project that I was, uh, that I had up for C5 aircraft. Um, it says on a can bird or can do um, a lengthy process, but basically it was uh, taking one aircraft and taking parts off of it to keep the aircraft flying. For a specified amount of time, you'd keep one aircraft down while you're keeping other aircraft flying until the parts come in. And during that specified time, you'd rebuild that aircraft back, and then you would designate another aircraft that maybe had some maintenance issues. So it was called cannibalization, and they called it the can do. So there's a, a commemorative plaque there. Maybe that's where the shrunken and heads this is from. States Exhibit 81. Um, it might be a little dark to see there, but um, do you see anything in there that you recognize? Yeah, I can, I can see. I see the uh, the Sims waiter boot, uh, part of my fishing gear. I see one of Rachel's uh, Native American baskets. Um, I do notice over here on the far right that looks like it has holes in it, a piece of aluminum. That was a plaque that was given to me. It looked like an aircraft panel that was made out of rivets and aluminum. It had some really nice words on it. And... Uh, yeah, the rest is pretty well tossed. And this is States Exhibit 82. On that table, I see a name placard that went on my desk. Uh, it was in the military. And I see some boxes that look familiar. I see a uh, military bag on the ground. I see one of Rachel's mili or, uh, Native American books on that yellow lid. 
And then this is States Exhibit 83. What, what are the, what's in that? Yeah, um, box full of pictures. That's a picture of my son, both my sons, Thomas and Brian, when they were kids. There's other photos that look like they were stuffed in that particular bag. And then in the plastic tub, I can see clearly some of the plaques that were on my wall that had um, accomplishments, if you will, like military academy, that type of thing that was framed in them. Okay. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about the valuation of some of these things. Did you, um, did you prepare uh, what I have marked as States Exhibit 84? Yes, painstakingly. Uh, this is one of the, the lengthy lists that we tried to put together for insurance on, co on all the things that were stolen and the value of all the items that were stolen. Okay, and so you made this? Yes, I did. And Myself and Rachel uh, and me working together. And does this fairly and accurately uh, list the, um, the values of the items that were stolen? Uh, yes, it does. Everything in there was uh, looked up against current market and or what was remembered, what we purchased things for. A lot of this was passed down and collected over over my whole 35 years of military. So, Your Honor, I offer State Exhibit 84. Any, any objections on this one, defense? Yes. So, Mr. Crimson, I just want to make sure that I'm clear how the, where the numbers came from. In some cases, they're your recollection of purchase price, correct? In, in some cases, yes. In some cases, would you say they're estimates? Uh, no, they were they were looked up, uh, researched. Um, when the insurance company uh, became involved in this in the beginning, we spent approximately three, almost four months, painstakingly inventorying everything that we had that was stolen out of that trailer. And in the, in the course of doing that, um, we had to utilize the internet and like I'll use the top one here, like samurai swords, uh, two were newer. They were worth a couple hundred dollars. Uh, then I had two World War II samurai swords that were valued at $2,000. I mean, that's an average. And these are conservative numbers because they, they were going to the adjuster. And the adjuster was doing their, their research too on, on lots of this, this, this whole process took, uh, a little over a year to finally get settled up with with insurance and and it still wasn't satisfactory but it, it is what it is they they work they work in strange ways the insurance company so to put it to summarize through various sources and various research uh these are numbers you came up with on your own yes sir and, and you have negotiated with the insurance after that Yes, I gave this information to our adjusters, and we went through like three different adjusters before it finally went to their top tier, the, the USAAS peers, because we weren't getting satisfied. And I'll, I'll use an example. Uh, there's an item on here called a Blue Max, and, and it's a World War One. I'll just call it a World War One Flying Ace Award. Highly valuable. It's gold and porcelain, and it was given to like the highest uh, our the Red Baron was given one uh, in World War One, So this was part of my father's collection that I inherited. And the value ranged, of course, conditions, everything. And all I had was some photos that we that we had of it um, to, to kind of estimate our condition. So um, that's how we came up with this crazy number here, because that is the range for one of these. Of course, they didn't they didn't look at it that way on the insurance side. They just Googled Blue Max and it came up with a lapel pin that was $3.95, and they tried to initially say that's what you get for it, and we were like, well, we'll pump your brakes, and we went through, like I said, a couple of different adjusters before we took it up to the, on all these items, until we took it up to the top tier, and they had their expert kind of go through and quantify it, and then they had their own formulation. It can so, be worth so $20,000. was, was, was X dollar yeah. amount, what was given in, in payment was half of that. I read that wrong. So Ignore the twenty thousand one. I mean, I'm 
approach. All right. So the there's one, then era. states exhibit number 84 is admitted. Thank you, Chair. Can I publish it, Your Honor? Yes. No, they're sold to auction. Like the copy, right? I, I have I have one too. I just want to you've got one yeah. in front of the link. Some are thirty bucks, so I don't know. The trade shop. This uh, is Pure Life is not a sponsor, by the way, and I wish the bottle would move. So the def defendant on the right hand side of the the picture, which is on the left, he's he's wearing mustard colored shirt. That's the defendant. He seems so I'm not uh, going to pretty go laid back. The whole list, sir, but um, this is a document uh, that you put together that has the value of the various items that were stolen, right? Yes, sir. So at, at the top of that first page, you had some samurai swords. Is that something that you collected? Um, two of them I collected, two were given to me by my father. And the two that were given to me by my father and his collection were the World War II samurai swords. Okay, and there's some other items up there, like there's some, uh, some uh, Hitler and Nazi stuff. Is that part of your military collecting stuff? Is that Yes, a lot of that was my father's collection too. So I had uh, an SS helmet, an SS dagger, a Luftwaffe dagger, and they're all mint condition. And uh, no way do I hold in any high regard any of that. It's it, but it, but it's highly collectible, and uh, so I did have a pretty extensive collection of, of military um, items to okay. include those. And the fifth item from the bottom, that German blue Max, you got a range on there. 30 grand to 50 grand. Can you tell the jury what is that blue max? And you talked about it a little bit, but what is that? Okay, 30 to 50. It's a cross, like a Maltese cross. It's gold. It's porcelain and gold, real gold. And uh, it was the highest, it was one of the highest honors it could be. Just lean forward, just a microphone. It was one of the highest honors that could be given to a World War I German. Uh, uh, like a flyer, like 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 uh, a flying ace is like a flying ace award. Uh, they're rare, and the condition of mine was in excellent condition. And um, what's sad is that all of these high-end things were part of my very meticulous records that I had that were also in the trailer, along with all my documentation that's, that I had nothing to reference back to. A lot of us being able to put this list together was from getting family pictures, pictures from family that were sending it to us, and then we'd blow up an area on a shelf, and there might be six items we can see on that shelf, and then I would circle each one, and then I'd be listed, and then we'd have to go through painstakingly and, and, and assess a value to it. The values we assessed just wasn't what we felt, it was what we seen as comps. Um, so we kind of took the high-low, and we gave, gave the middle, if you will, to the insurance company, and we did that in repetition for everything. Uh, some of the collections like vintage uh, toys, I had wind up Japanese toys, motorcycles, a very extensive motorcycle collection. All those items were were highly valued. And uh, so a lot of internet re researching, pulling down pictures of them, um, getting the values of them and feeding all that information to the insurance company along with this, this list, if you will. I mean, we, we also gave our proof of what they were worth. Well, it was, it was horrific uh, spending our move going to Florida to be with our kids and grandkids for the first year of doing nothing but this with the insurance company just to try to, just try to get to an end. And, uh, and, you know, yeah, so we, we just, when we took it up to the top tier, we just uh, accepted what they were going to give us, and we just took it as that's that's life. And you know, so um, hopefully I'm not straying too far, but that's that's a blue max. That's what it was. That the, that was the range of value. Um, I'd have to look at the USAA one because I probably couldn't do it off the top of my head, but they actually assessed a value to it at the end. But they did do that to come up with a number to give us. So, so at the top of this document, it says it's a partial list. So um, is this an exhaustive list of everything that was stolen? No, we probably, in the course of this 
dealing back and forth with the insurance company. As, as we would remember things that were no longer ours, we would add to the list. So she kept it. It was an ongoing list um, up to a point where they finally said, okay, we're going to stop here. Even to this day, we still remember certain things that we don't have and we never got to put on the list. Okay. The list, to me, nothing on here was line by line given <laughs> given a compensation for. I believe the insurance company just took all of this, took all of our information and just kind of signed, assigned a number to it and said, that's what you're going to get. And that's how, that's how it worked. Um, yeah. But we had probably four or five versions of this to get to the final one that went to the insurance company. And the, uh, the USAA representative at, the, at that tier took that and then put it in her own spreadsheet, which they had given you a copy of that to kind of show value, depreciation, what they were going to give us. Kind of, they kind of did a line by line, a little different format than, than you're seeing here. Okay. That's, that's how. And so when you and I talked about this earlier, um, we talked about the list and we talked about how there's some of your items on the list, your wife's items on the list, but your son was moving with you too, right? Correct. And so some of the items on the list are your son's items. Is that right? That is correct. And so I'm on page, on the third page of this document. So we showed me earlier, yeah. tell the jury, oh gosh. The PlayStation was that yes. yours? No, that was that was Thomas's. So Thomas had just gotten out of the army, and uh, when he knew that we were going to move from California to Florida to be with the rest of the family, he wanted to go with. So everything he owned was also packed on this in this trailer, and it starts on the list. I believe it's actually the third, one second, fourth page. If you go right down to where it says. PS4, PlayStation, everything to the bottom was his stuff, you know, Xbox games, his stuff. He had some memorabilia from his father. And I think on the second page, you can actually see the word sons. That's, we're talking about Thomas, sons, this, sons, that, sons, this, you know, um, to kind of break it up to what was his. So on the next page, that line that said sons, Amazon Fire tablet, is that the last thing that was your son's on this, in this document? He owned it all. Yes. Okay. Yes. And so on the last page, I should say that his, his father's, uh, his father's ashes were, were part of this. Again, it's not tangible, but it was a hell of a, Hell of a thing to have his ashes disappear too, if he had just gotten from his father who passed away. Okay, so on the last page of this document, when you totaled it up, you you came up. What number did you come up with? It showed uh, total for the items three hundred forty-seven thousand one hundred twenty, and uh, truck insurance payout value they they valued it at nineteen thousand four hundred eighty-six. And, and so a total of 366.605, if you took the truck out of it, it would be 347. It's a change. And um, so if it's, is it your opinion that if you subtracted all of your son's property out of that total, uh, what would the amount be then? Would it, would it surprise you that when I did the math, it's more like 312? Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't that much, but it was, it was his stuff. I mean, game cartridges, uh, a couple of fossil watches. I mean, if you go down the list, there's nothing of uh, high collector value or anything like that. Some mementos from his father. He had uh, a little tool bag with some tools in it. You know, I, I kind of did the task with him like we were doing. We were doing the task for us, me and Rachel, trying to put everything together, and I had him do the same thing to kind of reconstruct what, what he had packed. And it wasn't much. So we, we went through a lot of photos today, right? We showed the jury a lot of photos, right? Is everything in those photos, is that reflected in this list? Let me try to understand. Um, yes, because it was items that were remnants of, of what was left. Uh, 
the stuff that's in this list wasn't in those photos. I mean, it was in the photos, but it wasn't representative of this list. I mean, everything of value is gone. But I didn't enter as an exhibit every a photo of every item that's in this list, did I? No, you did not. Did you recover all of your the items that were on this list? No, we did not. What was the toughest thing that you didn't get back? Strangely, all the collectibles, you know, I try to compartmentalize it like this. I mean, if I if I die tomorrow, I don't get to take any of it with me. Uh, Rachel, she struggled more than I did in that area, but definitely cheated our kids and grandkids out of any lineage or history of us. Because um, I, I was the historian in our family. I, I have two brothers, an older brother, younger brother, and an older sister. And I was trusted with everything. I mean, because I'm the collector guy. I was a lot like my father. And so pictures and memorabilia from, from, from my family, from Rachel's family, going back, great-grandparents. Um, pictures, videos of the kids when they're growing up, those kind of things. I think those stand out as tangible, even though they're not money assigned to them because they didn't give a penny for any of that. <clears throat> um, all the collectibles, you know, I didn't have, I don't love anything, you know what I mean? So I didn't, but I, I miss not having my, my collection. I lived in my collection. I, 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 I uh, that's what I did. It's my pastime, you know, I, I took great pride in what I had and how I displayed it. And I'd rotate my display and that was, you know, of the different things. So, so for me, it was, it was family, family photos. Uh, my father, for instance, he, he was a martial arts instructor. I have a few pho photos on my phone that were pictures of, of those photos, but his, his crowd that he ran around with in the sixties and early seventies, Bruce Lee, Chuck Norris. I got all these photos of him and my dad's uh, students with him. And we're talking Chuck Norris when he was a grand champion of Chuck Norris's walker and all that kind of stuff and and bruce lee when he was cato and the green hornet bruce lee not the enter the dragon bruce lee so he, <laughs> but i had all that and i had photo books of that that i really really wish that i still had because uh, i have no copies of them. i just had a few that were snapshots of them that are still on my phone uh of my dad my mom my brothers that kind of thing Judge. i'm sorry i need to take a quick break okay all right everyone we're going to take a break yep. all right yeah. So remember my instructions. All right. All right, everyone. I'm surprised he didn't say something like uh, my wife back when she uh, dated Jimi Hendrix or something like that. This is like he knows everybody. His his dad knew Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris. I've got photos with them running around, having fun, goofing off, being kids. This is uh, this is crazy. Let's let's see. We, we they need to take a break, but we don't. We're gonna get caught up here. Let's see. Of course, there's no catching up here, so we have to. Let's see. Let's uh, go back to here. So that was March seventh, part three. Do you guys need a break? Should probably ask that earlier. March 7th, part three. We're trying to get caught up. The verdict was on the 8th. Let's see, part four. All right, who are you here for, sir? Yes, good morning. Good morning. I'm here for Ben and uh, is that case indicted or not indicted? Hang on one second. Wait for the big defendant guy to show up. It's Jose Lozano. Could I have parties announced for the record for the state? Hank Wilkins and Daniel Escobar for the state. Raymond Martinez and Victoria Cruz for Mr. Lozano. And are you Mr. Lozano? Yeah. All right. And defense... Uh, are you prepared to proceed without Ms. Cruz? We are, Judge. All right. Ms. Cruz. Then we will bring the jury's jury in. And if your witness can take the stand, please. And just one moment. So they took a break and basically wrapped for the day, but we didn't get to see the wrap. Chuck Norris doesn't take breaks. 
breaks. Take a Chuck Norris. Diana, I'm sorry, Diana. Uh, Audrey Anna, Audrey Anna. Yes, sorry. If you can give me the number from over there, please. The Zoom number. Eight. Oh, just one second. This one. I'm ready. Eight, four, nine, seven, nine, one, one. The Zoom number, man. The break needs a break from Chuck Norris. That's how it goes. I knew there was a there was a joke in there somewhere, and I was missing it. For those that don't know Chuck Norris, um. <laughs> Chuck Norris was, was cooler than cool. He, Chuck Norris doesn't nope, do push-ups. And I will get to you. He pushes the world yes. down. I'll, I'll send you an email. Okay. All right. We are ready. Just have a seat. All right. Let's all right, for the jury. We're now going to spend the rest of the afternoon highlighting Chuck Norris jokes as they appear in chat. We all remembered. We stand for you. <laughs> Okay. All right, please be seated, everyone. And I hope parking was okay today. All right, sir, you're still under oath and state. Oh, uh, yes, ma'am. Just a few more questions. Mr. Kirkbride, uh, did you give anybody permission to take your truck or your trailer or the contents of the trailer or the truck? No, I did not. Okay. And um, I'm going to show you one of them. <laughs> these are some of these are good. You honor my approach? Yes. Greg knows anything in what I've just marked as State's Exhibit 85. Yes, this was um, when we were called out to. Uh, to recover our trailer after they found it um, parked in a neighborhood. And uh, that's me standing there with my back to the camera, kind of looking at the remnants of what was left in that trailer. So what's in that trailer at this point is just wrapping paper that was used to wrap up things. There was a tub, um, garbage, basically. It was just trash and stuff that was left in there from um, the wrapping for, for our items, but there was no valuables in there. The, the only two things that come to mind that were found in there was a couple of pictures um, of our kids when they were young, they were just on the floor, just randomly. And then there was a, a certificate of Rachel's grandmother. And she's a pure Yaki Indian, and, and it was like a, I don't know what they call them, but it was basically a certification. It was in a frame, and of course it wasn't in the frame. It was just wadded up and thrown on the on the floor. So, Your Honor, I offer a... Uh, this is tax All right, state's exhibit number 85 is admitted. Do I have permission to publish this, Your Honor? Yes. Can I just say, I think I made a mistake, and I bought canned cat food for my cat, and I don't think he's ever going back to the dry cat food. Is, was that a mistake? So was it nighttime when you went out there to meet the officer? Yes, we were called before midnight when they recovered it. And that was shortly after midnight when we actually got there on the scene. And is, is this you? That's my back. And uh, is this your trailer that you're standing in? Yes, it is. And uh, when you packed it, was it in this condition? Oh, absolutely no. Were, um, was it full? Was it packed full when you packed it? It was 
so perfectly packed. It was side to side, top to bottom, and all the way from front to back. There was absolutely no room in that trailer left. Um, I was even sliding some of my vintage signs and such on top of, of the load, on top of the boxes. Uh, do you know the approximate dimensions of the trailer? It's a 24 foot enclosed trailer, um, approximately seven feet wide and about eight foot tall. And that was full of your property? Yes, it was. Somebody do the math on square footage and, and the value uh, per square foot. Among the items foot. that were stolen, uh, was clothing stolen? Yes. Were uh, electronic items stolen? Yes. Were household items stolen? Yes. Tools? Yes. Were toys stolen? Yes. Were sporting goods stolen? Yes. Were weapons stolen? Yes. Was a pistol stolen? Yes. Were fashion accessories stolen? Yes. Was jewelry stolen? Yes. Were magazines stolen? Yes. Were books stolen? Yes. Were paintings stolen? Yes. Were artwork stolen? Yes. Were collectibles stolen? Yes. Were vintage movie items stolen? Yes. Did you have some antiques stolen? Yes. Did you have some motor vehicle parts stolen? Yes. Did you have military collectibles stolen? Yes. Did you have U.S. currency stolen? Yes. Did you have food items stolen? Yes. I passed the witness, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Defense. Mr. Kirkbride, um, I understand from your testimony that you've been in contact with various people involved in this case since the beginning. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, law enforcement. Yes. Uh, the district attorney's office. Yes. Um, and um, so as part of that, following, you know, the, the status of the case and wanting to know what's going on, were you, are you aware of, of an indictment being returned against Mr. Lozano? Not specifically. I don't think my mind would pull it up as an indictment. Well, at some point you, you were told that somebody got arrested, correct? correct. Um, and I'm assuming, well, I'm not going to assume. Were you informed of what that person was being charged with? Um, yes, I was by Detective Hodge. Uh, crime, I, I think initially he was talking over 200,000, then later it was a crime because um, our, our numbers were so much higher, uh, over 300,000. And are you aware that in the indictment, it lists categories of items that were stolen? Yes, I am. Basically, the laundry list that the state just uh, reviewed with you. Yes, sir. Do you agree with me that the truck is not included on that indictment? Um, that, that is correct. I, I don't believe the truck was. <clears throat> as well as the um, trailer. I'm unclear on that. Okay. Um, but if those items are not in the indictment, you do you understand that means that that issue of whether or not he stole those two items are not before this jury? Objection. I think that calls for a legal conclusion, Your Honor. Sure. That'll be overruled. You can answer the question if you know. The best I can answer is that my F-350 dually truck was stolen along with my trailer and all my contents in it and everything that was inside of the truck, um, which was a lot. I had it inside the camper shell of that truck where is where I had a, a newly rebuilt uh, motor for the, the rat route or the 47 or 37 truck that I had that we were pulling behind the Penske truck. And I had a transmission It was on a pallet and was pushed forward into the pickup truck. And then also in the back of that bed was uh, documentation, things that were important paperwork wise. We kept it in that in that location primarily. What I was trying to get to, Mr. McBride, is whether you acknowledge or agree with me that what the issue before the jury is the value and and of all your belongings that some were recovered and some were not. Yes. Okay. Can I approach, Judge? Yes. I want to start with talking about State's Exhibit Number 84. When did you prepare State's Exhibit 84, Mr. McBride, as best you can remember? Uh, right away, we were dealing with USAA, our insurance, and they what tasked happens? us with giving them a list of everything that was stolen. Why are you mad? I didn't see anything bad was, happen. 
an incredible task to even take on, but we, we did. And uh, so it was pro approximately three months after the theft is when we had a concluded list of everything that we can recollect that was stolen, that we had pictures of uh, to help reconstruct it. And uh, so approximately three months after the, the incident, we started putting together this list. We probably did four or five rever uh, revisions of this list in the sense that we were adding more items to it until USAA said, okay, that's all the items and then they put it in their own spreadsheet and kicked it back to us. And that's when they started doing the value uh, adjustments on everything. Now, you've indicated on this list from States Exhibit 84 that this is a partial list. Correct, because this list was given to the detective the D and ultimately to the D DA uh, early in this case. Uh, this case, what, three three years, three months now uh, since, since the incident happened. And... Um, when I gave this information, it was because it was being asked of us, hey, so what was taken? So we gave them what we had at the moment. That, okay. That's this list. And we, we did add more. Excuse me, sir. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to ask you to listen to the question and just answer the question. Okay. So, Mr. Kirkbride, my question is, is there a final draft of this list that's the most updated version? Yes. Okay. Do you know where that list is? Yes. Uh, I gave it to the DA. It was the uh, list that USAA published back to us, listing everything. Now, are you talking about the list that was furnished just a few days ago? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, approach judge. Yes. I hope, I hope nobody's offended by the <laughs> chat. The the Chuck Norris jokes are because he's amazing, and and see, make we make jokes about him because he's basically he's more he's he's better than everybody else. They're not meant to to belittle anybody. Um, is that? I hope I didn't offend anybody with that. Let me go through Mr. Kirk, right? Make sure I got the right one. Yeah. No, I just asked for advice. I don't know. I, I I hate it when people. I would I would hate to have somebody be offended and not be able to take it up with me. If you if you are offended by anything that happened in chat today, please reach out to me on the burner phone. Let me talk it over with you. Well, I'm looking for, uh, sir. Basically, that list has all the, uh, your final listing in your claim to the company for reimbursement of lost items, correct? Yes, sir, that is correct. And if an item is on that list, that means you never recovered it, correct? Uh, that would be correct. So because you you would not have submitted a claim to USA for things that you did recover. That is correct. Uh, and the things that you did recover are the, all those pictures that we went through yesterday. Is that fair? That'd be fair. Okay, so all the pictures were things he got back. A lot of them were damaged, though, because they were they were left outside. They were either broken or damaged. They did get a lot of the photos back, but also they were damaged. And could I have parties approach briefly, please? While well, they approach, let me just say I got I got my cat um, canned cat food because I I thought well I thought because it's more expensive, it must be better. But I I got the canned cat food because <laughs> he has met another cat that is bullying him, and I think they're both male cats. But uh, 
I last night he was getting chased out of our yard by this other cat, and he was he ran to the neighbors and hid over there under a bush, and I had to get the canned cat food to get him out. So, and he got scratched like he he took a scratch on the shoulder. Just there's like a little drop of blood. So it's it's not like one of those little play cat fight things. It's yeah, they're fighting. Mix canned and dry together. I get. I guess I need to get more dry. I we were running out of dry. We only have like a day or two more of dry food, so I got the the wet one. Ham that that's that's sad. I, I'm sort of the mindset. You know, if if they had if I had seen somebody who needed it, I would have given it to them. But please don't break my window. <laughs> Never mind instructions. I'm just going to have you step back up for five minutes. Ooh, jury gets kicked out for a minute. Let's see what's happening here. All right, everyone, please be seated. And you're not on the record. So, sir, this is where we are. I don't know where this question is going to lead. People are always surprised that I learned the facts or proposed facts of a case as I'm listening to it, unless there's been a motion to suppress. So I'm hearing this just as the juror, jurors are hearing it for the first time. I don't know where the question is going to go. However, if there's allegations that a claim was submitted to USAA, USAA paid that claim, and then maybe items were recovered, but there was no report back to USAA saying, oh, by the way, you paid me, let's just say, for example, a pencil. You paid me for this That's pencil, but I've recovered it. So here are your funds back, or either it's included in an a list before USA makes a payment and then the item is received back and USA isn't told, but USA paid for that, that could result in um, jeopardy. And I'll just say this, the items. Well, no, no, no. Oh. I'm, I'm just, yeah, no, I, I don't want you. They were excluded. Yes. But. Here's the thing. I don't want you to give me any information about that. I just want to put everybody on notice with that. So if that is the case, which I don't know if it is or not, then you may need an attorney to instruct you on the consequences, the potential consequences for that. So if that is not the case, then we will proceed. But if that is the case, then he's probably going to need an attorney. I don't know. Judge, I don't intend to accuse of anything, but it, no, because we got this list just a few days ago. I have, to, I have to cover those bases. No, no, no. I understand. And I understand that so you're just going to ask questions. That question was asked. But those are excluded from the case. That's where we are. Okay. The judge so stopped that. The from the final list. From the final list. Okay. All right. Thank you. The witness Always seems uh, want to make sure that everybody has all the information okay. they need. That was, that was very that. smart right. of the judge. And I will tell you, you're not the first witness that I've had to give that instruction to. Okay. All right. If that is that, Deputy Mejia, can you let Deputy Laura know we are ready to bring the jurors back in? Sure. And do you have a copy of that exhibit? I think I do, Judge. I'm going to have a hard time finding it. I, I endeavor to, to make multiples. For, uh, I had to, I started marking on one. I need to clean one for him. So. Okay. I just want to make sure you have okay. yours so the jurors. I think I do. Judge, if you just give me a moment, I can put it out again. All right. We're, we're not. Diana, just when. I'm sorry, Laura, just one second. We're not sure if there was anything that actually happened, <laughs> but the judge, sensing Everybody's the question Diana. was going into this area, she stopped it. And do said, you know hey, Diana Prentice? This is a possibility. I'm, you know, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed that I know you. You sure you don't know Diana Prentice? 
There's another. You don't know Diane Apprentice. <laughs> Ray Ray is laughing because he knows. Daniel knows. Uh, it is printing something out real quick. And you know what? Once you find out who she is, you're just going to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> no, Diana, you're going to be ashamed. <laughs> you're going to say, I cannot show my face anywhere. It was rough. Princess. So my dog just took a step on the step. It just missed it and just... Was like, uh, I was pretty much like sitting there on the steps with my dogs and was like, I'm going to call my fiance and be like, you probably might need to come down here to help. Oh, iced it down, put elevated it, like, yeah, put the like, pillows underneath it. My dog stepped on a bee. I will give you, she has a, I wouldn't say a nickname, but another, another moniker. Hmm. Well, since this is International Women's Month, who could it be? Judge, don't make us answer that question. <laughs> They're listening to us, Diana. She's also known as Wonder Woman. Oh. It's Diana so. Prince, Judge. Oh. No, it's Prentice. It's Apprentice? Mm hmm. All right, let's uh, bring the jury in. <sighs> Don't All correct right, the great. judge on her trivia. <laughs> <laughs> you will be corrected. Wow. Wonder Woman. There you go. She says, Prentice. Well, you are right, Daniel. It is Prince. Mm -hmm. <sighs> the rare, Prince. the rare, what is that? Mia culpa? say in the 70s show all right everyone please be seated all right defense so mr kirk right uh, the exhibit number one is some uh generic documents for, in, involving your insurance claim correct yes it is okay uh i've now given you defendants exhibit number two correct correct is that the uh final listing that you gave to the insurance company of items that you never recovered that were stolen from you in order to make a claim. That is correct. And is it fair to say that in that list, you assigned the values you thought uh, the items were worth? That'd be fair to say. Okay. And then in the insurance company later came back and told you what they thought the value should be. Correct. And, and so that's a good summary of the dispute you had with the insurance company, obviously unrelated to the theft, but. That's what we'd be looking at in exhibit number two, correct? That is correct. Okay. So in this case, when it, when he's charged with over $300,000, it's because by your listing, uh, it exceeded $300,000. That's correct. I think it came up to 451000 and it was all documented and quantified with uh, research, comps, documentation, all given to USAA. They don't give you the full value. The insurance company works their formula in such a way that it depreciate everything when a lot of the items should have actually appreciated because they were, they were collector, uh, collector items and right. antiques. That's so, the rules. Would you agree with me also that included in that figure is, is the vehicle? One moment. Somewhere. I'm not sure why he's chasing the truck value in here so we can get it. Yes, I see the uh, minus $19,604 is, is all they gave me for my vehicle. So that would okay. be minus that. So in, just so the jury is aware, in the, in the $400,000 figure that you submitted a claim for, how much did you submit a claim for in regards to the vehicle? Um, the, the vehicle was just submitted as a, a total loss because it was stolen and not recovered. And they do their valuation on it, which I disagreed with too, but that doesn't matter. And they gave me 19600 So you're saying that... The nineteen thousand is not in the four hundred thousand dollar figure. From what I can see, sir, no, it is not. Okay, fair enough. 
So we have a listing of your final accounting of all the things you thought you lost. And granted, you did tell us yesterday you remember some things after the fact, but that's the final list of all the items, correct? Correct. It appears that all of that is personal property that was inside the trailer, correct? That is correct. Okay. Now, my question is, is there a list of recovered property? There is no list. Okay. So when the, when the uh, law enforcement returned the items to you, was the manner of accounting for what was returned basically the pictures we saw yesterday? Um, yes, but not all of that made it back to us. And um, yeah, not, not, uh, not any of it was, it wasn't the items that were on the USAA, because keep in mind, we got our trailer back and our possession back a month after the event. USAA and us dealt with them for over a year. And that was certainly the dialogue that was going back and forth between our, our final tier, final tier adjuster and us accounting for the things that we felt that we got back that were and, you know, and not make it clear, list. Mr. Kirkwright, yeah. we're not going to go through and try to okay. make an account and make it all match. I mean, that, that's an impossible task. I'm just trying to figure out if if there's a, a third list of recovered items uh, so that we would know between the list of all the things that you lost, uh, how much was recovered versus how much it was never recovered. No, there is no specific list. Okay. So, and my understanding is you weren't here when they recovered those items. Is that right? I was not. Okay. So when the police found things that they thought belonged to you, they contacted you, correct? That is correct. And then you made arrangements to use your actual trailer to try to recover whatever you could. That is correct. Okay. And, and somebody besides law enforcement on your behalf was there to assist in that process. Yes. The person that had it stored at his house. Okay. And so, are you even aware of how, what was the process to document what was put in the trailer or was there no effort to do that? I'm not sure what law enforcement did. All I know is that I was contacted that they found the location where our stuff was. And I got a few photographs from the detective asking, are these your items? And I have my name on them. I say, yeah, those are our items. And what he did after that, I'm completely unsure, other than he had a group of folks, I guess, assist in working with uh, the lady that was at the house to kind of delineate what was theirs and what was ours. And it just basically got thrown into the trailer and uh, sat in Texas until I could arrange um, transport. Uh, actually, I should take that back. We actually flew out to Texas once it was back in my friend's the backyard and we kind of combed through everything and a whole lot of that just got thrown away right away, but there wasn't much left. It was either broken and complete or, or water damage from being left out. Okay. And, and is it fair to say the water damage mainly affected paper items, paper items, clothing items, um, some artwork that, you know, it was no longer worthy of having. Um, did, did, for any reason, did you think to document what you threw away? No, not at all. To me, it was just garbage. Um, do you have any reason to believe that items that belong to you stayed at the location of the recovered items? Well, I will say that looking at all those photographs, there was items that I don't recall ever seeing again since the theft uh, that were in, in and around the area, but there were few. It just, I was able to single in. I can't even recall them right now. I'd have to go through all the pictures again, but there's some items that we didn't recover. It looks like maybe a box of photographs and a few other things. So would you say the majority of the things that are depicted in the pictures you did, in fact, get in your possession? I'll say yes. Okay. And then after that happened, some of those things you either discarded or felt they weren't salvageable. Correct. Okay. And so did you, did you actually take some of those things back to Florida or what, what, what happened next? We, Myself and Rachel uh, spent a day taking everything out of the trailer, laying it on tarps, um, trying to salvage what we could, and then repacked it back into the trailer. And then 
we flew back home and then I arranged a transport company to tow the trailer to our, to our, um, our home. And, and that was probably, gosh, seven months later, six months later. Okay. It was, and so was it never suggested to you by law enforcement that there needed to be an accounting of what was recovered at that particular location? Not to me. Okay. Um, because so you would agree with me that we have no, other than the pictures, uh, we can't create a list of what was located at the location where these items were recovered. I didn't receive any lists and I didn't create a list. I'm not sure what the officers did as far as documenting what they found, but I never received anything. Okay. So, so let's go back to um, oh. so defendants exhibit number two, you agree was your final listing of things that were never recovered, correct? That is correct. And that list totaled up to $400,000. That is correct. And Little. what did, what did you ultimately settle that claim for with the company? <clears throat> The 231, 419, it's under column three, after they did the depreciation against it. And, and Mr. Kirkbride, we're all, I think we're all aware and clear at this point that you, you don't agree with that figure. But nevertheless, you, you signed releases saying that you agreed to accept that to settle the claim that you made. That's correct. Now, would you agree with me that you had other remedies to continue to pursue that claim? I'm not sure what you mean. You could have sued the company and said, "No, I don't agree. I'm, I'm, I'm I want my four hundred thousand dollars." That never occurred to us. I mean, we painstakingly we were pretty tore up from this whole event. So the whole year of just trying to get that done, USAA claim done, was uh, we were we were done. We were on the ropes. We were done. We weren't. We had no fight left in us. We said, "Okay, understood." We just want to get on with our lives. But would you agree with me that the release that you signed included language that suggested that you agreed that the value, in fact, was 200 and whatever the number was? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so all those items that are on the claim get the value low enough, that you I got think paid for lessens the charges. Do you have any reason to believe that any of those items were ever located at the same location as the other items that were recovered? Are you talking the items that are that, that were? I'm not sure what you're saying. There, there's the vast majority of everything was gone, gone forever. So what was found at this site was picked through basically garbage, things that didn't mean anything to whoever was picking through it. All the valuables were gone. So mm -hmm. um, what we recovered was some clothing items, items with mildew on them. Got one of my mini bikes back, got a kayak back. Um, we had some remnants of our collections most of which the glass was broke. So those were just discarded while we were in Texas. And the list kind of goes on and on from there, but it was, so I'm not, maybe I'm not sure or clear of your question. I'll ask, it, I'll ask a couple more, maybe we'll clear it up. We know from the pictures and from the officer's testimony and the person that went over there on your behalf, we know what was actually recovered from that scene and take, put in the trailer, correct? Correct. Do you know of any evidence that suggests that all the items that were never recovered were ever at that scene? No. In other words, that's hypothetical. Other than seeing hundreds of cardboard boxes that were empty and strewed about the yard and plastic tubs that had the tops open and strewed about the yard, I can only deduct that our stuff was in them, but no. Well, I think, I think in your testimony yesterday, you said something along the lines of nothing of any value was really left, or something like that. Do you recall saying that? Yes. So was that basically your way of saying somebody went through and found the valuable things and, and those things never reappeared? That is correct. Okay. Michelle, anywhere between but, five but and five thousand We don't know who that somebody is. <clears throat> Do 
yeah, I guess I could agree to that. I mean, if it's just a yes, no question. But I think that's why we're here in court. We have the person here. Well, and, and I understand where you're going with that, sir, and, and, and your speculation and your things that you could deduce. But this goes back to my initial question is he was never charged with the theft of the truck. Object to the form of the question. All right, that'll be overruled. He's trying to get that dollar amount down underneath. I had to the... get my trailer there somehow. I had to get the camper shell off my trailer somehow. Or off the truck, I should say. That's what it's yeah. Right, state. Why would they not charge for the, th for the theft of the That's truck? The all right. Is this witness excused? Uh, Judge, uh, before he goes, I'm going to offer uh, defense exhibit number two. All right. Any objection to defense exhibit number two? Uh, can we approach your honor? Yes. Uh, I can't, I cannot grade a coin. Um, it takes a professional to do that. And there are anything between five and $5,000. And I wouldn't know which one was which. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, you want to find a reputable coin grader. Cause if what somebody says, Hey, it's only worth 20 bucks, but I'll pay you for it. Uh, it's probably worth more than 20 bucks. Auto insurance probably covered the truck and trailer, but still it was, it was stolen. So this, this is what I don't get. Why the, we need to separate the, the insurance compensating him for his loss and the government pressing charges for the theft. Shouldn't everything that was stolen be charged or is the government not saying that he, or is the government saying he didn't take it? It was somebody else. All right. Defense, you had another question. Yes, uh, Mr. Kirkbride, apologies. Apparently, I didn't ask clear enough questions, but let me see if I can do it this time. You suggested that the final version of the list of all the things that were stolen from you was encompassed in defendant's exhibit number two, correct? Correct. And the numbers on the very left-hand side of the columns, there's, there's various columns, very far left is the number that you ultimately decided was the value for each item you're making a claim for. That is correct. Uh, and, and you personally came up with those numbers by doing research, uh, trying to recall what you paid for the item, that sort of thing. That's correct. And in fact, you even did research on what the value might be because some of the things were collectible and they might actually increase in value. That's correct. Okay. So all those numbers are your numbers. Correct. Put together by you and your spouse and, and, and the research. Yes. And in fact, when you made the claim to USAA, they ask you, um, do they ask you to attest to that? Do you have to submit a sworn list or you just, they just ask for a list? They just ask for a list. And how do they? And we submitted photographs, you know, okay. a lot of photographs. How do you go about submitting that? Is it a form that you fill out or you just send them what, what I'm looking at there? No, they were um, uploaded and sent to the tier, the tier adjuster uh, along with um, any receipts that we did have at the time. Uh, the photographs were a lot of the ones from, again, I would, uh, let's say you were at my house, you took a picture of me and I got a cabinet behind me and I take that picture and I scanned it and then I blow it up and I'm going through every item that I can find in the house. And then, okay, that's this item here. And then what is that worth? This is what we feel it's worth. They had a high low, usually find a high low because of condition. We always were very conservative and that's what we would add to the list. And that painstaking process was done for everything. And ultimately, how many items are on that list? Oh, gosh. I think they're numbered on there. Okay, that helps. But they didn't charge for the trailer. There's 306 columns, but you should note that there's um, numbers like 40 to 16, 45. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of, um, like in one category, there would be like under, under the, the toys. Let's see if I can find a couple here. Like se several camping gear items. There was 20. And then I had 
to do a unit cost $150, again, an average of our camping gear. And then, then that got put into the that column. So even though there's 300 and 306 line items, each line item has a quantity as associated with it of a particular collection. It was just too tedious and too much, and USAA really didn't want that much detail. They just wanted us to state and then give us give them the uh, the average cost. So if I had a motor, like I had a tin toy motorcycle collection, pretty vast collection, along with Hubleys and Auburns, just just an antique motorcycle collection of toys. Okay, uh, Hubleys and Auburn, they're just name brands. But, from the fifties, there was little motor, cool little motorcycle plastic toys along with tin toys. That co that collection of toys would range from I think forty dollars all the way up to eight hundred dollars. So when I had put them all together, and this is with the instructions that we had from the USAA, I had to do an average. So I had to average and then put a unit cost for each toy. Like if there's twenty five of them or thirty of them, I would have to say the total value is this. The average cost, if you if you divided it, was this, and then that's how they uh, was given the information. So, so to understand your explanation correctly, the fifty toys would be only one line item out of the three hundred. Correct. Like this is a kind of a silly one, but over three hundred Blu-ray movies. That's just one line item, but there's three hundred of them, and so I had to do an average cost. Okay, ten bucks each, and then it came out to three thousand. That's what the center line is, and then they do their adjustment. They knock it off seven fifty, gave us a credit of two thousand two hundred fifty on that one light item, and it, 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 the paperwork shows how that's how that was done. So, would you agree with me, Mister Kirkbride, that the vast majority of things were un, were not recovered, and what you did recover was a small percentage? That is correct. Um, that's the way to judge, and I'll reoffer. Two. All right. Any objections to defense exhibit number two? No objection, Your Honor. Uh, uh, we don't have any more questions. All right. Defense exhibit number two is uh, admitted. Is this witness excused or subject for recall? Excuse, I think. Judge. Yeah, excuse, Judge. All right. The rule has been invoked. What that means is you're not allowed to discuss your testimony with anyone. The only persons you're allowed to speak to are attorneys for the state and the defense. All right. Okay. You may step down. Thank you. Thank you. Is he uh, allowed to call stay? Your next witness? Can he stay in the court? The state calls Detective Vince, Vincent Gonzalez. Now we get the now we get the fingerprints. We're going to try to link this. Uh... All right. He doesn't stay. He's out of there. I think this is the fingerprint dude. Yeah, all right, could you raise your right hand for me, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give will be the truth and nothing but the truth So help you God? Yes, ma'am. All right, you can have a seat. If you'll state your name for the record, please. Detective Vincent Gonzalez. All right, if you'll make sure you keep your voice up so that the members of the jury and the court reporter can hear. All right, state. Detective Gonzalez, who do you work for? City of San Antonio Central Police Department. And how long have you worked for SAPD? Um, approximately 22 years now. And what are your current duties with SAPD? Currently, I'm assigned to the uh, Vehicle Crimes Unit. And uh, what's your role? I'm an investigator detective. And before you became an investigator detective with the Vehicle Crimes Unit, uh, where were you assigned? I was assigned to, as a uniform uh, evidence detective with uh, South Patrol. And what is a uniform evidence uh, detective? Uh, uniform evidence detective, we go and uh, collect evidence such as photos of a crime scene, Latin prints of a crime scene, uh, conduct a presumptive drug test, um, or collect a collection of any type of evidence. And are you a certified peace officer? Yes, I am. And what training did you have to undergo to come out? Is it a UEDI? A UEDI. We basically would take a test uh, through the promotion ranks. Um, once you're selected, uh, you go through a two weeks uh, class and uh, writing for a CSI, or then you do a write along, sorry, uh, after you do your training. And so you're trained to gather different types of evidence and to document things, is that correct? That's correct. And so I want to draw your attention to December 4th of 2020. Were you working on that day? Yes, I was. 
And did you have to respond out to go process the scene? Yes, I did. Uh, what did you have to go uh, process? I came in as a recovered uh, stolen uh, a recovered stolen vehicle, which ended up being a trailer. And do you remember what time did you go out there? Um, I know it was after midnight, I believe, uh, roughly. Uh, sometime I, it was late late at night. And uh, would it help to have your report in front of you? Refresh your memory. For the time, yes. Sorry. Sir, I want you to, you can't read directly from that, but if you need your memory refreshed, just take a moment, read, and answer the question, okay? Okay. So roughly what time did you go out there? Uh, so uh, about 11.40 uh, p.m. And was there another officer that was already at the scene? Uh, yes, the uh, officer that was assigned to the call, uh, Officer Tackett. And... Just for clarification, what was the SAPD case number uh, for this case? For this case, uh, it's two Z, uh, SAPD 20230259. And is that the case number that just sticks with the case throughout the entire investigation? That's the case number that should uh, be attached to it at all times, yes. So while you were out at the scene, what did you do in processing the training? <laughs> Uh, I arrived at the scene, I photographed the uh, recovered vehicle in the condition it was found, and then I uh, turn around and uh, search for Latin prints and process for the Latin prints that uh, I located. Yeah, and explain to the jury, what's a latent print? A latent print is an impression left from your fingerprint on a, to, onto a smooth surface. And are fingerprints left on every single surface? Not on everything. On, on, they're usually left on a smoother type surface like glass or metal. And what about palm prints? Is that something you would also process? Yes. And did you also take photographs on this site? I did. Merge defense. I'm showing you what's been marked states exhibits 86 to 103. Do you recognize these photos? I did. And what are these photos? These are photos that I took that night. And are they true and accurate representations of the trailer and what you observed? Yes. Have they been altered in any way? No. Uh, Your Honor, state would offer states 86 through 103, and I'll tender to defense for inspection. Objection, All right, states exhibits number 86 through 103 are admitted. Appreciate Granted. So when you took these photographs of, do you remember, what was the condition of the trailer? It was empty. Uh, the, the trailer was abandoned on the street um, and uh, items were, most of the items were gone from inside the trailer. And you said you also processed this uh, trailer for tra uh, trailer for prints. Where did you find prints? On the uh, exterior side, on the front exterior, right there where the tongue is at, usually where you would connect or disconnect the uh, the trailer. And what's the process of uh, obtaining fingerprints? We take a uh, black powder, non-magnetic, uh, spread it over the area that you want to dust and search for the Latin print. And then we'll take a transparent tape Put it over the area you want to get the print from, and then remove it. Remove the impression from that way, and then put in the back of a card. And, it's fine. and then, what would you do with that card once you obtain the prints? Once they uh, the prints have been obtained, 
uh, we submit the uh, prints uh, to our, we had a, a file box, submit them in there, log it in. Uh, it would indicate the location, the case number, uh, the exact location where we found the prints from, uh, my name would be on it, and um, approximately the time and date. And where do you leave these prints? Uh, they would be get submitted to the, um, for the fingerprint uh, processing. We have a box that they'd come pick up. It's a, it's like a, a lock box where we submit our, our, our fingerprints to. What's the purpose of, a, of it being submitted to a lock box? Uh, for for the custody, a uh, chain of custody. So that, that way, that's the last time that it gets uh, added and no one else can get it uh, other than the person with the key. So I'm gonna approach, because you brought something with you today, is that correct? Yes, sir. And now you didn't have custody of this uh, before today. Jack no. Bradley, the witness. No. All right, that'll be, I'm sorry. Once an injection is, is made, uh, remain silent and then I'll make a ruling on that. Uh, defense, what is your objection? Leading the witness, Judge. All right, that'll be sustained. What did you bring with you today? I brought the Latin print cards that I uh, took of the night. And did you have this in your custody uh, before today? I did not. Uh, where did you get this from? Uh, from my, uh, another, a fingerprint uh, team member who works in that, uh, in that department. Now I'm going to mark this envelope as... States 104. Now, what is inside States 104? Three index cards of fingerprints that I lifted that night. And how do you know that the cards inside States 104, that they were the prints that you lifted? They're in my writing with my name on it. Uh, did you put any case information? Yeah, it's got the case number on it. It's got the location and time. Uh, quick brief uh, drawing on it that I put to show where the prints came from. And that's oh, inspection, so it's 104. Write that down though. So, Your Honor, state would offer state's exhibit 104 and its contents. It's three latent fingerprint cards. May I take them over to our judge? Sure. Uh, have you actually looked and see what's inside that envelope? Yes. Like, I mean, like right now? Yes. Okay. And so you're, you're satisfied that those are the ones you took? Yes. Okay. No objection. Judge. All right. State's exhibit number 104 with contents is admitted. And what was the case number that's written on the card? It's on the top of the card envelope or actually the name card? Uh, both. So it's uh, 20230259, which is the same one that's on the cards around the corner. That's the witness. No question, Judge. All right. Is this witness excused or subject for recall? Uh, excuse, Judge. All right. The rule has been invoked. What that means is you cannot discuss your testimony with anyone. You're only allowed to speak to attorneys for the state of the defense. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. All right. If you'll step down, Diana, do you need to sign? No, I'm on duty. Just one moment. She needs a card to accept that. She's literally signing for a chain of custody. Yes, it's admitted, but she needs to sign a sheet that she's received it. Diana? Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, State, call your next witness. Your Honor, we, uh, we call uh, Denise Serenil.
Can you raise your right hand for me, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give will be the truth and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. Thank you. All right, you can lower your hand. State your name for the record. Denise said her name. All right, and if you can make sure you keep your voice up so that the members of the jury can hear and the court reporter can hear. All right, State. Good morning. Good morning. Could you tell the jury what you do for a living? I am a latent fingerprint examiner. Uh, for, for who? I work for the San Antonio Police Department. And how long have you been doing that? Uh, latent examiner, seven years. How long have you been employed by uh, SAPD? 30 years. And what are your duties as, uh, as part of your job? Uh, part of my duties is uh, receiving latent prints, uh, examining them for legibility, um, clarity, um, sign, uh, signing them in, showing that I did receive a particular jacket of latents. Okay. And do you have a training? Uh, as, did you go through training as part of your job? Uh, we did in-house training. Can you describe that to the jury a little bit? In-house is working with latents on a day-to-day -day basis, um, working with the unknown, uh, uh, knowing uh, to, to work the, the um, AFA system, which is the automated fingerprint identification system. And um, can you sort of briefly describe to the jury um, uh, what's a fingerprint, what's a palm print as part of your job? A fingerprint is an impression left on the surface by the friction ridges of each finger and thumb. A latent print is unknown, unseen, and needs some type of further development to be seen. And um, did two people ever have the same fingerprint or the same palm print? They do not. Okay, you've never heard of that in, as part of your work? Correct. Okay. Um, what's an ink print? Can you tell the jury, what, when, you, when you refer to an ink print, what are you talking about? An ink print is a rolled impression of each of the, of the friction ridges of each finger and thumb uh, with black ink on a suitable uh, contrasting background. Okay. And um, all right. Um, so when you when you examine a, uh, a set of prints as part of your job, where do you pick up the prints from? Uh, we on a daily basis, we pick up latents from the central uh, south from the central um, station that's done on a daily basis. Um, and we, there are five examiners. Uh, we're, we each were each um, assigned to a district of the city. So this is how I obtain what I am working on. Okay. Can I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. Oh, sure. You can uh, adjust it however you would like. Oh, it's too, oh. Is it too high? No, it's too far back. Oh, you will have to lift it up and push it over oh, the That's hump. right. I'll, I'll just take it. Thank you. I'm going to show you uh, what's been marked and admitted in <laughs> State's Exhibit 104. Um, I'm sorry, I just this? unmuted just a cough. That was late, terrible. Late jacket? Uh-huh. Yes. Okay, and uh, how do you recognize it? Uh, this is what I worked on. It has my the date I received it. Okay. And um, did you make a report as part of your work on this case? I did. I'm going to help you to have that in front of you to refer to. Sure. I'm going to hand you that. Um, can you go ahead and open up uh, State's Exhibit 104 and, and tell the jury what's inside that uh, that envelope? I ate some cookies and cream there ice cream. Three latent cards. I had to cough afterwards. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, can you kind of show me? Yeah, let me see the. So uh, we've got like sort of a front and a back here. Can you describe to the jury what's on the front of these cards? The front, the front of the card is the actual latent that was lifted. And then what about on the back of the card? The back side is, uh, it, it has the location, the latent was uh, investigation. It has the latent print obtained from. It has the uh, individual who obtained the prints. It has the date and the time. And so as part of your work on this case, um, did you examine these prints? I did. Okay. And did you, um, you've got three cards here inside of State's Exhibit 104. 
Uh, did you come to any conclusions about any one of these three uh, prints here? I came to the conclusion that they were legible. Okay. And so once you dis determine that they're legible, uh, what do you do next? I enter them into the APHIS system. Okay. And can you describe to the jury, what's the APHIS system? What does that mean? APHIS is the automa Automated Fingerprint Identification System. It's a tool to help uh, narrow the search of a print. Okay, and so what happens when you put uh, one of these prints into the APHIS system? What I do is, um, you want me to do the step-by-step -step of how that? Sure, to, yeah, just to kind of explain how that works. I, I capture the image of a latent, capture it, and then um, once it's captured, it will send me to another screen. Sorry, when you say capture it, do you scan it into, a, into the take, machine? Take a picture. Take a photo, okay. And then what? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, I I position it. To where I I feel I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, look look at it, um, clean it up, and what I mean by clean up is if there's any smudges, I'll, I'll um, block it, and then I'll come to the point where I am going to put my action points, where I'm actually gonna mark my points of what I'm gonna look for. Okay, and so what do you mean by action points? What you're looking for? Can you explain to the jury how that works? Yes. Uh, if I may, yes. Action point. So, for purposes of the record, you have a demonstrative. Yes, I do. Show to the jury. Okay. Action point could be could be a and, dot. Excuse me. And if you need to step down, ladies and gentlemen, if you're not able to see, if you'll let them know, and they'll step down. You want. Yeah, if you could, uh, I can display it here. Is that okay, Judge? I can yes. <laughs> Carissa, welcome to the gallery again. Good to have you here. Thank you so much. I don't think we're going to be able to finish this case today. We'll have to finish it tomorrow morning. All right. So can you uh, kind of walk us through uh, what you mean by that? So what I'm doing is when I'm, I'm getting getting my latent uh, um, ready. What I'm doing is I'm marking, this is what we call action points. It could be a dot. This is what we call an enclosure. I, I mark two points here. I could be, I'll go one, two ridges down. Here's another action point that I mark. If I go over to another ridge, I have one dot here and I have a ending rich here these are my points this is what i am looking for in a latent okay and that helps you identify that helps you match up it helps me yes okay and so you took these fingerprints you put them in the aphis system uh what happened next i uh, launch it into the state uh database and the fbi database okay and, and it searches mm -hmm. and what happens next i'm sorry uh, what what happens after you after after I, I launch it I wait for um, my candidates to come back and uh, is this the return that you get in this case yes and um, so did you come to any conclusions uh, after you put the information into the APIS system I was given twenty candidates. Yes, ma'am. And did you get any matches? Yes, I did. And wh who did the fingerprint match to? Uh, it matched to Aracon Jose Lozano. Okay. And you were here earlier in the week, right? You were here in the courtroom? Yeah. Um, earlier in this week, did you take a fingerprint from somebody? Oh, here? yes, I was. Yes. Okay. And did you bring that with you? Yes, I did. Okay. Let me see that for a second. I'm going to throw a... Uh... Exhibit number here. Daniel, 105. Yes. Okay, and so I've just marked this as States Exhibit 105. Do you recognize this? Yes. And how do you recognize it? Because these are the prints I took um, yesterday. 
Okay, and so what's on the front and what's on the back here? On the front is what we call the temperate. These are uh, the fingers and the thumb. So don't don't show it to the jury quite oh. yet here, but um, so okay. on the front you've got, um, what do you have on the front there? You have fingerprints? I have the fingerprints. And then what's on the back of that? Back is the palm prints. Okay, and you took these fingerprints? Yes, I did. And uh, who did you take them from? From the individual. Uh, Can you um, identify him? He's wearing a um, bluish, grayish shirt. Okay. Um, and can I see that document? Let me see that. Here. Uh, Your Honor, I offer uh, States Exhibit 105. Objection. So All we right, have States a match exhibit now, 105 right? is admitted. And so, um, could I publish this, Your Honor? Yes. Okay, so um, explain to the jury how these uh here we go so what are these two rows here what are those two just the the like going this way though uh what are those uh what are those prints of this top part is the right hand the second part here is the left hand this is what these are what we call rolled prints which i have where i, I got a black ink and i rolled each individual finger okay can you show me on my finger just to give the jury an idea, if, if you're going to roll my index finger here, what would you do if there was ink on it already? Okay, there was already ink on it. Uh huh. What I do is I roll it from side to side. You should be like, ow! Fingers. I do the following with the rest of the fingers. Okay, good deal. And let me show you the back of this document here. So on the back of uh, states 105, what is what are those there? Those are the left and right. Oh, palm prints. Okay, so if you inked up my hands, how would you uh, how would you get those onto a piece of paper like you did there? I would ask the individual to close their fingers. Mm -hmm. I would hold on to their to their thumb, and I would press down. Get as much detail as I can. Mm -hmm. and, I would do the same to the other other palm. She okay. needs like a rubber mallet to like hit on the back of the give hand. Give this back to you. See that right here. So in this case, you had um, in States Exhibit 104, there's three different prints here. Did you put all of these into APHIS? I put the palm, yes. And which one is that one? This one? Okay. And so this is the one. I'm going to mark this as 104A. So, um, Your Honor, I offer States Exhibit 104A. We're watching a different day and a different trial okay. than what she's doing right, right now. 104A is admitted. This is from last week. So this is the print uh, that Friday. you received. Um, and you compared that. This is the print that you put into APHIS. Correct. And you, you, you got the match from this print in APHIS, right? Yes. And then from these prints, did you make any determination about States Exhibit 105 and whether it came from the same person uh, as States Exhibit 104A? Yes. And what was that conclusion? They were one, one of the same. So these prints came from the same person who left these prints? Yes. Okay. There we go. The prints were from the trailer, and they match the defendant. That puts the defendant at the trailer. Doesn't mean he stole the trailer. Do you, um, do you have to get a certain amount of points to call something a match? In-house is seven. For the APHIS, it will be ten. Okay. Hey, uh, I pass the witness, Your Honor. No question, Judge. All right, is this witness excused? Yes. Yes, Your Honor. All right. The rule has been invoked. What that means is you can't discuss your testimony with anyone. The only persons you're allowed to speak to are attorneys for the state or the defense. All right. Yeah, they're going to keep Judge Boyd, maybe we approach. Yes. 
the property? Is it a property you can lease? Yeah. I do have some. Thanks. Okay. Brandy, I don't leave fingerprints. APD had the worst time getting me printed for work. Uh, just recess. Uh, then we're going to come back and we'll be back at uh, 1030. Remember my previous instructions. Everything that you need to know about this case is to come from inside. Yes. All right. Everyone, please rise for the jurors. Uh, Michelle's mixed media madness. Once again, you've got a coin that could have a very wide range anywhere between a, about a buck or so or maybe even less um, all the way over to a couple thousand dollars and it takes a pro to to get it graded you, you really if you've got a coin that you really think is valuable you need to send off and, and pay to have it graded it will be it'll be sealed in a, what's called a slab it'll it'll be locked up and in, in, encased in plastic and you could break it open if you wanted to but once it's sealed it's graded it's stamped it's got a little hologram on there um, and it, it costs a fair amount of money to have it graded, but that would tell you the true value. Oh, let's see. Handbag, 359 bucks for a handbag. Oh, I can skip this. Oh, I was waiting for her to come back. I'm like, I, I can just fast forward. I have the control. Let's see. There it is. Boom. Okay, there we go. We're skipping their break. Shells, 14 months. Thank you so much, Shells. And I, and I, and I, sorry, no, no, no. This is criminal, Vern. This is a jury trial, criminal. The defendant, the guy in, in blue, who's sitting toward to the middle of your screen right there. I don't know why I thought her name was Diana Prentice. I don't know what, my mind is, you know what? I don't know why I thought her name was Dinah Prentice, but my mind is still a steel trap. It's still a steel trap. It's still a steel trap. I I am telling you. The only reason why I know is because I'm a super Oh yes. From my childhood, I'm telling you. That's what I remember. I still remember her with her lasso. All right, are both parties ready to bring the jurors in? Yes, ma'am. All right, let's bring the jurors in. All right, for the jury. A Louis Vuitton or thousands. Oh, and also, you all can sit in any chair over there you want to sit in. No assigned seating. <laughs> Y'all want it to be an assigned seating. All right, everyone, please be seated. Uh, state, call your next witness. State, call the Patrick Nauvin, stand. All right, could you raise your right hand for me, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give will be the truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, All right, you can lower your hand. Make sure you keep your voice up for members of the jury and the court reporter. If you could state your name for the record, please. It's Patrick Knocker. State. Uh, Patrick Knocker, who do you currently work for? Bear County Sheriff's Office. How long have you worked for the Bear County Sheriff's Office? 29 years. And what are your current duties with the Bear County Sheriff's Office? I'm a detective with the Auto Crimes Unit. And so what sort of crimes do you investigate? Uh, burglary vehicles, stolen vehicles, unauthorized use. And how long have you been in that uh, department? About seven years now. And before that, what did you do? I worked white collar crime. And so I want to take you back to December of 2020. Where were you officed out of? Uh, San Antonio uh, Police Department on an academic court with the Regional Auto Theft Task Force. And what is what was the Regional Auto Theft Task Force? It was combined unit between San Antonio Police, Bear County, and DPS. And what was the purpose of this task force? Resources and and intel. Uh, we'd get a lot more intel working together uh, on all these car burglars and and uh, car thieves. And so how closely did you work with uh, members of San Antonio Police Department? Very well. We were in the same office. 
how far away would they be from me? Mm, some would be right next to me. And what type of cooperation would happen? What, what, what would you guys pull the resources? Uh, well, we had uh, our systems, our database that we could check. San Antonio had theirs, so we would go back and forth. So were you familiar somewhat with some of the cases that they were investigating? Yes. And so I want to draw, again, your attention to December of 2020. Uh, were you in contact with uh, Detective Hodges with San Antonio Police Department? Yes. And did Detective Hodges ever inform you of the case he was better? Objection, Your Honor, hearsay. All right, that will be sustained. And Judge, uh, may we approach on that? Yes. Ooh, lit a fire under that defense attorney. He jumped up talking fast. Objection, hearsay. Not going to go there. Cheryl LaRosa, welcome to the gallery. Wonderful to have you. Yes, I, I, there is a hearing coming up. Oh, first of all, Michelle, I've got you on the list. Just remind me to look at the list tomorrow morning. <laughs> uh, Zimmy from the bus stop. There is a Rust movie, Civil Hearing. That's uh, Alec Baldwin, Civil Case. Not the criminal. Criminal's coming up in July, right? But uh, Or June. One of the J months. Not January. Uh, anyway, we've got the civil case here in one hour. I will probably follow that a little bit. I'm not sure if we'll take that live. We're probably going to try to finish. We might be able to finish this case tonight. Just depends. I think they've got two more witnesses is what I've heard. And, uh, and then we might just jump to verdict. We might get the verdict music on a Monday, which would be, which would be really cool. Jovember. That's all the months start with J. July. It's my birthday present. Right, Kate. Right. We'll go with that. Now, Detective Knocker, how closely would Detective Hodges speak to you about investigations that were currently ongoing? Yes. And what types of information generally would he relay? Normally, if, if one of his cases would spill out into the county, uh, then he would get either myself or the other two detectives uh, information on it. And would that kind of happen vice versa where if one of your cases was in the city? Yes. The jurisdiction. Yes. And so were you ever, did you ever go out to a scene on December 22nd of 2020? Yes. And do you remember what was the address of the location you went out to? 13,000 block of Greenwood. And what city was that in? Uh, I think it's Atascosa. But that's still in Bear County, is that correct? Yes. <clears throat> and why did you go out there? Uh, to do a knock and talk. And explain to the jury, what's a knock and talk? Uh, it's basically when we just go out and knock on the door and see if we can't speak to the resident owner. And did Detective Podges ever communicate to you why you were going out to that location for a knock and talk? Yes. And what was his reasoning? Uh... He said he had got a print yeah, hit. Not a hearsay. All right, that'll be overruled. You can ask yeah. the question. Uh, he got a print hit on a recovered stolen trailer. And so who accompanied Detective Hodges out to this location? Why was that overruled? I did. Was there anyone else there? Uh, I had called for two, two patrol deputies. And so on this day when you conducted this knock and talk, what, what happened? All uh, right. As we arrived, uh, Detective Hodge went to the front door. I sent the two patrolmen to the back, and then I stayed over on the right-hand side of the, the residence. When you were approaching this residence, did you notice anything that you could see from the front yard in the backyard? Oh, yes. What did you notice? Uh, there were chopped-up cars. There was a bunch of property laying in the backyard. And... Was a warrant ever obtained to search that location? Yes. And approach defense counsel. I'm approaching with states 106 through 110. Do you recognize these photographs? Yes. And what are these uh, photo photographs to pick? These are of 
the backyard. This this photo states exhibit 106 is from the right side of the residence going into the backyard. Okay. Uh, the rest of them are in the backyard. Okay. And would it be fair to say that the photos kind of give a panoramic view of the backyard? Yes. And have they been altered in any way? No. Okay. Your Honor, state would offer state's exhibit number 106 through 110. Board Dodgers? Yes. Uh, officer, did you take these pictures? No, sir. Okay. When was the first time you saw them? Those pictures? Yes. Yesterday. And, and this uh, trip that you made out to the scene was three and a half years ago? Yes, sir. The treat object, but he cannot lay the proper foundation for admissibility of these items. All right. Uh, states exhibits 106 and 110 are admitted. <laughs> Judge, like, nice Brandon. objection, Trey. Nope. Now, would you agree with me that there were a lot of items in that backyard? Yes, sir. And after the search warrant was obtained, did you start to investigate any of these items? Yes. What items did you were you looking at? The vehicle parts. And what type of vehicle parts were there? Uh, we're gonna we approach this. Yes. Defense is like, look, you've got to sustain some of my, my objections. Um, I'm losing my case here. Uh, let's see. I need a RA challenge coin. We we have talked about making that coin for a long time. I need some help designing it, I, but I need help designing it from somebody who understands uh, designing coins with with depth. Um, yeah, it's not easy to do, and it's super super expensive. the uh, The cost for the dies to make the coin is the is the huge cost. So you make a sample, that's the die. You don't like the sample, you make another one, that's another die. Um, it gets uh, gets very expensive very fast. But we have talked about doing an RA challenge coin, and it's something I would like to do. Uh, we would not do one per per case; it would be just one for the channel. So we need. And it's got to look spot on. If any, anyone has any uh, suggestions? All right. Let me Trias murder trial is going to go ahead on the. Let me tell you. Uh, let's see. April fourth. April fourth on Key West. Got a couple weeks. I've never right. found a buffalo nickel yes, metal detecting. All right. Never. Uh, but really that's been invoked, so you can't yes, discuss ma'am. your testimony with anyone. All right. I do remember you asking her question and her stating that all the other items belong to them. I could be wrong. So uh, Diana will be able to see if she can find it. That's just, but uh, if that, even if that's the case, that would be impeachment as to her. <laughs> In other words, that would suggest to, to the to the jury that maybe she's lying. She's not on trial here. And we can't impute misstatements, lies, whatever else, extraneous offenses that she may be committing in his trial for something else. Do y'all want to look with Diana and see? My notes say that the, the question from uh, Ray was belief that the area behind your house was solely your property, and then she says yes. I, I do right, recall so- asking her, do, did he in the past I didn't sell things. I didn't say stolen things. Understanding was because they had bought all the items. Oh, yes. What day was she on here? Jeez. Uh, at this point, uh, Wednesday. Wednesday. This is, this is you. Just six. All right. So here's the issue, Diana. It's the his ex who testified. What we're trying to discover is whether or not Ray asked her or if. It happened under his cross examination that she said the items in the back belong to them. Am I correct? 
Yes, no. ma'am. And it's sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. It, and it's part of this line of questioning where Ray is like, well, he's, he works as a mechanic. He would buy tires, car parts, and sell them, right? And you wouldn't sell them, right, Edith? It was Jose who would sell them. That's like what we're trying to get at. All right. So if you can tell me where that is, and then I'll make a ruling on whether or not it's relevant or should be in at all. So if y'all would check with Diana. And, and let me take let me take this okay. off. Uh, yes. Oh, here's one. The judge's mic is turned off, so we're hearing her through the witness mic. Yeah, I talked to Jason and Todd the other day, and I said, you know what? I mean, the problem is, is if you come back and try to argue, because he took off from the case, right, and then All right, take your design from one of the shirts that were made for you. Um, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about, we've thought for a long time about what we wanted the coin, but we'll, we'll get there. I got the text, by the way, Big Mike, about the coin builder. I'm not sure I've got the artwork skills to be able to do that, but. Relief sculpture. They don't even teach relief sculpture anymore. I went to sculpture school. R Redford. We might have to talk. Tisha. <laughs> he got distracted by Tinder. Lots of swiping left, huh? Um, we're, uh, the judge is taking a phone call. We're talking about um, there was an objection regarding testimony about the vehicles. I th We left out the testimony about the vehicles in the back of the yard, like the car parts. Uh, the way the state is trying to spin it sounds like it's a chop shop where, you know, stolen parts or vehicles or cars or something were taken apart and parted out, pieced out. Um, the defense is trying to say that that wasn't in their yard. That was somebody else's yard. And so they're comparing the testimony from his former um, girlfriend who testified about the yard and how there were car parts or at least an old truck back there that was in their yard. I don't think she said there were car parts in the yard. Don't remember that. Witnesses back on the stand. It, there's a possibility we could do a, a coin that uses a logo with colors instead of just like metal, instead of just a, a relief sculpture. Um, so we could actually have the logo as it appears on our channel, like uh, like this one right here. We might be able to do a version of that on the on the one side of the coin. But I have to think of what I want around the outside, what words, what uh, the thickness, the size. There's there's lots of things. I had a challenge going around here earlier. Now it's a challenge to find it. Not my drugs, not my pants, not my chop shop yard, not the, uh, not the, uh, the victims, um, First, last supper painting hanging in my house. Lots of stuff here. <laughs> Instinctively correct. I have tons of Buffalo nickels. I'll hide one for you and give you clues. I'm just saying I have found, I've, I've found like barber dimes and, and things of that, that era, like way, way older, but I just have never been able to find the Buffalo nickel. Um, a buddy of mine, I went out detecting with him and I checked an area and, and there were pull tabs and stuff all over. So I was skipping some targets and he pulls, pulls up right behind me, goes over right one of the targets that I skipped and he, he dug a Buffalo nickel. Now realize I'm, I've dug some other really, really amazing coins. Uh, say for instance, a $5 gold coin. Uh, I'm not complaining that way, but I've just never found the Buffalo, which, which seems like it would be an easy find. Dad, I got a door. Hey, what was wrong with it? Ah, my son is, uh, 
he builds these uh, KiwiCo crates. What's this? Oh, Crunch Labs. Sorry. Sorry, not KiwiCo, but Crunch Labs. And he's built this. Let me see if I can turn it on. If it stops moving when you don't have to have the right angle, then you have to give it a kickstart. Okay. Which, which way? So what you have to do is have I, it I think I broke it. Anyway, he, he built this little viewfinder, spinny laser projector. What does this do? Changes the light? Yeah, it changes the color. Like that to make it work. Yeah. Let's see, we have... We're going to skip ahead just a little bit to see what's going to happen here. Oh, look at this. He just sits there forever. Okay, here we go. Almost done. Uh, no further than about a wooden nickel, would you? All rise to the jury. Crunch Labs is actually it's a competitor to KiwiCo, or the Kiwi Crates, um, KiwiCo Crates, and they're made by a YouTuber named Mark Rober, who used to work for NASA and Apple, and now he uh, now he makes, now he's a full time YouTuber and he owns Crunch Labs because KiwiCo sponsored him, and he realized how much they were benefit they were getting from him. He started his own company. Were any items? Uh, Taking into custody as evidence as a part of this case? Yes. And were those items both inside and outside of the home? Yes, sir. And were you there to help collect these items and load them back up? Yes, sir. Pass away. All right, defense. Sorry, is it officer or detective? Detective. Detective. Um, so when you recover stolen property, what is the protocol or what is the, uh, the manual say you're supposed to do in terms of documenting what you recovered? Should be an inventory list, but San Antonio police did the inventory. Okay. Well, just so the jury understand, I understand what you're saying, but just so they understand, tell them what an inventory list is. Inventory list would be any, any item that is collected will be documented. A copy should be left with the residents. Uh, it'd be the same on the search warrant. Uh, you just have a list of what was seized. Okay. Um, so let, let's, let's cover both those one at a time. So you leave a list with the actual people at the home that you're searching, correct? You should leave a copy there. And if, would you agree with me that the purpose of leaving them the list, if there's ever a dispute, hey, you took something from my house that belongs to me, not to that you think is stolen, you go back to the list. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, but and then going back to the search warrant, you're required under law to submit an inventory uh, after a judge gives you a warrant allowing you to search a particular location. Yes, sir. In other words, just go through this process. When you want to search somewhere, you can't just go because you want to, right? No, sir. There has to be a legal uh, basis to do it. Yes, sir. And would you agree with me, one of those legal bases, is, which is probably the most safe one to use, is to get a, a judge to sign a warrant? Yes, sir. And th when the warrant is signed, the judge tells you, I'm allowing you to search a house, a car, whatever it may be. Correct? Yes, sir. And then, and then you go and do exactly what the judge said you could do. Yes. In this particular case, you, were, you obtained a search warrant for this Green Lawn address. Is that right? Did I get the right street? Greenwood. 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 And what did that allow you to search? I don't know. I didn't do the warrant. Okay. Um, I, I've never even seen the warrant. Okay. So some examples could be the interior of the home. Yes. Uh, it could be garage. It's usually the usually the property uh, to include the house or surrounding outbuildings. Okay. Um. <clears throat> And the, the law requires you to actually go back to that judge and give him a list of things that you confiscated 
pursuant to that warrant. Yes. You're saying you didn't do that because it once wasn't your warrant. Yes, sir. But if it was your warrant, you would have done that. Yes, sir. What if you encounter a scenario where you go search somewhere and you confiscate like dozens of items? Or is that an exception? Well, there's just too many to list. No, I list them. Okay. Uh, is it sufficient to take photographs and say, well, I didn't make a list judge, but here's a bunch of pictures of what we took. That I'm not sure of. Have you ever done that? No. Okay. So, and I know it's probably obvious, but when you say list, you actually do one, two, three, as many as there are, and describe each item that was confiscated. Yes. Okay. Would it surprise you that an inventory list was not submitted in this case? I not a, I'm not aware of it. I don't know who was who was in charge of, of the inventory. Uh, I mean, we were out there for eight hours. So. And how many officers were out there? I couldn't tell you. More than a couple. Oh yeah, there was a few. So so certainly you had the manpower to make the list. <laughs> uh, like I said, I wasn't in charge of that part. When you make your list, do you, do you hand write it or you put it on the computer? How do you do that? Hand write. Would you ever execute a search warrant and not file a return with a list of inventory list? Has it happened before? Yes. Would you ever do that? I have forgot to put, do a list. Well, and and now you anticipate my next question. The only reason was because you forgot. Yes. You didn't intentionally do that. Not intentionally. Uh, have you ever had occasions where somebody in the magistrate's office that handles the search warrant issuance calls you and says, hey, we haven't gotten your inventory? No. Okay. Have you had law, uh, attorneys, prosecutors, other people come back and say, we no. can't find your inventory? No. Because you always submit one, right? Yes. I want to turn your, your attention, a detective, to the pictures. Um, it seems like the, the point of view is looking down the driveway on those pictures, right? There was really no distinct driveway. I mean, there's, it's just open on both sides. Okay. Now, could well, they use, been used as a driveway? Yes. Okay. Well, do any of the pictures de depict the front door? Not the ones that I was shown. Okay. So when you do a knock and talk, are you allowed to go throughout the, the entirety of the property? The two deputies were sent to the back for, for officer safety reasons. Uh, I stood on the right-hand side of the, the porch, looking down the, the no back. Object, object is not responsive. All right, gotta be sustained. So the question officer, and I, I don't wanna want quote with you, I just wanna make sure we go through this logically. When you go do a knock and talk, um, are you allowed to wander around the premises of the, of the place you're going to go knock on? No. Okay. And so the jury understands what knock and talk means. You're going at that point without a warrant, correct? Going where? Wherever you're going to do the knock and talk. Oh, yes. Walk up to the front door, yes. Because when you have a warrant, that's permission to do whatever you want to do within the confines of the warrant. You don't need to ask anybody at the front door permission, right? Yes, sir. But when you don't have a warrant, that's when you go knock and see what you can get voluntarily, maybe. Possibly. In some cases, they might say, sure, search all you want, right? It has happened. And in some cases, you might get information that helps you uh, document the reasons for the warrant. Yeah, to develop probable cause. Exactly. And, and in fact, that's what you're doing in this situation, correct? I was not doing it. It was, I was there. Uh, I didn't knock on the front door. Okay. Um, but you agree with me that if, when it's a knock and talk and not an execution of a warrant, that, that you're more limited in what you're legally allowed to do? Yes, sir. Okay. For example, you couldn't just go in the home uninvited? Oh, no, sir. Okay. And you couldn't go to the backyard uninvited? No, sir. Unless you have a probable cause. Okay. Um... Now you suggested, you, despite what you just explained to us, that you instructed patrol officers to go behind the house, or somebody did. To watch the house. 
watch the back of the house. Is that where they were able to see in plain view things that were in the backyard? I could see in plain view from the side of the, the front of the house. You could see in plain view items in the yard, correct? Yes. You, you couldn't look into the car from the front of the house. What car are you talking about? It was a red truck in the, one of those pictures, isn't it? Oh, yeah, I wasn't looking at that. Okay. There were other vehicle parts okay. there. Okay. Um, and it's not illegal to have vehicle parts in the yard, is it? No, sir. Okay. Um, so who did sign the affidavit for the search warrant in this case? I had no idea. Well, let's find it. Who signed this? He's still chasing this rabbit. The judge has already ruled on this, so maybe he's going to try to get some testimony out contrary to how the judge has ruled. I don't know. May I approach, Judge? Yes. I think the, the smarter thing to do would be to have the this witness demonstrate on a map where he was standing and what he could see. Does that look like a standard application for a search warrant? Yes, sir. Um, if you could read to yourself the, the details of the location and the, the date and uh, then I'll ask you some more questions. Does that appear to be the search warrant attached to the investigation you participated in in December 2020 in Atlas Yes, sir. Okay. Um, do you now know who did the affidavit for the search warrant? Yes, sir. Um, was that a member of San Antonio law enforcement? Yes, sir. Was that person with you when you went to do the knock and talk? No, sir. Was there a separate knock and talk or was it just the one that you did? Just the one we were there. So, You're saying that the person who signed the affidavit saying that he saw things in plain view wasn't even there at the knock and talk? Ooh. Prosecution shifts in their chairs a little bit. Judge pauses from her game of Minesweeper. Mm -hmm. How it's written, yes. Okay. Whoa. So, have you ever written an affidavit for a search warrant? Yes. And the information that you attest to in your affidavit, where do you get it from? It depends. If I have it, if another officer gives it to me, I usually put their name in there. Okay. Um, but in some in some cases, it's things that you personally observed. Yes. Right? Um, whether it was in a knock and talk or uh, as part of an investigation you're conducting, correct? Yes. Because the the affidavit for the search warrant is the officer basically telling the judge, "Judge, this is what I know, and I'm going to swear to it," and then you give me the warrant. Yes, sir. Correct. Yes, sir. And so. Do you, I won't ask about other officers, but do you personally take that very seriously that if you're swearing to something, you need to know that? Yes, sir. If you're not going to put, I think they might have stolen stuff, you got to tell them what you know and how you know it, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And so you just now told us that if another officer gave you information, you'd want the judge to know this particular information came from officer so and so, and I'm relating it to you versus things that I know that I'm telling. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, because it's a big deal if a judge finds out later that there was 
false or misleading information in an affidavit. It could be. Um, could be. Because the judge is relying on the officer's word and giving that permission to go into somebody's property. Yes, sir. Okay. So who was the person who signed the affidavit for the search warrant in this case? Uh, Detective Moscoso. And your testimony, officer, is when you went to do the to the knock and talk, he wasn't there. No. When you went and made contact at that location, was that the first time law enforcement had been at that location as a result of this particular case? As far as I'm aware, yes. Because as you stated to us earlier, you officers work in close concert with each other, correct? Yes, sir. So if someone else had some prior knowledge or involvement with that address, you would have known that before you went out there. Yes, sir. And that wasn't the case in this situation. I don't recall if I if I looked up the address for any priors. I I believe I didn't. Okay. So who was in charge of this uh, knock and talk? Detective Hodge. But he's not the affiant. He's not the affiant on the search warrant either. No, sir. <laughs> So he so describe this for us since we weren't there. Who's knocking on the door and where's everybody situated? Detective Hodge went to the front door. I went to the right side of the residence to make sure no one comes out the side. And I had the two deputies go towards the back so they can watch the back. Okay. Now to be clear, officer, there, there's no allegations that there's any violent people in this house, correct? No, I do that on everyone. And, and there was no information that any crime was actually being committed at the time that you were there? No, sir. Right? So it was just being extremely cautious. Yes, sir. Because you don't know who's there and what you might find. He was exactly. trespassing okay. out of caution. So part of the basis that allow the judge to issue the warrant, now that you've looked at it, was things that were seen on the property. Correct? Yes, sir. Were they things that, that you saw or somebody else, if you know? I saw them. Well, you saw car parts generically, correct? I saw that and I saw the camper show. Okay. That camper shell is problematic. And you saw that while you're standing in the front yard? Uh, not the camper shell, but the car parts and all the other items that were in those pictures. Which is a bunch of boxes. Boxes, yes. So certainly from where you're standing, you can't tell if that's stolen property or not. No. Or, or whether those boxes are empty. At, at that point in time, I didn't know what was stolen. And, and didn't know what you were looking at other than, and you couldn't see the camper shell, right? Uh, not, not the original. When I walked around, I could see it. When you went to the backyard? Yes. Okay. Ooh. So, and, and you may or may not know the answers, but if you know the answer, when you read that affidavit and, and it's stated in there that things were seen in plain view, who's saying that? According to the affidavit, Detective Muscoso. Who wasn't there? Not at the knock and talk. And, and how is it that you come to that conclusion that he's the one that saw it in plain view? Is it because of the way he wrote it? Okay, actually on the warrant, it does say other detectives from the San Antonio Police Department. Well, I'm focused on the affidavit, officer, not the warrant itself. The affidavit is what grants the warrant. The warrant says others, but the affidavit is what's the sworn thing that's presented to the judge to grant the warrant. What was your question again? In, specifically in the affidavit, there's a reference to seeing things in plain view. Would you agree? Yes, sir. Based on your reading and your knowledge of how affidavits are written, who do you believe is talking when they say, I see in plain view?
object to the mischaracterization, where in the document does it say I see? Well, say that. It says, oh. All right, counsel, re ask your question, please. Because the judge was not playing it. There's a reference attention. to plain view in the, in the affidavit for the search warrant, correct? Where is that? Where is that listed in? May I approach a witness, Judge? Yes. I want to make sure we're both looking at the same thing. And Your Honor, may I approach as well? Just to make yes. Sure we're all on the same page. I'm not seeing. Oh, that's the one. What is that thing with the David's there? Yes, they're just reviewing things. Let's read all that to you. That's. The problem is for the way the law works with, with plain view, it has to be something that is in plain view from a place you're allowed to be, and you're not generally just allowed to trespass um, through property. Going around the back of the house to look around some, for something, that that's not plain view. Plain view would be as I was walking past this house, I could see X, Y, Z. Now, it's possible that as they're walking past the house or as right, they're walking counsel, past the your, neighbor's what's house. What's your question? So in, in looking at the affidavit, officer, can you determine who is the person that suggested items were seen in plain view? I think this is asked and answered. Plain view would be a police officer pulling someone over for speeding and while they're pulled over looking on the back, seeing the back seat of the car. So drugs. that refers to the, the two officers that went to cover the back door. Yes. Okay. You're not one of the persons that suggested you saw what you believe to be contraband in plain view. No. Right. Because, because you, I you don't know. know how he, he referenced it. Yeah. Okay. Who, who he's saying, I mean, there were three deputies out there. Okay. Two deputies and myself. Okay. So there's a two that went to the back door, right? Well, they didn't go to the back door. They just went to the back side. Okay, back of the house, yeah. somewhere. And then you're on on through the right of the front door. Yes. And then there's one officer, Hodge, at the door. Yes, knocking. Okay. Most so, definitely. So in total. Most definitely. Yes. And so the, the way you read this affidavit is that the persons who saw items in plain view were the officers that were to the rear of the property. He's trying to prove a point that the judge yes. has already ruled on, and, and he's not, not going to go anywhere. Correct. Right. He's trying to win points with the jury. That's what it's judge. State. All right, is this witness excused or subject for recall? Excuse. All right. The rule has been invoked. What that means is you cannot discuss your testimony with anyone. The only persons you're allowed to speak to are attorneys for the state or the defense. All right, you may step down. Thank you. State, call your next witness. Uh, your Honor, uh, the state calls uh, CSI Scott Coonrat. CSI coming up. <laughs> I think this is how we're going to end our day. I don't know. We might get the verdict in here. I think we have to end here. I think we have to end here. All right. If you'll take a stand here, a seat here, please. Take a quick peek at the council table really quickly. Can you raise your right uh, hand for me? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give will be the truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. All right, you can lower your hand. Make sure you keep your voice up for members of the jury and the court reporter. Could you state your name for the record? Scott Coonrad, C O O N R A D T. All right, C O O N R A N D T. So CSL is Coonrad. Who do you work for? I work for the San Antonio Police Department. And how long have you worked in San Antonio Police Department? Uh, just under 26 years. And what, what have you been 
for the San Antonio Police Department. Uh, I'm a crime scene investigator. And is, is the abbreviation for that just DSI? Yes. Is that usually how people would imagine it from TV shows or movies? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> would you agree that it's quite different? Yes. What are your duties as a CSI? Uh, basically, depending on the the call or the case, uh, we go out, we do everything from photographs to fingerprints to uh, other types of documenting the scene, uh, collecting evidence. So, do you go on your own or are you usually asked to come out somewhere? Uh, we're usually dispatched or called. And I want to draw your attention to December 22nd of 2020. Were you working on that day? Yes. And... Were you called out to help process a scene? Yes. Do you recall, what was the address that you were called out to? Could I see my report? A copy of your report. Uh, if you just do me a favor, just can't read directly off of it or from it, but you can refresh your recollection and then answer the question. Okay. Uh, yes, I was uh, dispatched out to uh, 13641 Greenwood uh, Road. And what did you do when you were dispatched out to that scene? Uh, I made the scene. Uh, and contacted uh, detectives out there who were executing a search warrant. And as a part of processing the scene, what primarily were you doing? Uh, on this particular case, I was just uh, requested uh, to take photographs of the overall scene to include uh, some of the cover stolen property. And walk the jury through what goes into you taking photographs of the scene? How, how do you approach it? Uh, basically, once I when I get there, I kind of like start from the outside and photograph the overall scene, try to get like an address and then work my way in, uh, photograph, you know, kind of the overall exterior. If I'm going into a house, photograph the location, if there's an address on there or a, say a, an apartment number or room no or building number and then go inside, do overall photographs in there and then Depending on the type of case and the detectives out there, sometimes you know, they want specific things photographed, like so, they did in this case. So do you take direction somewhat from the de detectives or people handling the scene as to what to document? On this particular case, yes, because there were actual follow-up detectives out there. So I'm going to approach. with what's been marked in station exhibit number 111. Do you recognize this? The and, and the item that was in states 111, it's an envelope. Yes, it's a it's a disc that has uh, my name, photos, and then uh, I initialed it, put my bag number, and the date that I looked at the photographs. And in, on this disc, are these the photographs that you took back on in, in December of 2020? Yes. Okay. And are the photographs that are on this disc, have they been altered in any way? No. Honor, the state would offer state's exhibit number 111 and for this side. Oh. Any objection? Just a couple of questions. How many pictures are we talking about? Just like 290. 290? Uh, just briefly, Judge, and I can talk more to our, just so I can yes. make sure I can object or not. So, can you just tell us what did you just took pictures of basically everything that was on the property as you as you saw it? Uh, basically, yes. And like I said, I started on the outside. They had me photograph. Uh, uh, there was a bunch of stuff in the uh, rear of the uh, location uh, outside, and then they had me photograph the overall inside to include some mm -hmm. specific items that they were wanting to document. And who is directing you to take these pictures? Uh, various uh, detectives with our uh, auto theft unit. So it's things that are in the yard and things that are in the house, they ask you to take pictures of them? Yes. Okay. No objection, Judge. All right. Uh, States Exhibit 111 is admitted. 290 pictures. Hopefully we don't have to see them all. 
because we probably won't see any of them. We need to uh, enhance the picture, the reflection of the judge's glasses. I'm not sure what she's doing, but. Now, I'm gonna show you what was previously marked student exhibits number three, 83. Now, I'd like you to take a brief moment just to kind of take a look through some of these photographs and see if you recognize any of them. Three through 83. What should we do while he looks through 80 pictures? Let's see, here's some more car parts. Here's some boxes. There's a box of arrowheads. Looks like a Marilyn Monroe collection. Uh, here we have a, uh, a chief. Just watching the stream, she's a fan. I don't think she is. I'm looking at her reflection in her eyes, and I, I can see major changes in the the image on the screen. So it's, whatever she's watching is full screen, and it's not boxed like uh, like a Zoom box. She's full on on the web. I think she's I think she's browsing. She says she doesn't buy her own bags. Her mom buys them for her. I zoomed in. It looks very boring. <laughs> it's could be paperwork. I think she got all caught up on all her paperwork. She's like signed all the bench warrants. She's ready to go. She's on Twitch. Old law and order with a sound off. She's just got uh, closed captioning on so she can't look away from the screen or else she'll miss something. Zero color. Yeah, I don't think he's watching a video. Could be reading motions. That's always a good idea during a break. She's on Facebook. No, I don't I don't think so. It it is like all single color text. Now she's writing. I think she's feeling Sarah Boone's latest letter. Aha. CSI is still uh, browsing pictures. You know what we're going to do? Oh, I was going to say we're going to fast forward because. Yes, those are all pictures of various uh, items and stuff that I was requested to put on. And you took photographs of those items at the address at, on Greenwood. Is that correct? Yes. Pass the witness. No questions. All right, is this witness excused? Yes, Your Honor. All right, the rule has been invoked. What that means is you cannot discuss your testimony with anyone. The only persons you're allowed to speak to are attorneys for the state of the defense. Yes. You may step down. State, call your next witness. State, yes, Your Honor. Defense. Boom, boom, boom. We have a motion we'd like to present to the court. All right. Jury leave. Uh, can I have both parties approach, please? The motion is directed verdict. He does the kill signal. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the kill signal or the oh, we're screwed signal, right? We're going to skip ahead because they take forever on these motions. Let's see. Nope. Don't skip that far right there. There we go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to let you all enjoy your lunch break at this time. Ooh, late and lunch. I'm going to have you all come back at one. I think that'll give you plenty of time to walk around downtown and find a place that maybe is not as expensive. If you go off the beaten path, uh, it's less expensive and you can grab a sandwich or something and just enjoy the river walk. I think there was some rain or something last night. So all of the pollen and whatever's out may have been washed away. 
So uh, we'll come back at one. Remember my instructions. You're not allowed to talk about this case to anyone. You're not allowed to start internally, you know, thinking about the case with yourself or discussing it with each other. If you see anything or hear anything, you're to ignore it. Make sure your badges are visible because sometimes anything you hear, uh, attorneys will talk about cases. But if they see that the jurors around, they will not remember everything that you need to know about this case is to come from. <laughs> All right. All right, everyone, please rise for the jurors. <laughs> As the jury leaves, we the only thing we have left. Well, let's give it just a minute here. We've got the motion. Do you have rested and defense? You have a motion. Yes, sir. We'd like to move for an instructed verdict on the indictment as it's set out before the court. Instructed verdict, directed right. verdict. And well, judge, the stip I mean the evidence that's uncontroverted from the complainant himself was that the value in total was way less than $300,000. Uh, even though he moaned and groaned and complained about what he settled for, bottom line is he acknowledged and he signed a document where he agreed in the settlement of his case that the value and the worth of the items that were stolen from him were way under 300000 I think the exhibit that's been admitted into evidence suggests $214,000. Okay. All right. And, and I'm sorry, Judge, there was one other point. He also said there was nothing of any value that was in the items that were returned to him, which the only evidence of items that my client was ever in possession of was what was taken from his property. All right, and state. Your Honor, we oppose the motion. Uh, all we need is a scintilla of evidence to uh, get past this motion, Judge. And so the evidence, uh, I think uh, there's enough evidence in front of the jury that um, they could find uh, any guilty based on the facts and evidence. Uh, they can make reasonable inferences from the evidence that, that's been presented. Uh, also, in this document, uh, the RCB uh, value is uh, over $400,000, which is what USA values the property at. So, I mean, the, the settlement value may be less, but the, the value that USA said, hey, these, this is what these things are worth, that's higher. Uh, than the minimum amount we need to reach, Your Honor. So for those reasons, we uh, ask that you deny the defense's motion. I, I, I couldn't disagree more, Judge. That's not what that document says. It says, if you read it completely all the way to its end, it gives you the actual cash value. And for purposes of theft, it's the value of the item at the time that it's uh, stolen, not what you might have paid for it before. Um, so they negotiated to the actual value and that's what he settled for, and that's what he accepted. Yes. All right. So which exhibit number is this, please? And it's two, Jack. Yes, ma'am. All right. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take our break so Diana can have a break. I'm going to review at, uh, defense exhibit number two, and I'm going to have you all back here at 1230. I have emailed you all the jury charge. Well, you know what? Let's say 1245. Because I've emailed both parties the jury charge and I will come back with my ruling. But please review the jury charge and let the court know if there's anything you want added or subtracted. What I can tell you is what's in the jury charge are lessers if anyone wishes to have lessers. And also the issue with regards to the search warrant is in the charge as well. So, Judge, we haven't gotten on the record yet. Who's asking for lessers? No, I'm just saying what I do with the jury charge is I put everything in the jury charge. You all can review it and then you can make a decision on what you don't want in it or what you do want in it. If you don't come up with an agreement, then I'll make a ruling on that. So far, nobody has asked for anything. So far, you haven't asked for anything as it relates to the search warrant. The state hasn't asked for lesser included, but I've just given that to you all. So you all can review it during the break. And then when we come back from the break, I will uh, give you my answer with regards to your motion. And also, if I rule against your motion, then you all will have already reviewed the jury charge. That's all, the court's only point, because I don't want the jury to be waiting. OK, and the only other thing, Judge, I guess, on this particular uh, matter is we, we have the defense exhibit two has one set of numbers and then uh, States Exhibit 84 
uh, also has a different set of numbers. So I think that's a question of fact that the jury needs to consider. Doing. All right. So for me to make my ruling, if I could please see the defense exhibit that you're speaking of with the value and also the state's exhibit. And with that being said, we're going to take our recess. We're going to come back at 1245 at that time. If there are some issues with the jury charge, everyone needs to let me know what those issues are. And at 1245, I will come back with my ruling on this. Yes, ma'am. And, and Judge, since you're going to be looking at those things, let me just make sure that the record's clear. I'd ask the court also to revisit your ruling on the motion to suppress in light of Officer Knocker's testimony. He clearly stated that the plain view only occurs when somebody goes into the backyard. Um, he also suggested um, that the person who requested the search warrant is not the affiant. And finally, he also suggested that uh, the law requires and policy requires an inventory to be returned, which was not done in this case at all. All right. So with regards to the law, the court knows the law. But with regards to your stating that the affiant who obtained the warrant, are you saying that the affiant was untruthful in the request for the search warrant? Well, Careful. I think he was. I think he was misleading and ambiguous about certain issues. For example, the plain view. He doesn't say how they saw, plain view from where. Like how. Mm -hmm. So I, I could see where the court could interpret. They saw that in a way that was not uh, violative of the Fourth Amendment. But are you saying that the affiant was untruthful? That's what I need to know. You have to say yes if that's your because position. If, you, if I had to pick, I would. I would say yes because he's, he's uh, misleading and untruthful are just two ways to say the same thing. He didn't give the court truthful information that that the, the persons who saw things in plain view were officers who were placed where they weren't supposed to be and and officer knocker who was there saw them doing that as a matter of fact he suggested he he told them to go back there where they weren't supposed to be and then use the information that they obtained um, so yes I, I would say that's exactly what he told us that and and he's he demonstrated his very clear understanding of, of how search warrants are done how they're obtained, what's required to be in the affidavit. He's very knowledgeable because he's done this many times. And I think he even acknowledged himself, uh, you know, okay. maybe we kind of bent some rules there. All right. Judge, I don't think that's supported by the record with the Edith Serrano's testimony. She says that that backyard uh, is a shared space between at least three houses. Uh, there's no uh, fencing back there that, uh, that sections off uh, the defendant and, and Edith's backyard. Um, I, and then with the detective's testimony, he says uh, he went back there. Uh, you could see from where he was uh, uh, on the side of the house in plain view, these items strewn about. And so, Judge, I think your earlier ru ruling um, on this matter is, is what you control here, where you excise portions of the, of the warrant or the affidavit for the warrant and still found sufficient probable cause. And, and that's what I think we should go with, Judge. All right. So with regards to... Uh, revisiting the motion to suppress as it relates to the search warrant. Um, the court has heard the arguments from both parties. Uh, the court's previous ruling will stand. Yep. <laughs> I did have a chance to review defendant's exhibit number two and state's exhibit number 84. Both of those were admitted into evidence. What is in defense exhibit number two is a document that has USAA at the top of it. And it has a claim, a net claim remaining of $137,397.29. States exhibit number 84 has in it a total value of $366,605. So with regards to uh, your request for a directive verdict that will be denied. All right, so we will come back at 1245. If y'all will look over the jury charge and let me know if you're in agreement with it or if there's something else you want added or taken away, let the court know. And of course, that is not the final charge. That is just the court putting everything in the charge that potentially may be asked for by both parties.
I have not made up my mind or intend to make a ruling that that is the final charge. That's just an anticipating what I thought maybe both parties would be asking for. If it's something you do not wish to be in the charge, just let the court know. Does everyone understand? Yes, ma'am. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank We're going to go on recess. So they go on recess. Um, all we have left is the verdict, the verdict uh, video, which is also. Oops. Oh, no, oh, don't, don't, don't do that. I didn't mean to click that button, so it shouldn't matter. You should do what I meant, not what I did. Um, let's see. Three. I need that up here. All right, all right, all right. No, I don't want to give everybody an ad right now. That would be terrible. Um, hold tight. We're waiting for the last of this. It's jury selection verdict. That was, we were just in part five, right? That was part five that we just ended. Now we're in the, this part right here. Okay. I'll come back and, and speak with you briefly. Wait, wait, wait. All right, everyone, wait, wait, please. Wait, wait, wait. Here we go. 187th. Playback speed, we're going to increase just a tiny bit. And we'll skip ahead to where it starts to the good stuff. There we go. All right, so everyone, uh, Deputy Laura informed me that they buzzed for a verdict. Okay, okay. So she's going to line them up. Whoa, Are both whoa, parties whoa, ready? Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, 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 wait. Where's the closing? I mean, as much as I want a verdict, where's the closing? <sighs> I've got one job on the ship. Um, okay, live. Where's the verdict? Right there. We were on day four. Or are we supposed to go to day five? That was that day four. We're closing. All right. Have them send someone with okay. more experience. Don't 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 start that now. Don't start that now, Lee. I see what you're doing. Okay. Let's see if this is the right one. Ready? Oh man, this has been this has been a rough day for me. All right, everyone, please be seated. So that the record can be clear, the last exhibit offered by the states were states exhibits 106 through 110. Is that correct? Uh, judge, I believe it was also states 111 with the uh, disc photos. And also states exhibit number 111. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. And defense, I believe you had no objections to those exhibits. Is that correct? No spoilers. Right, so no spoilers. just so the record is clear, states exhibits 106 through 110 are admitted and states exhibit number 111 is admitted as well. And uh, with that state, do you rest? Yes, ma'am. We rest. All right. Defense. Yes, state, do you close? Yes, ma'am. We close. Defense. Yes, okay. Okay, so we'll straight right. to closings. Ladies no defense. and gentlemen, what's going to happen now? Both uh, sides have rested and closed. I'm going to read to you the jury charge or what's called the charge of the court. You do not have to memorize that. You don't even have to listen. Uh, you will be oh, wait, given no, you do. Uh, you do. my copy take to take back. back with you to the jury room. Charge of the court. Members of the jury, the defendant, Jose Lozano, stands charged by indictment with the offense of theft, $300,000 or more, alleged to have been committed on or about the fourth day of December 2020 in Bear County, Texas. The defendant has pleaded not guilty. One, our law provides that a person commits the offense of theft if he unlawfully appropriates property with intent to deprive the owner of property. Appropriation of property is unlawful if it is without the owner's effective consent. Two, appropriation and appropriate mean to acquire or otherwise exercise control over property other than real property. Property means tangible or intangible personal property or documents, including money that represents or embodies anything of value. Deprived means to withhold property from the owner permanently or for so extended a period of time that a major portion of the value or enjoyment of the property is lost to the owner. 
Effective consent means assent in fact, whether express or apparent, and includes consent by a person legally authorized to act for the owner. Consent is not effective if induced by deception or coercion. Owner means a person who has title to the property, possession of the property, or a greater right to possession of the property than the person charged. Value is one, the fair market value of the property at the time and place of the offense, or two, if the fair market value of the property can not be ascertained, the cost of replacing the property within a reasonable time after the theft. Three, a person acts intentionally or with intent with respect to the nature of his conduct or to a result of his conduct when it is his conscious objective or desire to engage in the conduct or cause the result. Four, now if you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the fourth day of December 2020 in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose Lozano, with intent to deprive the owner, Terry Kirkbride, of property, namely clothing, electronic items, household items, tools, toys, sporting goods, weapons, fashion accessories, jewelry, magazines, books, paintings, artwork, collectibles, vintage movie items, antiques, motor vehicle parts, military collectibles, United States currency, and or food items did then and there unlawfully without the effective consent of the owner, Terry Kirkbride, appropriate said, said property by acquiring or otherwise exercising control over said property, said property being other than real property, which had a value of $300,000 or more, then you will find the defendant guilty of the offense of theft, $300,000 or more, as charged in the indictment, and do not consider any lesser included offenses of theft as instructed in paragraphs five through seven, but instead proceed to paragraph eight. If you do not so find beyond a reasonable doubt, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will acquit the defendant of the offense of theft, $300,000 or more, as charged in the indictment, say by your verdict, not guilty of the charged offense of theft, $300,000 or more, and proceed to paragraph five to consider whether the defendant is guilty of the lesser included offense of theft, $150,000 or more, but less than $300,000. Five, now if you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the fourth day of December, 2020, in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose Lozano, with intent to deprive the owner, Terry Kirkbride, of property, namely clothing, electronic items, household items, tools, toys, sporting goods, weapons, fashion accessories, jewelry, magazines, books, paintings, artwork, collectibles, vintage movie items, antiques, motor vehicle parts, military collectibles, United States currency, and or food items did then and there unlawfully without the effective consent of the owner, Terry Kirk Kirkbride, appropriate said property by acquiring or otherwise exercising control over said property, said property being other than real property, which had a value of $150,000 or more, but less than $300,000, then you will find the defendant guilty of the less included offense of theft, $150,000 or more, but less than $300,000, and do not consider any lesser included offenses of theft as instructed in paragraph six and seven, but instead proceed to paragraph eight. If you do not so find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will acquit the defendant of the lesser included offense of theft, $150,000 or more, but less than $300,000, say by your verdict, not guilty of the lesser included offense of theft, $150,000 or more, but less than $300,000, and proceed to paragraph six to consider whether the defendant is guilty of the lesser included offense of theft, $30,000 or more, but less than $150,000. Six. Now, if you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the fourth day of December 2020 in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose Lozano, with intent to deprive the owner, Terry Kirkbride, of property, namely clothing, Jose. electronic items, household items, tools, toys, sporting goods, weapons, fashion accessories, jewelry, magazines, books, paintings, artwork, collectibles, vintage movie items, antiques, motor vehicle parts, military collectibles, toys. United States currency, and or food items did then and there unlawfully without the effective consent of the owner, Terry Kirkbride, appropriate said property by acquiring or otherwise exercising control over said property, said property being other than real property, which had a value of $30,000 or more, but less than $150,000, then you will find the defendant guilty of the less included offense of theft, $30,000 or more, but less than $150,000, and do not consider the less included offense of theft as instructed in paragraph seven, but instead proceed to paragraph eight. If you do not so find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, 
you will acquit the defendant of the lesser included offense of $30,000 or more, but less than $150,000. Say by your verdict, not guilty of the lesser included offense of theft, $30,000 or more, but less than $150,000, and proceed to paragraph seven to consider whether the defendant is guilty of the lesser included offense of theft, $2,500 or more, but less than $30,000. Seven. Now, if you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the fourth day of December, 2020 in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose Lozano, with the intent to deprive the owner, Terry Kirkbride, of property, namely clothing, electronic items, household items, tools, toys, sporting goods, weapons, fashion accessories, jewelry, magazines, books, paintings, artwork, collectibles, vintage movie items, antiques, motor vehicle parts, military collectibles, United States currency and or food items did then and there unlawfully without the effective consent of the owner, Terry McBride, Kirkbride, appropriate said property by acquiring or otherwise exercising control over said property, said property being more, I'm sorry, said property being other than real property, which had a value of $2,500 or more, but less than $30,000, then you will find the defendant guilty of the less included offense of theft, $2,500 or more, but less than $30,000. If you do not so find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will acquit the defendant of the lesser included offense of theft, $2,500 or more, but less than $30,000, and say by your verdict not guilty of the lesser included offense of theft, $2,500 or more, but less than $30,000. Eight, you are instructed that under our law, no evidence obtained by an officer or other person in violation of any provisions of the Constitution or laws of the state of Texas or the Constitution or laws of the United States of America shall be admitted in evidence against the accused on the trial of any criminal case. An officer's observation of an item in plain view is not an invasion of a person's right of privacy if the officer observing the item is properly in a position from which he can view the property. Also, it must be immediate, uh, immediately apparent to the officer viewing property in plain view that the items observed in plain view might be contraband or evidence of a crime. That is, there must be probable cause to associate the item or items in plain view with criminal activity. Probable cause exists where the facts and circumstances within the officer's knowledge and of which he has reasonably trustworthy information are sufficient unto themselves to warrant a man of reasonable caution to believe that an offense has been or is being committed. If you believe or have a reasonable doubt that evidence was obtained in violation of any provisions of the Constitution or the laws of the state of Texas or the Constitution or laws of the United States of America in such event, the jury shall disregard any such evidence so obtained. Nine, our law provides a defendant may testify in his own behalf if he elects to do so. This, however, is a right accorded a defendant, and in the event he elects not to testify, that fact cannot be taken as a circumstance against him. In this case, the defendant has elected not to testify, and you are instructed that you cannot and must not refer or allude to that fact throughout your deliberations or take it in consideration for any purpose whatsoever as a circumstance against him. You are instructed that you must not communicate with or provide any information to anyone or receive any information from anyone by any means about this case. You may not use any electronic device or media such as telephone, cell phone, smartphone, iPhone, Blackberry, iPad, tablet or computer, the internet, any internet service or any text or instant messaging service or any social media platform, internet chat room, blog, or website to include, but not limited to, Google, Facebook, MySpace, Instagram, MySpace. Snapchat, LinkedIn, YouTube, TikTok, X. Twitter, or X to communicate with anyone any information or receive any information from anyone about this case or to conduct any research about this case until I accept your verdict. Written statements made by a witness to investigators or officers or police reports made by officers and tendered by the prosecution to the defense for purposes of cross-examination are not part of the evidence unless introduced in evidence. Many times statements or reports may be marked with an exhibit number, but are neither offered nor received in evidence. I can send only statements and reports received in evidence to the jury room. You are instructed that the statements of counsel made during the course of trial or during the argument if not supported by evidence or statements of law made by counsel if not in harmony with the law as stated to you by the court and these instructions are to be wholly disregarded. You must disregard any comment or statement made by the court during the trial or in these instructions, which may seem to indicate an opinion with respect to any fact, item of evidence, or verdict to be reached in this case. No such indication is intended. You are instructed that the grand jury indictment is not evidence of guilt. 
It is the means whereby a defendant is brought to trial in a felony prosecution. It is not evidence, nor can it be considered by you in passing upon whether this defendant is guilty or not guilty. During your deliberations in this case, you must not consider, discuss, nor relate any matters not in evidence before you. You should not consider nor mention any personal knowledge or information you may have about any fact or person connected with this case, which is not shown by the evidence. You are instructed that you are not to let bias, prejudice, or sympathy play any part in reaching a verdict in this case. After argument of counsel, you will retire to the jury room, select your own presiding juror, and proceed with your deliberations. After you have reached a unanimous verdict, the presiding juror will certify thereto by filling in the appropriate forms attached to this charge and signing, signing his or her name as presiding juror. You are the exclusive judges of the facts proved, of the credibility of the witnesses, and of the weight to be given the testimony. But you are bound to receive the law from the court, which is hearing given to you, and be governed by that law. In order to return a verdict, each juror must agree to that verdict. But jurors have a duty to consult each other and to deliberate with a view to reaching unanimous agreement, if that can be done without violence to individual judgment. A unanimous vote means all 12 jurors must agree. Each juror must decide the case for himself, but only after an impartial consideration of the evidence with his fellow jurors. In the course of deliberations, a juror should not hesitate to re-examine his own views and change his opinion if convinced it is erroneous. However, no juror should surrender his honest conviction as to the weight or effect of the evidence solely because of the opinion of his fellow jurors or for the mere purpose of returning a verdict. All persons are presumed to be innocent, and no person may be convicted of an offense unless each element of the offense is proved beyond a reasonable doubt. The fact that a person has been arrested, confined, or indicted for, or otherwise charged with, the offense gives rise to no inference of guilt at his trial. The law does not require a defendant to prove his innocence or produce any evidence at all. The presumption of innocence alone is sufficient to acquit the defendant unless the jurors are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt of the defendant's guilt after careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence in the case. The prosecution has the burden of proving the defendant guilty, and it must do so by proving each and every element of the offense charge beyond a reasonable doubt. And if it fails to do so, you must acquit the defendant. It is not required that the prosecution prove guilt beyond all possible doubt. It is required that the prosecution's proof excludes all reasonable doubt concerning the defendant's guilt. In the event you have a reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt, after considering all the evidence before you and these instructions, you will acquit him and say by your verdict, not guilty. Suitable forms for your verdict are attached to the charge for your convenience if you care to use them, but they are not intended to suggest to you in any way what your verdict should be. And you may or may not, as you see fit, make use of them. At any rate, your verdict must be in writing and signed by your presiding juror. Your only duty at this time is to determine whether the defendant is guilty under the indictment in this cause and you must restrict your deliberations to the issue of whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty and nothing else. After you have retired to the jury room, no one has any authority to communicate with you except the officer who has you in charge. Do not attempt to talk to the officer or anyone else concerning any question you may have. Instead, address your question to the court in writing. If you want to communicate with the court, notify the bailiff. Any and all communication relative to the case must be written prepared by your presiding juror and submitted to the court through the bailiff, respectfully submitted Judge Stephanie Boyd, 187 District Court, Bear County, Texas, and suitable forms are attached. Are parties ready to proceed with closing arguments? Yes, Your Honor. All right, State, you may begin. Now, the first thing I want to mention is that, don't worry, you didn't have to memorize all that the judge mm -hmm. has said. You're going to have the jury charge back there with you. And now, part of it is that there are multiple well, let me just tell you the elements. In Bear County, Texas, so again, we've proven that this all occurred in Bear County. On or about December 4, 2020, again, multiple people testified that that's when the property was stolen and when the trailer was found. Jose Lozano, again, Edith came in and identified Jose. He was also identified by the fingerprints found on that trailer by the fingerprint analyst who came in and testified. With intent to deprive Terry Kirkbride, the owner of property, unlawfully, without effective consent, appropriated property. Then it lists the different categories of property that were appropriated. And again, those three points I just mentioned, that's the crux of this case. Now, one thing that, you're, that, you, that you should have noticed during uh, the reading of the jury charge 
is valued at 300,000 or more. So there are multiple different parts to theft that you have to decide. So the first thing that you can decide is if we've met our burden of above $300,000 or more, well, then it stops there. That would be what he's guilty of. If you don't find it above 300,000, then you would go 150,000 or more, but less than 300,000. The further step is again, valued at 30,000, but less than 150,000. And finally, valued at 2,500 or more, but less than 30,000. So again, you only, you only go to the next step, you only go to the next value amount if you find that the first value amount is not true. And then you go to the next one. If that's not true, you go to the next one until you make a decision. Now, you heard okay, so plenty of testimony over in this 300, case 000, from officers who were investigating what happened. You heard from Terry, who I know it took a while to go through those photos, but he detailed exactly what property was found at, the, at Jose's home and what he was able to identify. Again, that's not all the property that Terry had. It's just what they took photos of. You also heard from Edith, as the mother of Jose's children, who did state that he lived at that address, that he had brought this property to that home, and that he didn't say where he got it from, who he got it from, when he got it, only that she remembers it was not that long before the police arrived. So again, you've heard plenty of testimony as to the circumstances around what happened to Terry Kirkbride's property. What I want to mention is that there have I been plenty of police reports poll. that have been mentioned during the course of this trial. Several times, officers, because this happened four years ago, they didn't have a great memory of exactly what happened, but that's why they write police reports. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, as it says in the jury charge, you're not going to get any of those. It's, it's again, for purposes of refreshing their memory. What I want to say also is that Ouch. you cannot let bias or sympathy play a role in your decision. You have to look at the evidence that's presented. Now, again, in each of these different lists of the elements, all the elements are the same, except for the value amount. That's really where that decision has to come in. And it's whether or not the state, beyond a reasonable doubt, with all the evidence that was brought in, with the testimony that you heard, did we prove each and every, each and every one of those elements? I would argue that we did. And I would ask that you find the defendant guilty of thefts $300,000 or more. And I'll reserve all remaining time for final closing. All right. Uh, defense, are you ready to proceed? Yes, sir. Well, please, court, counsel. Good afternoon again, everybody. So I want to start off with a couple of housekeeping things. First of all, if you have a dispute about what some of the testimony might have been, uh, do not send a note to the judge asking, can you read us back the testimony of Officer Melanie Boyd? because you're not going to get it, right? The law says you can get information like that, but it has to happen this way. Y'all are deliberating. You get to a specific point that you're, you're conversing about, and juror number one says, that officer said this. Juror number three says, no, they said this, in response to a specific issue or question. And even a third juror says, no, I think they said that. If you give a judge a very specific question about what you're disputing, then, you, then you'll get an answer, probably. But if you say, we want to hear all the testimony of Officer Knocker, that's not going to happen. I've never heard a uh, lawyer so give that. that instruction. I want to talk a little bit about um, unanimous verdicts. Uh, what seems like a relatively simple case has raised a lot of interesting questions. Um, and you may not agree on all of them. You may not agree on uh, any of them. My request to you is to live up to your oath and decide the case as you see it. And if you get to the point where your decision is at odds with others and you don't come to a unanimous verdict, whether it's 11 to one or six to six or eight to four, it doesn't matter. At some point you are allowed to notify the court and say, judge, we're deadlocked. Um, and then the judge will give you further instructions. Um, but don't sit back there just like, well, what do we do? Deliberate, try to come to a conclusion. If you cannot, you cannot. Um, first thing I wanna talk about is this is why jury duty is very, very difficult and sometimes. Yes, it's true, all we have is a property case here. Nobody got hurt, thank God. It's not a violent offense. But it was heartbreaking to hear Mr. Kirkbride talk about the things that he'd accumulated over his 
lengthy career, a very honorable career that he had, and and lose them when he was him and his wife were so looking forward to moving to California to be near their kids. They pared all their things down to just what they needed to take, and then this happens. Um, I'm sure everybody here was heartbroken to hear that story. It was hard to hear him testify about that. I felt the same way. Um, but that's not what you're here to, to talk about, and that's what you're not going to deliberate about. What you're going to deliberate, deliberate about is the legal questions that are presented to you. And that's whether or not this particular crime was committed. Um, and the first thing that is difficult to, to talk about is this may have all been done illegally. There's a provision in the law that says basically if the police officers violate Fourth Amendment unlawful searches and seizures, the jury disregards the evidence and the case basically goes away. In other words, what was confiscated in that yard that day, it was confiscated illegally. The jury is not allowed to consider that evidence. Without those items in the yard, there is no case, right? We know that, right? So how did they violate the law? Officer Knocker told you very clearly, very plainly, that um, you can't just go to somebody's house and go in their backyard. I guarantee you, every single one of you would not would take offense to a police officer deciding, I'm going to wander into your backyard, I'm going to look into your cars, I'm going to look through the windows, and I'm going to see what I'm going to see, and maybe I'm going to come back with a warrant and search. And it's absolutely, clearly, undeniably against the law. That's exactly what they did in this case. Not because I say that, not because my witnesses say that. Officer Knocker told you that, right? You don't have to have a fence for it to be your backyard, right? The fact that you live on property that a fence has fallen down or you can see oh, you can see around it, that doesn't mean you just can mosey on back there. Officer, Officer Knocker told you, yeah, I send the guys back there just on the safe side. But there was nothing happening that required that to, to take place. They weren't searching for somebody with a warrant. They, there was no crime being committed. They just did it. And then he tells you the plain view that's listed in the affidavit for the search warrant is because those officers were back there looking around. Your deliberations, if you were to follow the law and be true to the oath that you took when you started this case, would be, that's the end of our conversation. That testimony is absolutely 100% undisputed. Nobody challenged that. Everyone has a right for their backyard, their property, to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. It's part of the law, it's part of the Constitution, and the consequence for violating that is anything illegally obtained is not admissible in court. I know that these are just tasting everybody's soon. mouth if that's the conclusion you come to, should come to, because you, you would want the police to do it the right way. You'd want them to legally obtain the evidence so that you could do the right thing by Mr. Herkbright. I get all that. Difficulty of community uh, jury service is you have to follow the law because you swore to this what you're going to do. So I'd ask you to, to delve very deeply into that question and come to the conclusion that this was illegally obtained, illegally obtained evidence. The paragraph judge is eight tells you very clearly. <laughs> page eight, paragraph two. Um, plain view is not an invasion of a person's right to privacy if the officer observing the item is properly in the position where he can view the property. Meaning, if he's legally there, whatever he sees is admissible. You know the answer to that question. That's undisputed. If you feel you have to go beyond that point, I understand. Let's talk about it. Um, why do we have all these different ranges of values when the indictment very clearly states, and it was read, and Mr. Lozano pled not guilty to, over 300,000? It doesn't give you 150 to 300. It doesn't give you 30 to 150 or 2,500 to 30,000. Why do we now have those options when he was never charged with that? Because they didn't prove their case. It's a concession. It's a concession on the state's part that uh, we didn't really get there. Let's give them some other options. That is so unfair. It's, it's beyond description because he's come here and he's been under indictment for a case over 300,000 that never should have been filed in the first place. And these different options are giving you clearly indicates that that's the case, right? And how do we know that? Or, or how did we get there? Officer Knocker told you very clearly, when you go in and seize property, you'd have to do an inventory. All they had to do was give us an inventory of everything they found on the property, 
And I guarantee Mr. Kirkbride would have put a price on it because he knows his stuff. He knows what it is. He knows what it's worth. And, and the magistrate, by law, requires officers, when they execute search warrants, bring us that inventory and file it with the court. Didn't do that either. Officer Knocker said, you know, I wouldn't have done it that way. I mean, I've done it. I've done these before. This is how you do it, right? And, and guess what? It's one of the reasons is so they don't take property that doesn't belong, that maybe belongs to the homeowner, and it wasn't even stolen. And that's exactly what happened here. Mr. Kirkbride told you, I found this uh, winch thing that didn't belong to me in the property. So we don't Trailer know hitch. the value, and it's because the officers didn't do the inventory. And I think I know why, and I think you know why. There's a lot of stuff. Well, those mostly, as Mr. Kirkbride said, junk and trash, empty boxes and stuff. It was they just they weren't going to go through it all. So what did they do? They took 84 pictures or however many it was. That's not how you do it, because then now they're leaving them up to you. Okay, here's all the pictures. Here's all these numbers. Figure it out. That's not fair. Do it the right way. Do what the law requires. Leave the inventory and file it with the magistrate the way you're required to do. Now. This case started off with the stealing of the truck and the trailer. What does this indictment say? And Mr. Kirkbride and I talked about that. They never accused him of stealing the truck. It's not in the indictment. They never accused him of being in possession or stealing the trailer. It's not in the indictment. And we know that it takes much less evidence to get an indictment than it does to get a conviction. There just has to be some evidence. They knew they had none, right? And you know they had none. Nobody sees him at the scene. Nobody sees him in the truck. The truck and the trailer are never on his property. There's no evidence of it. Yes, could you assume and speculate that somehow he was involved? Of course you can. But how does that get you beyond a reasonable doubt? It doesn't get you there. It's not any evidence. It's no evidence whatsoever. So the over 300,000 gets them much harder to get to when the truck and the trailer are not even involved. This is about personal property that's on Mr. Lozano's property that is a, a small piece of a much bigger theft. How do they get beyond a reasonable doubt? They, they, they can't. It's imp There's no evidence whatsoever. None whatsoever how that property got there. There's no evidence of what all is included in that property, and there's no evidence of the value of it, right? That's how we get all the way down to $2,500, up to $30,000. And the last one I didn't tell you, if it's under $2,500, it's not guilty because that you don't get zero to 2,500. Why? That's not one of the options. But the reason I think you have to consider that is Mr. Kirkbride said more than once, they left nothing but trash. There was nothing of value, right? There was nothing of value. His words, his stuff, he knows. Don't believe us, believe the state's witness. Um, The big concern is that a jury in this situation starts seeing things or putting pieces together that are not there, right? Well, maybe he did this. Well, maybe he did that. Let's talk about some of the babies. What do, what do thieves do when they steal stuff? What do they want it for? Oftentimes, many times, is to convert it to cash, right? Because the things that they stole in, they don't necessarily have a use for it. Yeah, sometimes they'll steal a car. But even then, they'll want to get rid of it because they don't want to get caught with it. So where does the stolen property end up? All over the place, right? All over the place. Some, some was left in the trailer. Some got to be, clearly it got picked through. We know that. Because what did Mr. Kirkbride say? Nothing of value was left. All the big items with the high value, the item that he said was worth thirty dollars to $50,000, doesn't appear anywhere. You never see it. He never recovered it. And how do we know for sure all that's the case? Defendant's exhibit number two on page six, and for several pages there following, he makes an exhaustive list, 300 line items of things that he made a claim to his insurance company, right? Telling them, I had these things, I don't have them anymore. I'm making a claim on my policy. The vast majority of what was in that trailer is in that list. And what does he tell you? Of those 306 line items, some of those have 10 and 15 items in one line. So it's a massive amount of property, right? And what's also important to get from this list, at the end of the day, and I know Mr. Kirk Bryan, I'm sure the state will take the same position, you know, insurance companies are not nice people. They're not nice to deal with. 
and not, they're not fair with you, right? But they paid him $214,000, right? And I'm not sure that includes the truck or not, but let's just assume it didn't. We all know 214 is less than 300. They, they were never gonna be able to prove their case from day one. That's why they're trying to inch it down and let you, let you prove it. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the 214. Common sense suggests when you're, in a, when you're having a negotiation and trying to sell your case to the insurance company, either you agree to the amount or you, or you don't get your check. Right? Either you agree or you don't agree. He had a right to con continue to pursue it. He could have sued him. He said, no, I'm done. I'm going to take that number. He, had to, he agreed to it grudgingly. He didn't like it. He didn't want to do it. But you all know common sense tells you when you sign a release, you're telling them, I'm Mr. Insurance Company, I'm releasing my claim against you in exchange for the value that we've agreed my stuff was worth, right? And everything on this list that accounts up to $214,000 was not in my client's yard. These are all the things that were not found, right? Nothing that's on this list was in his possession. And this is the vast majority. I asked him that question, right? How much was left behind in comparison to what you made in your claim? Well, this is most of it, right? He made the, the bad decision. He was uh, made the dumb decision to allow somebody to, to pawn some stuff on, on off on him. Maybe he paid something for some of the boxes. Who knows? You don't know. I don't know. You're never going to know. All you do know is that a small percentage so he bought all the crappy stuff. massive amount of property was on his property, and he shouldn't have had it. Yes, that deprived Mr. Crudbright of possession of it. Granted, that's a given. And I think you can realistically go back there and say, we don't even think it's $2,500, and therefore you get to not guilty. But if you think it's more than $2,500, what is the next level up? Over $30,000. Folks, you can't get past $30,000, right? Why was all that stuff in the yard? There was nothing of value there. It was papers. There was mementos that were very valuable to him, sentimentally, but of actual value. And the, and the jury charge describes for you, well, how is that figured out? How do you figure out what value is? It gives you the definition. Um, the thing that I think is, is most important to look at is when you go back there, and, and you're looking at the different categories and you're looking at the evidence, how do we find beyond a reasonable doubt that the state has proven all of these things? You're gonna go in circles because you're not gonna find it. There's no eyewitnesses. There's no confessions. There's no admissions. Uh, the vast, the truck's not there, the trailer's not there, and the vast majority of items that you see in the insurance list is not there. There's a handful of things. And, and he's taking the blame for whoever was involved in this case. And that's fine. Uh, how, did, how did this case become such a big deal besides the sad story that's behind it? Mr. Kirkbride wasn't going to let it go. He's calling the police. He talked to the chief of police. He talked to the mayor. And all of a sudden, everybody's scrambling. We'll get, let's get on the ball. It came out in the news. He even said it. Uh, after this is over, you could probably go still find it on ksat.com or all these other places. He, he made people move because they weren't doing right by him. Understandable. He lost a lifetime's worth of things. I get all of that. But you don't just patch together a case and, and throw the patsy and say, okay, Mr. Kirkbride, we took care of it. We arrested Mr. Rosano. But even Mr. Kirkbride would tell you, yeah, but where's all this stuff? He doesn't have all my stuff. You don't even have any proof that he ever did. This argument is not resonating it's a sad, with anyone. Sad situation. But if, you, if you're true to your oath and you look at the, the case, my Based client, the Patsy. To you, look at the documents. <laughs> look at the insurance claim. Look at the pictures of a bunch of empty boxes and ruffled things and, and mementos. Not of value. You can never get past thirty thousand dollars, folks. You just can't. So if you if you feel that you have to make a finding of guilt, that's the only category that makes any sense. But I would still ask you to look at: Is this search legit? Under these circumstances, the way the law is written, as described to you in the charge. And if you're honest, you're going to say, no, that, that doesn't fly either. And you're going to have to make a finding of not guilty because the evidence was illegally obtained. So please consider all your oath and don't feel like by not 
given the state, the verdict, that somehow you're disrespecting or uh, minimizing Mr. Kirkbride's loss because nobody's doing that. We're just asking you to do what you promised you would do when you when you took your oath. Thank you. And the state, All to right, their state. credit, Thank did you. not object that whole time. <laughs> Jury, uh, I'm going to pass I out the forms. You can go ahead and check the guilty box now things. if you want. Daniel and I have been talking to you about since jury selection. So the, our burden in this case is beyond a reasonable doubt. So I'm asking you to not leave your common sense on the courthouse steps. Okay, so there's some things that uh, Mr. Martinez talked about that may be possible, right? And I want you to remember the photo of the dog in the kitchen. And remember that just because something's possible does not make it reasonable. Okay, so it's possible. A tornado picked up all this stuff and dropped it in Mr. Lozano's backyard, right? Oh, that's a there's possibility. There's reasonable suspicion, right? reasonable doubt. But that's not a reasonable possibility. Um, I guess the first not. three items I don't think were in dispute here. This happened in Bear County. The date's not in dispute. Jose Lozano, the defendant, that's not in dispute. With intent to bribe Terry Kirkbride, the owner of the property, we heard from Mr. Kirkbride up here on the stand. I don't think that's in dispute. Uh, I want to talk to you about the mental state intentionally acted with a conscious objective or desire to cause the result. And we talked about this in jury selection, right? That's the legal definition. But all we're talking about is you took something that wasn't yours and you knew you did it. You did it on purpose. How do we prove mental state? We can, mental states can be inferred from acts, words, and conduct of the accused. And so in this case, we had to, her testimony from Edith Serrano, who's the mother of the defendant's children. At the time, they lived together. She said, she said, Jose told her, Jose brought the stuff to the house. He told me he bought the stuff. The next element we have to meet here is unlawfully, without effective consent, appropriated the property. Okay, so who did we hear from? We heard from CSI Gonzalez. He collected the fingerprints from the trailer. We also heard from uh, the fingerprint examiner, Ms. Serenil, who matched the fingerprints to this defendant, Jose Lozano. And you all heard... She also took his fingerprints earlier in court this week. The fingerprint that was found on the trailer matched this defendant. This is the laundry list that we went through, and, and I'm sorry that part of this process was we had to go through so many photos, but I wanted you to see the scope of what we're talking about here. We're talking about a lot of stuff. These folks had packed up everything they owned to move cross country, and so that's why we had to go through all those photos. But those are the laundry list of things that we're talking about. And uh, sorry, that's what we're going through. So that's the photos and the list. The list was admitted as uh, State's Exhibit 48, and that'll go back there with you. You'll have the opportunity to look that over. And then the valuation. So there's been some talk about the valuation. There's, there's been testimony from uh, Mr. Kirkbride. You saw that list. You'll see that other list from USA. And what I want to draw your attention to on Defense Exhibit 2, which is this documentation for USAA, in the first column, USAA calls the recoverable, recoverable valuation of the property at $450,000. And then they depreciate that amount. And they, give it a, they, they settled at an amount, after you take out depreciation, less than $300,000. But if any of y'all you have done with, dealt with insurance companies before, you know that if you insure something for $100, it'd be extremely rare to get the $100 back. So they settled with the insurance company but I believe the testimony supports the contention that this theft was of property worth over $300,000. Um, we talked about this in jury selection. We talked about if there's a theft and you recover some of your property, is there still a theft? And none of y'all had a problem with that, right? I mean, there's this idea that you know, Daniel gets his bike stolen, but he gets his bike back. That's not a theft, right? No, no, that's still a theft. There was still a theft, even if you got some of your bike back, right? And why should we care, right? Well, this is your opportunity to tell the community that this type of crime should not be tolerated. Don't make this okay in Bear County. Don't make this okay in San Antonio. This is y'all's community. And this is your opportunity to protect your community. There was a y'all. So let's talk about responsibility in this case. Happy birthday, Josh Peterson. Who had responsibility in this case? The defendant, Jose Lozano. His fingerprint was found on the trailer. This property was found in his yard. 
property was found in his house. It's Terry's property in Mr. Lozano's yard and in his house. He has responsibility in this case. You are the exclusive judges of the credibility of the witnesses. So you get to decide, is it reasonable, is it credible that Mr. Lozano bought these items? So does it make sense to y'all that he spent money that he worked for on these items and then left them outside for nearly three weeks? Most of, some of, some of these items got ruined by the elements. I'm glad it rained last night because maybe that'll um, aid you guys in your, in your deliberations. If you bought something for money, are you going to leave it outside to be potentially, and in this case, in actuality, to be ruined by the elements, be ruined by rain? These are some of the items that are found outside the house. This is... Oh, man, what are you doing? Oh. Got something going on here. Let me see. So we got um this is a picture of the camper shell um that Mr. Kirkbride uh, identified from the witness stand. That's uh that's his camper shell, which is also in evidence. Um there you go, thanks. Um and this is what the police saw from the back of the, the side of the yard. So there's the front of the house. This is the side of the yard. So the police get back there. They can see all this stuff back there. And they've already, keep in mind, this is after they've already matched up the fingerprint from the trailer. They've identified a suspect. They go outside. They're standing on the side of the house. And they say, like, that looks like a bunch of stuff that was stolen from some folks that were moving. Okay? So at that point, they go and get the warrant. They go and get the warrant from a detached neutral magistrate. And then they search the backyard and they search the house legally. But does it make sense to y'all that Mr. Lozano would have spent money on these items? I mean, this is a lot of stuff here. Does it make sense to y'all that you would spend your own hard-earned money on something and then leave it outside for almost three weeks to be ruined by the elements, be ruined by rain? That doesn't make any sense. And then you can see these items... This has got Mr. Kirkbride's last name on the on his bags here, his military bags here. And so it doesn't make sense to me that someone would go out and buy this stuff, somebody else's name on it, and leave it unpacked in their backyard like that. You see here, this is uh, Mr. Kirkbride's uh, documentation and, and handbook for his, his truck, his truck that was also stolen. And... To me, you can make reasonable assumptions from the evidence. And the reasonable assumption that I'm making from this evidence is that at one point, Mr. Lozano had access to that truck because the book is in his backyard. Here's some more of uh, Mr. Kirkbride's property. You can see his name from there. This is uh, one of the many pictures uh, of Mr. Kirkbride's military, uh, one of his medals. Uh, and I, I put this up there. There's more in evidence and there's more on that CD that we answered. And you all have the opportunity to look at that when you're back there deliberating. Um, but these are the types of things that were left outside in the elements to be ruined. But does it make sense to you all that somebody would spend money on this and just leave it in the backyard? This is a, a box that's got Mr. Kirkbride's name and address on it. That's something that uh, was left in the backyard. And then we've got the property that was inside the house. So we talked about this cat statue. Mr. Kirkbride identified that. These are some pocket knives. Mr. Kirkbride identified that at least one of those is a family heirloom. We've got a vehicle here. This is that uh, statue that uh, Mr. Kirkbride des uh, described to us. So I just want y'all to keep in mind the sheer scope of the amount of stuff we're talking about. This is a 24 foot trailer. Um, that the way I was thinking about it is they loaded it like it was a game of Tetris, okay? Every square inch of that thing was stacked loaded. And then it was gone. And so the police get the fingerprint on the trailer. This is the picture of it. And if you look at the screen here, uh, on that diagram in about the middle of it, it says, I don't know if this is gonna display it, but it's not gonna work on the television screen, but it says front and then an arrow. So where they recovered that fingerprint, is where you would unhook the trailer from the back of a truck. 
And y'all can make reasonable inferences from the evidence. So a reasonable inference from this evidence, this is a photo of the uh, of the uh, the fingerprint card, which will also go back with y'all. You'll have an opportunity to look at that in person if you'd like. But a reasonable inference from this evidence, when you take the book from the F-150, you take all the, the, the camper shell that's in the backyard, you take all the items that was emptied out of the trailer. The reasonable inference is Mr. Lozano took that truck, took the trailer to his house, emptied it, took the cover off the camper, left that in the backyard, and then dumped the, tr the empty trailer about 20 minutes away from his house. That's a reasonable inference from the evidence that's in front of him. These are the fingerprints that Ms. Sarah Neal took earlier this week of the defendant that matched the fingerprint that was found uh, on the trailer. It's a palm print, because it was a palm print that was found. So this is a photo of Mr. Kirkbride in his trailer. And as you can see, it's, it's empty. By the time, uh, this is on the, the December 5th. So the trailer is, is taken on the 4th and it's found less than 24 hours later, uh, empty, it's in this condition. The fingerprint's already on it at that point, but the stuff's gone because the stuff is in Mr. Lozano's backyard because Mr. Lozano stole it. These are all reasonable inferences that you can make from the evidence. So one thing that Mr. Martinez said that I agree with is that thieves steal things in order to sell them. And so I believe that is part of the reason why there wasn't a lot of valuable items found in Mr. Lozano's backyard. He empties that trailer into the backyard, picks out the stuff that he wants for his house, sells the valuable items, and by the time police got there, what is left is of little monetary value. But if you remember the last question I asked Mr. Kirkbride yesterday, I asked him, what is the worst thing what, what is the thing you missed the most that was taken? And he said, it's the things that I can't replace. The photos, the military stuff, the items that he inherited that he hoped to one day pass on to his children and to his grandchildren. And those things are gone. And they were worth nothing in monetary value, nothing to Mr. Lozano. But they were worth a lot to Mr. Kirkbride. They were worth a lot to his family. They would have meant a lot to his children. It would have meant a lot to his grandchildren. So I'd ask you to think about that when you're back there deliberating. Objection, Your Honor. It's arguing to ask the jury to disregard the law that value is determined based on definitions given. Hang on. What value. Hang on. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the court gives you the law, and the law is in the jury charge. Does everyone understand? All right, you may continue. And I'm asking you. He argued for like juror nullification. Hold the defendant, Mr. Lozano, responsible for his actions, and find him guilty of theft over three hundred thousand dollars. Right, thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard all the evidence that you're going to hear in this case. Uh, Deputy Laura is going to take you back to the jury room, and I'm going to ask. A Okay, so uh, as we cut now, now, no, 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 hang on. I'm good. I've got to get this all ready. So let's see. Now we're ready for the verdict. I was going to spoil it for you before, right? But before we go to a verdict, we have to get. Wait, wait, wait. This is hard work, guys. Let's see. Live. Boom. No, no. Yes. Okay, turn this off for a second. Pull this up. All right, here we go. Are you guys ready? You guys ready? Are you ready? Are you ready?
after after watching after watching three days of trial condense it to one marathon binge watching session with no breaks with no breaks we have a verdict in the case of state versus jose lozano jose lozano is accused of stealing everything everything a military veteran owns as he was transferring all his belo- his precious belongings from california to florida they stopped for the night in texas and then when they got up in the morning the truck and everything in it was missing it took some time but the police were able to find these those items or what was left of the items minus most of the valuables in the backyard of the defendant some of the pictures hanging on the defendant's walls in his own home the defendant what was his defense he says he bought it he bought it is it believable will the jury buy it not sure not sure all right here we go we have uh the court is coming to order here the jury is coming in as we're speaking i think let's see the judge is going to let let us know what is up here the defendant is standing it looks like he was asleep oh full counsel is present as well not sure where she was earlier bailiffs at the ready everyone's dressed for court mostly All right, this jury of 12 San Antonians from Bear County, Texas is about to return with a verdict. We're waiting to hear the judge announce that very fact. How long did it actually take? No one will ever know. It happened on Friday. It happened on Friday, so last week. No spoilers, please. No spoilers. Is that verdict unanimous? All right, if you'll hand the... Uh charge to deputy laura for me please i I butchered it hang on hang on here we go we're gonna start that again back to about 15 seconds all right everyone please be seated all right ladies and gentlemen the court has been informed that you've reached a verdict is that correct and is that verdict unanimous all right if you'll hand the uh charge to deputy laura for me please here we go deputy laura back on your foot mr lozano bring the jury all right the verdict form reads we the jury find the defendant jose lozano guilty of the offense of theft three hundred thousand dollars or more as charged in the indictment you may be seated does anyone Boom. wish to have the jurors polled yes ladies and gentlemen i'm going to ask you whether or not this is your verdict if this is your verdict i would like for you to answer yes does everyone understand we'll start on the front row at the end is this your verdict is this your verdict yes. is this your verdict is this your verdict? Is this your verdict? Yes, ma'am. Is this your verdict? We'll start on the back end. Is this your verdict? Yes. Is this your verdict? Yes, Is this your verdict? Is this your verdict? Yes, Is this your verdict? Yes. Is this your verdict? Yes. All right. Thank you all so much. Uh, what's going to end up happening now is I'm going to send you all back to the jury room and I'll come back and, and speak with you briefly. All right, everyone, please rise for the jurors. Just like that, just like that, the jury comes back with a unanimous decision. And says, no, in Texas, at least in Bayer County, at least, it's not okay to take something that doesn't belong to you. Good sportsmanship shown by the prosecution as they won. Defense uh, All right, everyone, please grudgingly be shakes hands. What is that screeching? All noise? right. Uh, so, Mr. Lozano, the jury has found you guilty. Uh, defense, you stated that you would come to the court for punishment. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to reset this so that I can get a PSI report, and that will tell me some more things about you and help me uh, consider what things. to do as far as punishment. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Right. So I believe they are six weeks out. Ooh, wow. So let me see. And if the date I choose is something that doesn't work with your calendar, because I know, Mr. Martinez, that you have jury trials in other counties that are scheduled. She's not talking to the defendant here. Your calendar is open. 
any day she sets, that's going to be the day. Pre-sentencing investigation, PSI. I'm going to set it for April 18th. April 18th. See what happens. And if for any reason that it can be done sooner than that, we'll do it sooner than that. That's about the same time that we have uh, death penalty joint trial in Florida. And that will be a PSI. Is there tap evaluation needed? I haven't seen any in the all right i'll order a tap evaluation is there a request that he be in custody or no there is your honor um this is a first degree felony so we're and i believe he's had some trouble on bond reporting so that's we are asking to be taken into custody on it all right with it's regards the first, to the frustrated. issue of whether or not there's been some concerns about Bond? Have there any been any bond issues? I'm not aware of that, Judge, but I'm not sure I've been on the case. So it's just hired by lawyer. He didn't got up. I'm not sure why we changed, but somehow I got to have this. We can confirm the dates, Your Honor, but when when he was arrested for this offense, uh, it was um, because he had failed to, to appear, I believe. And it was an affidavit of surety yeah. back in August of 21. All right. Well, as you know, Judge, Bosman Yelp on for all kinds of reasons of business reasons, not complying with court orders. It could be that he got sideways with that and whatever he But I, like I said, I wasn't on the case at the time. Bailiff's at the ready. He's always been here. He's been here every day for trial and time. Um, he has great interest in uh, seeing this case to a conclusion. I'm anticipating uh, an appeal, the request for an appeal bond, so I'm sure he'll want to be on his best behavior. All right, so this is what the court is going to do, because it appears that the defense uh, may needs may need to prepare argument as to why he shouldn't be in custody. So I'm going to give you all a chance to confer and state for you a chance to look to see uh, if there is a reason why he shouldn't remain on bond and defense give you a chance to look at what they have the court for the court. All right. So uh, he's going to remain here in the courtroom and he's not allowed to leave the courtroom. I'm going to go talk to the jurors briefly. If anyone else would wish to talk to the jurors, you're more than welcome to do so. They're going to pause for just a second. We we need to hear if he gets if he gets out or is. Oh, let's see where's that. Where does where does this happen, Judge? Do we not find out? Does she keep it a secret? We don't know. She left us hanging. Somebody head down to the courthouse. I'm not saying bring a pitchfork and, and a burning uh, you know, tar and feather or anything, but th clearly uh, the judge needs to know this is not okay. We've got, we've got Nada. She forgot to go live again. She left us. She left us. Somebody just sent me a video of roaches fighting. I don't know who walked. Oh, man. Judge Boyd just went from, like, the number one position on my favorite judges all the way down to the number three position. She's lucky that I don't have anyone else in my top five. So she's still at the top because the other positions are vacant. But uh, I don't. I don't know how to feel about this. Take her. Take her roses back, Adam. <laughs> judge, judge, how could you do this to us? Oh man! Had I known you would leave us hanging, I wouldn't have picked up this case. That's that's what I would do. We need somebody to Google this. We'll probably find out the answer tomorrow. Um, maybe check the jail records. Let's get our sleuths on this. See what we can find out. We've got his name, Jose Lozano. Let's see if he's in custody in jail in San, in, uh, San Antonio, Texas, in Bayer County. He's probably in the lockup. I could probably do a quick search. Let's see if they. I mean, I I know how to Google. Bexer County. 
Bexar County, Texas. Uh, let's see. Uh, jail roster. Let's see. Jail activity reports. Hmm, here, here we go. Bexar County Jail lookup. Texas inmate. He's going to be Jose Laz Lozano in Texas. Big search. Oh. How did I how did I end up on a how did I fall for a page that's not legitimate? Why did it, it's like a million things? Uh, let's see, case number two, 2021 CR 7016. It sounds about right. Should be a theft case. I'm on the page that has everything. Okay, a Texas inmate search. And it takes me to this compile records. Now, this is this is like this is not no bueno. Free search. What's a dot org? It's a dot org. I fell for a dot org instead of a dot gov. Please don't steal all my information. Okay. Um, that noise you hear is 40 people trying to be the first to type the info. <laughs> There's going to be 4,000 of them. It's a common name. It is a common name. So we're, we'd have to possibly look at the dates, incarceration dates. It is pronounced Bayer, but when I type it, I have to say Bexer. Possibly remain on bond. Hey, Courtney, do you know how long they jury deliberated for? It's a curious, curious question. Some of us would like to know. Bayer County. That's right. I think I might have the right page. Inmate. Jail activity reports. Did somebody find it? Leila Me uh, says, I can't believe this, Ari. Uh, Katie, what was the final verdict? Uh, he was found. Now's the time to pause if you don't want it now. He was found guilty of the charge as charged, the highest charge, the plus $300,000 one. How much time is he facing? Like up to 20 years, I think. Deliberations were about 45 minutes to an hour. Thank you, Courtney. Appreciate that. Appreciate you, Courtney. Thanks for being here. Thanks for taking a time out like a champ, too. <laughs> so, um, let's see. Mel says, I watched it all day and missed the verdict. Oh, we had good dance music. I let, it, I let it roll. Colin found it. Let's see. Uh, here we go. Jose Lozano, custody, record age 35, gender male, male race, white, Texas, Bayer County Sheriff's Office, custody, status in custody, detail. Are we sure that's him? I just I'm not, I'm not questioning what uh, what race he put there, but it, I just want to make sure it's a good match. Does it say the date that he was incarcerated? Colin, good good work by the way, good find. He uh, it, it appeared to me, and his and his name would give indications that it's possible that there's some Hispanic um, Hispanic elements but I, I'm not sure if he put that. Uh, chat, the links don't work. Let's see, he was booked on the, from the clerk's record. Here we go, booked. Boom, done. Donna, thank you. On the 9th, that's right, because it was on the 8th that he was, um, the, the verdict came in. 
to get rid of white and call it European. <laughs> it's all wrong. And, and all of us are a little bit of everything. So let's see. Uh, yeah, we'll see. So we've got on the schedule, we've added to the schedule that uh, it's going to be April. What was the date? I've got April 2024. What was the date she said we were going oh, the 18th? April 18th, we're going to have. Come on. Why is it abbreviating that? Format. There we go. April 18th, we have his sentencing. That will give time for the pre trial or the pre sentencing investigation and all that goodness. Uh, and this is good. She gets to hear about anything else. So if there's if there's some other um, convictions in his past, that's all going to come in. Uh, Mindful Crafts by Donna. Good evening from the UK. Mindful Crafts, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. I'm glad we were able to get our uh, our verdict in today. Are we following Tracy Ferreter? Oh, let's see. Ferreter is... I don't have that on my chart. Unless I have it by another name. Let me tell you what we do have. Tomorrow we're supposed to have in... Um, in judge let's see where are we at we're on march okay march 13th that's tomorrow we're supposed to have john torres in cedric simpson's court and it's supposed to be spicy it's supposed to be spicy so first first thing in the morning we're going to join judge simpson and i don't know when it's going to come up but there's supposed to be something judging boy in a box ah uh, we haven't we haven't followed that i think uh, brandy followed that one We're going to watch a real case. What do you define real case, <laughs> Lily? Define real. This is real jails with real bars and real bailiffs. You want you want to mean a high profile one? There's there's some going on. We might be able to go back and watch. There's some that have started about a week ago. Um, we're just sort of uh, the the schedule of what we are watching didn't match up perfectly. We can go back and watch one that's in, underway right now, but you'd have to play catch up. Real stolen stuff. Like th this was three hundred thousand. How many theft trials have you watched where they steal over the value of a house? Oh man, I thought I thought it was pretty cool. Brandy's following Murdoch trial as well. That's a good one. Yep. Are we doing Treehouse? We're trying to do Treehouse when it goes again. Treehouse is scheduled for what? Is it April fourth for Treehouse, or did they get a new date? Can somebody confirm on the, the Franklin Tucker? Sadie, you missed the verdict. It, it snuck up on us. Yeah, I've got April 4th for Franklin Tucker. Same prosecutors, different judge. We believe he's still pro se. I have not, I have not spoken to him or his wife at all since, since the last trial. Any trials out of Boston coming up? Um, let's see. Boston, Massachusetts. Let's see. I'm not seeing any on my list right now. Doesn't mean there aren't any. Got about 32 on there right now that we're just tracking in various states. Nicholas Rossi, by the way, this is the guy from uh, Utah. It's an essay case, so we're not going to follow that one. But uh, he's he went to, he like fled the country and went to Scotland, got extradited back. And when he came back, he had like this foreign accent and he was talking like milady and everything else like this. Not just accent, but he was also using a more like archaic speech. And... Uh, <laughs> And now he's petitioned the judge to order the jail to call him by his new name, which is not the one he's arrested under. Uh, so yeah, I'm not sure if that's going to go anywhere, but uh, we'll have to we'll have to see if the judge orders that they do that. Any courts in Illinois streaming? Oh, uh, let's see, Illinois. We have a couple. 
let's see, a couple that were in Illinois. Uh, we've got Cremo. Well, that was the that was done. That was February twenty sixth. That was Cremo Highland Park, July fourth parade shooting. We didn't follow that one. Um, I have to have to look. Not the amount of a house. On, no, it was amounts of uh, monthly rent for a one bedroom, one bath apartment shared with four other people in Cali. Love bug. We need to do a recap of what's going on on the Simpson trial. It's crazy. It has everything. Judge is accused of doing his own investigation on the case. Danny, uh, I need somebody to to help me with that tomorrow because I didn't. I took very poor notes, and I have the memory of a goldfish. Uh, honestly, the one I think back, all I just see is a goldfish. So. Uh, uh, tomorrow we'll need somebody to call in who's willing to do a recap first thing in the morning and say here's the case we're looking for and this is why it's interesting i believe it has the the judge knew the intersection and the the crash there was a, like a, a chase road rage um the, the two girls died right it, i mean it, it it's there's a lot to it but uh yeah the judge the judge is familiar with some of the facts because he drives that route regularly so we'll need somebody to to tell us about this a little bit. A CD sentence is April eighteenth. Yes, this the in this trial the sentencing will be April eighteenth. Homework for you to write. I cannot do the homework, Angela. <laughs> I cannot do the homework. You know my homework involves like tearing out flooring from my bathroom. Uh, red pen you sent me an amazing picture uh let's see if i can pull this up before my phone dies i'm on I'm, it's already red let's see let's see let's see let's see where's red pen red pen my burner phone it's it's not even responded it's like battery is too low to function please wait let's try it again So you, you remember that case now? Yeah, we're, it's going to be spicy. It's going to be good, and it's going to happen tomorrow with Judge Simpson, unless, you know, it gets pushed out, which sometimes, sometimes it does. Great moderating today. Our mods have done a fantastic job today. The girl's mom asked Judge Simpson to listen to the 911 calls. Let's see. I'd like to thank everyone on the safety committee. Who's on the safety committee? I used to be on the safety committee. You know, if I move like this, you're in the, in the camera. <laughs> you're, on the, you're too far forward. Uh, Adam, good job not getting timed out. It was close. And honestly, one of the times was just because the chat was going too fast for me to click on you. So uh, I saw some of your comments. Um, <coughs> um See, speaking of which are the walls and flowers, they're drying out. The, the dehumidifier is going. It's great. Adam escaped. It was very close. All right, we are going to uh, we're going to wrap up with uh, with the regular music that we normally do. We got a full case. We got a verdict. Watch. We got the verdict music in here today. Uh, it, it was a good one. I'm getting back into the swing of things. And honestly, I hate how I've got my screen laid out. I cannot function like this. I'm going to have to take some of the images on the screen off. I just, it, it doesn't work. Uh, maybe the chat's going to disappear. I don't need that over there for sure. I probably don't need the media player, what's coming up. I can take the two media players off. Then what else? Camera 8. Well, camera 8 is always this. So I could probably take that one off. That would give me enough to consolidate one. Yeah, I think we're going to switch back to the old style and make it uh, make it something I can follow. Right now it's like camera one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And it's just, it's not flying. All right, thanks for everybody. I apologize once again for having a rough start getting back into the work week, but we are back. We are back. We'll be back tomorrow as well. And so uh, I think that's all. I think that's all. We've got some things to talk about tomorrow as far as including there's things happening tonight with the Rust. I think the Rust uh, civil case hearing happened today. We've got that going on. We've got a few other things happening. Um, 
that that happened in other cases that we probably want to talk about with Karen Reed's hearing that happened today. There's there's a lot out there that I need to get caught up on. We might be able to talk about tomorrow morning as we prep for a little case in the morning. And then, of course, we need to choose our next case. We have we have some things to choose. We could go back a little bit. What, what, what like bathtub murder? Do you guys want to do bathtub murder? Maybe, maybe. Take a listen. Let me know. All right, you guys, be good. Wait, I have to start the music again because I forgot... I forgot to do the one thing. I forgot to do the one thing I'm supposed to do, uh, which is the uh, <laughs> the whole reason I play the outro music is so I can do the outro for the channel. Just do it a cappella. I can't. I cannot. I cannot remember the words if I don't have this music going in my head. Take two. Take two. We'll take it from the top, you guys. From the top places, people. I want to thank all of you for being here today. This is what I call the best, pay, the best place to watch true crime. That is because of you. This amazing community and the great uh, environment you create with the attitude and your friendship and your insightfulness, your humor, uh, you guys really bring it. Thank you very much for that. Tonight, when you go home, please hug the people you love. Smile at someone. Make their day just a little bit better. And please stay safe till we go live again tomorrow morning, 830. I'm committing 830 in the morning. I'm going to be up and ready to go. So thank you very much. 8.30. Hey, Siri. Remind me to wake up at 8.15 tomorrow morning. See, now I'm, I'm going to be ready, guys. I'm going to be ready. I'm telling you. So uh, you guys have a, have a fantastic day. It's been a lot of fun. We'll see you tomorrow. Bring a friend. We're going to have some more fun then. Thanks, guys. Be good. Bye. The apocalypse may be upon us. When are we going to break for lunch, Judge? Don't miss the forest for the trees. Because he's the guy!